super speedy romance audiobooks and all. I am here today to give a little introduction to the latest audiobook that I'm releasing, Dare to Love My Safe Husband. In this book, you will find a flame flying hottie hero, donut summer cake and more donuts, a runaway lawnmower, lake life in the late summer, early fall, and a lady boss who finds her forever marriage match. Here is the description. Easy greetings? Check. Fashion design mogul? Check. VIP data wherever it matters most? Check. An unsettled feeling about the future? Um, check. Pressure to live a certain lifestyle turns my world toxic. Late night schedule with drama, my relationship with my not boyfriend fizzles, and failing to meet my parents' expectations means one thing. They arranged my marriage. Yes, for real. Ian Wolfson is not looking for love, nor does he want his family's business to go under. When he has the opportunity to bail them out, he says yes to marrying his best friend's sister. A hot mess. It is just temporary, and then he can get on with his life. Other than that, thank you very much. For a sense of the countryside to play house, Let's start this is disaster with a leaky roof, sneaky possum in an outdoor indoor mushroom farm, turns into a distraction. Being with his charm can't be what real fun is, because I guess he likes my smile or something. But when I learn about the secret from his past, do I dare love him? Without further ado, I hope you enjoy Ian and Wolfen's story. I will see you between the pages. Dare to Love My Fake Husband Sweet Romantic Comedy Forever Marriage Match Book 3 Written by Ellie Hall Copyright 2021 Narrated by Lorena Hoops Audio Copyright 2022 Chapter 1 Blakely My best friends say I'm the stylish one. My mother pushed me into modeling at a young age and I shifted into fashion design during college, so that's no surprise. However, today, I'm feeling a bit flat. Blah. Meh. My monotone outfit probably doesn't help matters. Then again, I've been feeling an inner conflict for a while now. A piece of fabric torn between my wild child days, and a desire to slow down, settle down, but who would I be without my carefree, fun-loving reputation? Also, no way am I going to change my ways just because my mother, her royal heinous, strongly recommends I rein it in. I pound the rest of a fluorescent energy drink called Buzz Pop that the TV show assistant gave me after I stumbled over an extension cord while touring the set and dumped my large coffee with two shots of espresso onto the cameraman. Yeah, it's been that kind of morning. The deep breath I try to take hitches in my chest. I smooth my palms down my cream-colored blouse. My thumb snags in one of the long necklaces I'm wearing as part of the recommendation of a more sophisticated rebrand for BB Style. The outer edge of my eye twitches, my skin tingles, and I can somehow feel a humming underneath it. To say I've been burning the candle at both ends is an understatement. I've been up for nearly 24 hours, prepping for today. There's not even a wick left. I'm little more than a lump of wax. But as they say, the show must go on. I take another swig of the buzz pop. Cue the power of positive thinking that my life coach taught me. I can do this. I'm a lady boss. Hear me roar. What feels like the second hand ticking on a clock spins me into a sudden flurry of ideas. After a slow start to the morning, and now fueled by caffeine, I spring into action, ordering my assistant to help me prepare for the three-minute live TV slot I have showcasing fall-style trends with Heidi Simmons and Don Mobitz, everyone's favorite AM chat show hosts on the Coffee Break Morning Show. I signal my assistant. Tiff, change of plans. Instead of the fall light line of cardigans and wide leg trousers, let's go with the neon nouveau line. 
Inspired, my words trip out of my mouth faster than I can say them. Instead of a sluggish drone, I'm feeling bee-like, buzzed. Tiff's eyes widen, and she tilts her head to one side. But she knows better than to have me ask twice. I'm the founder, designer, and CEO of BB Style, and I own this town. She rushes out the door and to our flagship store three blocks away on Madison Avenue, with our design studios above it. I call ahead to have my people there ready the racks. I flit around the green room, calculating the changes that will need to be made to shift from the originally planned outfits in bespoke shades of autumn colors that the TV show suggested. We run to something more electric, vibrant, energized, more me, at least this highly caffeinated version of me. The show assistant pokes his head in the doorway. I noticed your assistant left. Fifteen more minutes until we're live. Change of plans, but Tiff will be back in time. She's never failed me yet. His brow furrows as he ducks back into the hall. Never question an artist, I call after him, as the buzz pop courses in my veins. Nor do I question whether I can get my showcase outfit on quickly enough and get the models in their new garb. I've worked on tighter deadlines. As a former model myself, I've walked at every notable fashion show. Now, as a designer, the models wear my creations on those same catwalks. We'll have to change the music, too, I say to no one in particular. I hurry into the hall, but don't find the PA person before Tiff reappears struggling with the garment rack. The heavy black bags sway from side to side. The four models, already dressed in cozy knits, casual pants, and ready to walk in stilettos, blink their spidery lashes slowly at me. Girls, we're going from tame, boring tea with milk to rock star spicy cider. I toss them combinations of clothing made of hot pink mesh blue metallic spandex, and various neon animal prints. Like Tiff, they do as they're told and swap outfits. The makeup artist swipes on eyeshadow and lipstick that completes the bolder look. I pull on a skin-tight neon yellow vinyl dress with zippers, tease my hair, and strike a pose with one arm lifted in the air like Lady Liberty. Wake up, New York! Blakely Benedict is back. Everyone cheers and claps. The funny thing is, she, I, never left. I'm feeling more alive this morning than I have in ages. I went from zipping around the city during my early 20s, strutting from club to after parties as a VIP, to being pulled in a different, more serene direction now that I'm getting older. With no thanks to my mother, who repeatedly tells me to tone it down, and even staged an intervention a couple of months ago, saying my rash behavior isn't acceptable for someone my age. I'm not even 30 yet. That just means I'm making the family look bad. There was late night dancing at a club that turned out to be the site for a charity event the next morning. She thought my criminal fashion line was tasteless and then wouldn't speak to me after an interview when I mispronounced the name of the president whose country I was visiting. Honest mistake. For better or worse, part of my job involves networking, and that means going to parties and events. Lots of them. My meddlesome mother wants me to go from high-key to low-key. Ha! Huh. Not today, folks. I've got rocket fuel in me, and we're going to shoot for the moon. The show assistant comes in, scratches his temple at the chaos in the room, and then says, BB style, you're up. Leading my parade of neon-clad models through the dim hallway, we stride onto the set that smells like cinnamon and apple pie a piano melody that doesn't match our high-wire energy, 
and a deer in headlights Heidi Simmons standing next to a mannequin dressed in cornucopia colors. Don Mobitz squints as if we're hard to miss. Good morning, New York, I shout. Yes, good morning is right. If I wasn't awake before, I am now. Boy, those shades are bright. I could use a pair of sunglasses. Heidi turns to camera two. We have Blakely Benedict of BB Style with us this morning, ready to share her latest cozy trends for this coming season. She clears her throat. Over to you, Blakely. I introduce each of the outfits on the models, explaining my vision for the Neon Nouveau line and how important it is to break through boundaries and expectations, especially in fashion. Don Mobitz stares at us, either entranced or intensely confused, by the shock of color, prints, and my animated spiel. It's an art form, a type of self-expression, a way for each individual to showcase their unique self. I rattle on, the words pouring out of me in a torrent, as sweat beads along the nape of my neck, and my heart buzzes like a bumblebee starved for pollen. Heidi's surprise turns to tight-lipped something. I can't tell what. Amusement? Annoyance? As a legend in the modeling world, it is a treat to have you here this morning. Though I don't expect you'll want any of the apple pie, our esteemed guest, Maxwell, the banker baker, showed us how to bake. Heidi giggles and flutters her eyelashes at a tall, handsome man, standing on the edge of the set. He grimaces, then points toward his hip. Maybe? My hip? My thoughts scramble as the potency of the energy drink drains out of me like a sieve. My body starts to feel heavy, as if I'm encased in rapidly drying cement. The hostess claps her hands, snapping me out of it. Well, that's about all the time we have here today. We can all agree this has been quite a show. Thank you to our talented guests for joining us and our viewers for tuning in. Blakely, please show us your very best modeling moves and lead the way. Heidi sweeps her hand for me to stride down the makeshift catwalk strewn with autumn leaves per the original plan. It's then I become aware of a draft. I discreetly smooth my hand down my low back and toward the seat of my dress. Oh no. The producer indicates it's time for me to move. This is bad. Double bad. I do a little shuffle, trying to pull the bottom half of my skin-tight dress loose from the black neon fishnet tights I'm wearing. It won't budge. The hot studio lighting seems to have heated up the vinyl fabric. It's baked onto my skin like a pie crust, but bearing my backside. Well, my underwear, which went better with the cozy comfort look I'd worn earlier. The cameraman pans. Heidi gives me a little nudge. The models look to me for direction. I do a little bunny hop, trying to tug the back of the skirt down, because I bet my entire design studio that the camera is going to follow us as we walk. But there's no way to indicate any of us change course. There is no way to avoid what's about to happen. The train has left the station. Wreck commencing in three, two, one, as it collides with a dumpster fire. How'd that happen, you ask, considering there were no wheels on this crazy train? They came off about two miles back when I ingested that can of buzz pop. What have I done? I can't do anything but put one foot in front of the other and own the stage like I have so many times before. Too bad the entire country is about to see my rear end. You have that glazed donut look, Daisy says. You know I'd never touch a donut. 
my face falls into my hands, especially after the entire country saw my butt. Let's refer to it as a wardrobe malfunction, she says brightly. Let's not name it anything, except there is no chance I'm not already the butt of at least a dozen memes. Pun intended. Usually when my best friends and I have drama, we flock to our Fab Five text group for emotional support. This time, Daisy was at my door before nightfall. Not an easy feat considering she has a baby, but this is a level three crisis. Daisy fields messages and calls on my ever-beeping phone while I ponder why I temporarily lost my mind. Oh, right. The buzz pop. I want to click rewind and go back to the original fall light plan. Sometimes good things come out of difficulties. She speaks from experience, but I'm not ready to look at anything other than the wreckage. Curse me in my caffeine addiction. Everything happens for a reason, Daisy adds. I appreciate your platitudes, but this gives new meaning to the term but hurt. Worst of all, Heidi knew. She saw me struggling with that stupid dress. Why didn't she help me? Daisy, ever polite, clears her throat. Well, you did change up her show last minute. You can't blame me. I was in a neon energy drink-induced stupor, high on whatever that nuclear liquid contained. My shoulders droop with the truth. I am to blame. There is no avoiding that I, and I alone, just ruined my career. Although, if I'm really honest with myself, today was just the final drop in a pool, building behind a dam that was already fit to burst. But I won't let myself dwell on that just now. Instead, all I can think about is the way my stomach nodded the second I realized my dress was tucked into the back of my stockings and underwear. I'm sure we can do damage control and... Daisy starts. I let out a long breath and shake my head slowly. I'm ruined. A sob gathers behind my eyes and in my throat, but I don't let it escape. Not yet. My phone beeps. It's her again. Daisy says, winding one long strand of black hair around her finger, a nervous habit. I wave my hand away. You do realize that if you don't answer, she'll be knocking on the door before the end of the day, Daisy warns. She's already called three times. I don't add that I've been avoiding conversation with my mother for three days. Never mind the last few times the phone jingled. She says I'm a handful, but it was her hand that guided me into this fast-paced life. It's better than her not calling at all. She just wants to talk to you. Sadness tinges Daisy's voice. The glow of the golden hour sunshine streaming through the window blinds me and helps me avoid the delicate topic for my oldest childhood bestie that her mom, Barb, abandoned her in her time of need. Daisy refuses to talk about it. The door to my apartment opens. Miranda enters the room, her hair stylishly disheveled. She wears a short metallic skirt and a fitted tank, one of her outfits that inspired the Neon Nouveau line during an ill-advised late-night brainstorming sesh with public frenemy number one. What's the problem? She asks without missing a beat. Hiya, Miranda. Daisy's smile slowly drops. Blakely's mom won't stop calling. Miranda ignores her. Her recent success has given her an entitled air that she dispenses generously. Miranda has never warmed to Daisy, as likable as she is, wedging me in the middle of perpetual awkwardness. Usually, I keep them separate. 
It's only in the last month that I returned from one of many long stretches abroad, visiting textile makers, presenting BB style at studios in chic cities and tropical locales. Unfortunately, I allowed Miranda and her new husband to stay at my place, during which she helped herself to my closet and inserted herself into my life, and she won't leave. That guy you met on Scroll Click Date has been messaging you. Daisy's eyebrows shoot up with concern as if to ask, why are you using a dating app? And why does Miranda have your login info? Once again, we can blame caffeine for my poor decision making. He and I have pleasant conversations. Zero drama, no strings, it's all good. Who? I ask vaguely, as if I'm not at all interested in dating. I have a career to resurrect. The app is just a distraction when I happen to be home on a Friday night, which is rare. Miranda, your app is at the bottom of my to-do list today. You are aware of what happened on the Coffee Break Morning Show, right? She gives a lazy shrug. Think of... Hashtag coffee break butt as PR. Face palm. Great, there's already a name for it? Of course, you broke the internet for about 15 seconds. There goes my 15 minutes of fame down the drain. My cell phone interrupts the unwanted conversation, likely with someone else texting about the little on-air slip-up. It's Mrs. Benedict. You really should answer it. She's going to get worried. Daisy holds the screen for me to see. Whatever. You're an adult. Do what you want, Miranda counters, sniffing at Daisy. She doesn't look up from her phone as she texts rapidly. If I let it ring again, it'll go to voicemail again. With slightly trembling hands, I press talk. Mom, I can't chat right now, but I'll call you back. I'm going out to dinner with Daisy, I say, in one breath before hanging up. The mention of Daisy's name is sure to pacify my mother, Anne Benedict, who forced me into modeling at a relatively young age. She didn't approve of many of the characters I'd met in the industry over the years, but Daisy is considered safe. Dinner? Daisy asks, surprised I'd go out into public while my butt is being plastered all over the internet. Take out. Ooh, get me something good, Miranda says without breaking her scroll. Daisy's eyes narrow slightly as if to ask, what is she doing here? I don't have the energy to kick her out right now. Without the help of caffeine, I can barely get through the demands and commitments of my career. Although I could go for pizza, macaroni and cheese, pasta, something greasy and full of carbs. My stomach grumbles. Heidi wasn't wrong. My skimpy eating habits and late nights have crept up on me, leaving me oddly empty. Keeping up with this lifestyle is exhausting but I won't succumb to my mother's demands again. Nuh-uh, no way. Not even if it's in my best interest. Maybe you need a break, Daisy says, pulling me from what I realize is a minutes-long stare into space. Oh, come on. Blakely is just getting started. She has the makings of an empire. Miranda cackles like a movie supervillain mogul grooming her next apprentice. As if. But that's easy for her to say. She's been leveraging all my connections to help build her own. The Scroll Click Date app. I shift in my seat. This subject makes me want to squirm right out of my skin. On top of pressure related to my career... My mother tries to dictate what I do, when I do it, and who I do it with. Namely, settle down with a nice, young, well-connected, and wealthy man of her choosing. 
What club are we going to tonight? I hear the dome is a hot spot. Miranda still doesn't look up from her phone. Where's Reed? Daisy asks, referring to Miranda's new husband. He went back up to the lake, had stuff to do. I couldn't wait to get out of that small town. Good riddance. New York is my new home. Miranda declares with a peppy cheer. I have to admit, the sleepy lake town in the wooded north sounds mighty appealing right now. Miranda types feverishly into her phone, reminding me of my hustle when I started BB style at the expense of everything else nearly seven years ago. What's wrong with Lake Winnipesaukee? Daisy asks in a quiet voice. This is where anything that matters happens, Miranda answers with a note of duh in her voice. Don't know why I didn't leave sooner. Daisy and I exchange a look. I'm about to defend our hometown. Daisy, rarely ruffled, presses her lips together as if biting her tongue from speaking her mind. Miranda says, Don't you ever want more, Daisy? Here we are, rubbing shoulders with influencers, VIPs, execs of all stripes. Meanwhile, you're a single mom, living in a tiny lake cottage, working... Where do you work again? Once Miranda gets attention and steals the spotlight, she doesn't know when or how to stop. Kind of like me and Buzz Pop. Before we experience another disaster, I draw a deep breath and say, She does have more, Miranda. Daisy has a family, the secret thing that I want but will never risk admitting because I can't ever have it. Chapter 2 Dean Once upon a time, my life was simple and not a beast to wrangle, though these days most would argue that I'm the beast. When I enter the cafe, I glance around for my college friend, Barrett, who I asked to meet me as a witness to the madness that recently crept into my life. Regretfully, I walk toward a woman with black hair and red highlights. The last time I saw her, it was dyed blonde with green streaks. Her arms are empty. Well, it's about time, Chelsea says by way of greeting, and the source of the madness. Hi to you, too. The clock is ticking. She takes a glug of a frou-frou coffee drink. I wince. Are you nursing? Is that decaf? So sweet of you to care. Reinforces the fact that the baby is yours. This woman simpers, oozing deceit. That's impossible, I say, sticking to my story, the truth. Listen, I don't exactly remember what happened that night either. All I know is I found out I was pregnant, popped out a baby, and now it's your responsibility. I don't just have a hunch it's not my baby. I am 100% certain. The mechanics of baby making are pretty straightforward and we did not engage. You can deny it all you want, but the timing suggests otherwise. She wags her fingers. My jaw is so tense right now, I could bite through stone. The results of the paternity test will be in tomorrow. In that case, just one more day until you officially become the baby daddy. Her hand with long manicured nails rests on my arm. If I flinch, I imagine she'll dig into my flesh with those talons. I always wanted to marry a pilot. Don't you dare skip town. No, forget stone. I could bite through a diamond and not a ring like she's suggesting. Is that what she's suggesting? Why did you want to meet today? We've been going back and forth about this for months. And if you're half the man you claim to be, you'll help me out. It wasn't easy or cheap being pregnant. I had to eat more, take all these vitamins and stuff. 
Now the diapers alone are killing me. She pooches her lips. Where is he? I ask, since I haven't yet actually seen the baby with my own eyes. She's with my boyfriend. The thing is, you could at least be supportive. She holds out her palm in the universal gesture of give me some dough. And I don't mean a plate with a couple of donuts on top that another patron at the cafe walks by with. I don't know much about pregnancy or nursing, but I don't think chugging sugary coffee drinks is a prescription for health. Nonetheless, I take out my wallet and pass her a $100 bill. Thanks, Dean. I knew you were a gentleman. She wrinkles her nose. But you should really shave the beard. You looked cuter without it. I didn't ask your opinion. Well, get used to it, sugar daddy. She slides the strap of her cheetah print purse over her shoulder and strides away. I drop my head into my hands, wishing this nightmare would disappear. I don't know how long I sit there for, replaying every second of that night. I still cannot conceive how Chelsea thinks we conceived. Dino, a deep voice says, coming up from behind. I get to my feet. Barrett and I fist bump, then bro hug. You're late. Does that mean I miss the baby mama? You mean the crazy bus driven by a total clown? Speaking of wild times, have you seen my sister plastered all over the internet and TV? No, Barrett, I have not seen your sister because freshman year of college, you forbid me from ever speaking to her, no less meeting her, so I don't even remotely know what she looks like. Barrett chuckles. Oh, I'm sure you'd recognize her, but you're right. You were a heartbreaker, dating a new girl each week. Of course I'd protect my little sister. Tell me about the mess you've gotten yourself into now. A lot has changed since school. He waves his hand dismissively, then with an air of sarcasm adds, I'm sure you've transformed into quite the gentleman. Time in the Air Force will do that to you and you've become quite the snob. He mock salutes me. I punch him in the arm. And just like that, the tension dissolves, and we're on even ground like we were as freshmen in college. So what the heck happened? Barrett asks. I let out a long sigh. It's true that I'm a gentleman because I would never pursue something with a woman who was as drunk as Chelsea was the night we met. It started innocently enough with us flirting, but she kept tossing back drink after drink. Before I knew it, her friends had left her with me. I did the right thing, brought her home, tucked her into bed, and left water and aspirin by her bedside. We didn't so much as exchange a kiss. Then she came at you, claiming the pregnancy was yours? My stomach wriggles like it did when she first told me. I demanded a paternity test. She wants child support. I guess she's already shacked up with some other guy. The baby is probably his. Barrett smirks and pulls out his phone. Let's see what kind of dirt we can dig up. Two hours and two coffees later, we learn five concerning facts about Chelsea Reisman. One, she's been divorced three times and one annulment. Two, She's been arrested for disorderly conduct twice. Three, she gave up one child for adoption. Four, she's currently unemployed. Five, previous job, adult entertainer. Barrett claps me on the back, jarring me from the way my vision blurs with this information. I'm pretty sure she's trying to take advantage of me, but what do I do? You really picked a winner, buddy. Barrett teeters. I didn't. I have a good lawyer. I snap back into focus. The paternity test will prove my innocence. Keep telling yourself that. His phone beeps, and he reads a text. A girl from the town I grew up in recently moved here, said she's having a party. We should go. But first, the club's call. I'm not really into parties or that kind of thing anymore. He waggles his eyebrows. 
Your current situation suggests differently. Ha ha, I say dryly. Despite the caffeine, I don't have the energy to defend myself. I'm not interested in Chelsea or relationships, period. They just result in loss. Barrett claps his hands together. Meet me tonight. We need to loosen you up. No, I need to get back in the air. Monday morning, I take off into the wild blue yonder, and it can't come soon enough. Hours later, at Barrett's insistence, I climb into the luxury car where he waits in the back seat. He directs the driver to an address on the Lower East Side. The late summer daytime heat still hangs in the air and clings to my skin. I can't quite summon a party mood. This'll be fun. I suggest you get your groove on tonight. This might be the last time if you become a dad. The last time was years ago, Bear Man. I take my job seriously and am not the party type. Ha! Remember that old nickname? And you were Wolfman. I always thought you'd become a wolf of Wall Street type since you were so good with numbers. Surprising to learn you became a pilot. And right now, I just want to fly away. I'm not into city life. The last time I came through Manhattan was when I'd met Chelsea. Was supposed to meet Barrett, in fact. But he had to work late. Ironically, on Wall Street, where he's an investment banker for his stepfather's firm. I regret coming back, but Chelsea said she had something important to discuss. After ignoring her for a week, she looked up my parents and got in touch with them. They don't need any additional stress in their lives. Barrett elbows me as we get out of the car. There will be lots of models at this thing. Great. My tone is flat. What about you? Anyone special in your life? He shrugs and laughs dryly. Just Alexia, Danica, Vicky, and Misha. Seems like the roles have reversed, I say. But he doesn't hear me as the bouncer ushers us past the velvet ropes of the club. The cavernous room is a contrast of shadow and neon, flashing lights and blaring music. The volume penetrates my skull giving me an instant headache. Barrett thrusts a drink into my hand, then disappears into the throbbing crowd. I try to stick to the edges of the room while looking out for my friend. Don't want him to end up in my not-pregnant predicament. I can't claim this is even remotely my scene, as people writhe on the dance floor, forgetting time and place. Friends and loves, as they lose themselves to the rhythm of the pop music. I scan for Barrett and spot him with his arms around two women. He leads them over to where I stand, scrolling the news on my phone. I know, not party vibes, but I'd rather not be here. I can think of a few more appealing activities. Hanging drywall, folding laundry, heck, even doing taxes. Having fun, Barrett asks. Not as much as you, I answer. I think I'm going to head out soon. Want to shoot some hoop in the morning? Grab breakfast afterward? Oh, come on. You've gotten so boring. We're just getting started. The night is young. So are we. He leans in as if to tempt me. Didn't you turn 30 recently? I ask. But you haven't. Not for a few more months. In that case, come on, man, live it up. One of the women flirtatiously fiddles with the button on Barrett's shirt. We're going to a party. You should come. She purrs over the booming music. Barrett looks to me, but without giving me a chance to answer, they start toward the door. I'm not his babysitter, but don't want to abandon my buddy. I set down my still full drink and follow. The car brings us to a well-appointed building on the Upper East Side. When we arrive at the penthouse, Barrett whoops. No way! This is my sister's place. Well, my stepfather's. He lets her stay here on the condition she doesn't have parties or guests. 
unless they're trusted by the family. Guess she's really letting it all hang out today. The two women laugh as if they share an inside joke. Beat heavy music sounds from inside. Bottles and cans litter the surfaces. Chatter and laughter fizz in the room. A woman, wearing a metallic skirt and fitted tank, stumbles as she climbs onto the counter and stands up. She holds a bottle in one hand and takes a swig. She could be Chelsea's twin. I have an announcement to make. Everyone turns toward her. Today we celebrate our hostess with the mostess, who made history by showing the world her cute... And this is my signal to exit. I am not into embarrassing, drunken displays of idiocy. As I stomp down the hall, the way I came, people hoot and clap. A woman with long, blonde hair runs into me, nearly knocking me back. Glowing liquid spews from a can and drenches us both. Well, it beads up on her high-neck tank top made of holographic latex. I blink a few times, not sure if I've just met a real-life Barbie doll. Oh, my, I'm so sorry. She pads my firm chest. Oh, my, she repeats in a lower tone, wearing a short body contouring skirt in bright purple and tall white boots. She weaves and stumbles. Steady there. Are you all right? I grip her arms so she doesn't fall. Her hair hangs in her face as mascara and tears streak her cheeks. She hides behind her hands. Let's say it's been a long day. I'm exhausted and obviously too late to stop her. She gestures down the hall, then shouts. Someone, please take the mic. Unplug the power. I thumb over my shoulder. I don't think she has a microphone. She shakes her head frantically. This was all a mistake. Just make it go away. Again, my cue to leave. Hey, uh, can I call you a cab or... No, this is my house and... An older woman and a formidable-looking businessman appear from the entryway and stand at her back. No, it's not, young lady. It's ours. And I'm out of here. Chapter 3. Blakely. The lumberjack with more than a few days' worth of facial hair and a snarling attitude, on the edge of trouble, brushes past me as he exits. He looks as out of place at this party as my mother and stepfather who fill the doorway to the penthouse. I feel like I'm 16 years old and caught sneaking out, or in this case, sneaking in. I can explain. First, put on a decent shirt, or a corset, a paper bag, anything. Disdain and disappointment drip from my mother's painted lips. What? This outfit is from the Neon Nouveau line, and look, it repels liquid. Don't worry, I haven't been foolish enough to drink more of that radioactive chemical that made me go temporarily insane, although I did find a can of it in the hall. I'd like to dump it out and spare anyone else from the utter chaos and humiliation it has the potential to cause. Who are all these people? My stepfather demands. A shrug inches its way up my shoulders. Uh, that's Miranda on the couch. That belonged to my grandmother. It's an antique, says Bernard Benedict, finance guy, owner of three casinos, a cigar cartel, multimillionaire, and my stepfather. Barrett! My mother squawks. What are you doing here? My brother disguises his surprise at the newcomers, a.k.a. our parents, while I suppress my shock at seeing him here as he sidles over and wraps his arm around me. 
he reeks of alcohol. Just checking on my sis. Looks like she has things well in hand. My mother looks more scandalized than if someone had pulled the funding on all her favorite charities combined. Claiming the managers had been spending the money on latex clothing. She's a strong supporter of orphans, widows, and puppies. Are the police here? Miranda slurs, stumbling toward us. Oh, hi, Barrett. Haven't seen you in ages. Looking as F-I-N-E as ever. The thing is, when I was actually 16, I was never caught having parties because I had a cozy life in northern New Hampshire with my grandmother, who is the sweetest woman on earth. It was an oasis in the high-pressure world of the model lifestyle my mom pressed upon me. Miranda? my mother asks. She takes a moment to come into focus, then she repeats with the same level of shock. Mrs. Benedict? Blakely, what's your mom doing here? A guy with stringy brown hair and a deep v-neck shirt slings his arm around me. Your mom is hot, Leon says. Who is this? my mother asks. My not-boyfriend. My voice is pure defeat. What's a not-boyfriend? Bernard asks. Everyone has to go, I say, instead of answering the question. What, are the police here? Someone shouts. Worse, my mom. I try to give her an I've-got-this-under-control smile. I don't. Is she CIA? FBI? Immigration? Leon asks. No, she's a mother, and right now I'm in deep. All the guests rush past us like a school of frightened fish. Somehow, Leon, Miranda, and my brother are swept along with them, leaving me with my parents. Figures my brother slinked away without so much as a reprimand. Then again, from what I've heard, while I was living with Nana, he was here in the city with Mom and wasn't a stranger to late-night shenanigans. My mother stalks inside, surveying the damage. Using a pair of greasy chopsticks, she plucks a pink sock off the counter amidst empty bottles and cans. Explain yourself fast. It was, uh, it was a going-away party? Things got a little out of hand. I'm sorry. I allow the sticky sort of lie to peel off my tongue. At least, according to my brother, honesty and a quick apology usually work. I'm disappointed in you, young lady. I thought I'd seen enough with you on live TV bearing your backside. That was an accident. Obviously, I won't be leaving any more room for accidents. She uses air quotes. I'll be sending a cleaning service over tomorrow afternoon. Things are about to change. Tell your little friend she has to move out. Miranda? Gladly. The party was for her anyway. Well, it was suggested by her. She thought it would make me feel better after the mishap on the coffee break morning show. With her hands planted on her hips and a scowl on her lips, and Benedict turns on her heel. I am missing precious sleep. Pack your bags. I will see you at dinner tomorrow evening. Bernard, let's go. She snaps her fingers. At last, alone in the apartment, I want nothing more than to sink onto the couch. No, through the couch would be better. Maybe there's another dimension on the other side where I didn't have a wardrobe malfunction on national television and then try to pretend it didn't happen, per Miranda's suggestion, and throw a party to all the influencers who matter to make it seem like I don't care about the mishap. But I do. I care a lot. I've made one poor decision and mistake after another lately. Feeling guilty, I pick through the bottles and cans, 
not really knowing the first thing about recycling or whatever, so I put them all as close to the sink as possible. My phone beeps with a text. Miranda, is the coast clear? Things were just starting to heat up. Me, if you're asking whether my mother has left the building, I don't recommend coming back. There's no telling if she has the place staked out. Miranda, oh, come on, you only live once. Lately, I'm so tired, I hardly feel like I'm living. A half-empty neon can of Buzz Pop on the counter looks tempting. Swept into the pressure of trying to live a certain lifestyle has turned my life toxic, but I don't know how to change it. Even though I don't usually, ever, host parties, it's part of my job to meet and greet, to see and be seen. Late nights like this bubble with drama, my relationship with Leon, my not-boyfriend, fizzled well before tonight, and failing to meet my parents' expectations makes me feel like a loser because they've given me so much. Me. I feel bad. My mom was upset. It's probably not a good idea to come back. I'm sorry. Miranda. I don't believe in guilt, but I don't have anywhere else to go. Me. I'll pay for a hotel for you to stay in tonight. As a newlywed, Miranda should probably be home with her husband. Instead, she's here in New York acting like she's single. She doesn't reply but my phone lets out a rapid series of beeps from people, asking about the party and the chat show incident this morning. I slouch to my bedroom, and my gaze lands on a landscape painting by my grandmother with a girl sitting in a field. She holds a single flower, and I've never been able to tell if she's happy that she has it or sad because it's the only one. Something neon and liquid drips off the corner of the frame. Then I realize a woman with black hair and red highlights passed out on my bed. My brow furrows. Still half asleep, I nudge her awake and she shrugs toward the door. Can I call you a cab? I ask, echoing what the out-of-place lumberjack said to me earlier. Sure she says, leaning against the wall. Hey, you're the lady from the TV. You probably shouldn't drink so much. She points one lazy finger at me. Shouldn't I ask you the same question? My nostrils flare. It was an energy drink. I swallow back further comment and stab my phone, calling a car service. The doorman will be there until the driver arrives. Without so much as a thank you, she gets in the elevator. I click off my phone and drop into bed, not waking up until a vacuum whirs into my dreams. Usually, housekeeping comes on Friday. Bolting upright, I put the pieces of the day before together. Today is Wednesday, because yesterday was... I slap my forehead, sending my back onto the mattress. Gazing up at the ceiling, I want to blame Buzz Pop, Heidi Simmons, Miranda, my mom, but no, this is a me problem. It's not something I can escape by getting on a plane for a fashion show in Paris, buckle down in the studio and create a new line, or solicit the help of my friends in the industry. I've succeeded because I push through, get it done, or avoid it altogether, whatever the it of the day, week, or month is. I survived and thrived through the textile shortage of 14, using alternative materials and leading an eco-movement for better products and fairer wages for our fabricators. During the rice cake contamination of 16 that took out half our models during Fashion Week, I came through by hiring everyday women to walk the runway. Then in 18, our studios flooded, destroying our inventory. That was a real blow. 
But along with my best designers, we took shifts and hardly slept for a week while we sewed, replacing the designs. But every moment in between, I've schmoozed, partied, rubbed elbows, or whatever you want to call it. I haven't stopped to take a break, catch my breath, or wonder why I chugged some unknown nuclear substance that fried my sense of propriety on a morning talk show. The slip-up with my dress notwithstanding, that was a true accident. However, I should have checked to make sure everything, including the hem of my skirt, was where it belonged. I'm the kind of tired, worn out, and dragged down that sleep won't cure. But if that's not the solution, for the first time in my life, I'm not sure how to fix my problem. How I'm thinking clearly right now is beyond me. Is this actually a lucid moment, or am I having another delusional fit? Eventually, I must fall back to sleep, because when I wake up, my muted phone displays 234 messages, emails, and calls combined. My stomach has that empty, pitted feeling. Anxiety and hunger are not a good combination. After answering as many of the messages as possible, I pull on a blouse and an A-line skirt I wouldn't ordinarily wear. I accessorize with my grandmother's pearls, a gift when I'd graduated high school. I should reply to the Fab Five's concerns and questions about where I am and what I'm doing. Daisy will fill them in. Thankfully, she left before the carnage last night. When I arrive at my parents' penthouse suite, four blocks over, the savory smell of home, like on the coffee break morning show, meets my nose. Mom and Bernard usually only eat in on Sundays, and that's with the help of Dean and DeLuca delivery. She must be trying to save face by not going to a restaurant. Anne Benedict is a predator, and I brace myself for fallout from my behavior. Blakely, dear, good to see you, Mom says, kissing me on the cheek as if nothing happened. Maybe with the help of Buzz Pop, I did enter an alternate reality, and everything that happened in the last 36 hours was a bad dream. I don't let down my guard because the backlash could come at any moment. In another room, a strident voice ends a call followed by approaching footsteps. Wearing a polo shirt and khaki slacks, Barrett smirks like the time he broke Bernard's face and blamed it on me. Barrett's here, and your father should be along shortly. Let's just iron out that wrinkle from last night and move on, shall we? I'm relieved my brother is here to act as a buffer. He's caused the most trouble out of the two of us, or at least he was the one who's gotten caught. But when she turns around, he makes the universal symbol for Velociraptor. It's similar to a T-Rex with its tiny arms tucked by its side, but it whips its head from side to side and gnashes its teeth. Chills bump across my skin, and my heart beats out a rapid rhythm. I mouth, what's she going to do? Barrett's phone buzzes with a text. I'll be right back, he says, excusing himself from the kitchen. At least there are weapons in here. Obviously, I wouldn't use a steak knife against my mom, but she does have sharp teeth. The jumbo oranges in the crystal bowl on the counter look like they could do some damage and buy me time to escape if she unleashes her carnivore-like fury. An envelope with my grandmother's address also sits on the counter along with a key. My chest swells with nostalgia and my eyes brim with tears. I recall my early childhood, growing up at the lake, chasing lightning bugs and roasting marshmallows over smoldering campfires. The peacefulness that washes over me feels spacious, welcoming. I stop short of slapping myself on the face 
I cannot let down my guard. Mom, are you selling Nana's place? That depends. She glances down at her phone that beeps with an incoming message. I frown. That depends on what? I wonder if Nana is getting worse. She's at the care home for people living with Alzheimer's in New Hampshire, near the lake where I grew up. There's no chance my grandmother is moving home, but I cannot fathom my mother selling the house. If an object could embody someone, Nana practically is the cottage. That was Bernard. A thick line creases Anne's eyebrows. He's hung up at the office and will be a little late. Barrett comes in, rubbing his hands together. Everything is all set. Let's eat. Mom dishes up baby fingerling potatoes, roast duck, and haricot verts. Halfway through the mostly silent meal, Bernard blusters in. He and Barrett instantly talk about work. I slide the green beans around on my plate, waiting for the velociraptor to attack. I called a family meeting because I'm concerned. My mother pushes her plate away. After she daintily wipes her lips, they form a flat line. My hand closes around the tablecloth. No way can I pull one of those moves when someone pulls it off the table without disturbing the dishware and cutlery. I'd wrap it around me like a superhero cloak and then leap out the window in a single bound, taking flight. Fabric has never failed me yet. Oh, except the yellow neon vinyl. But is that fabric, really? I've made the argument that it is, but now I'm rethinking the matter. Mom glances at Bernard. We've thought a lot about this, and we think you need a break, Blakely. Relief washes through me. I agree. You should go stay at Nana's cabin for a while. Let the whole television thing blow over. Get your life back together. I smile, beaming with gratitude. Hearing my mother say those words, giving me permission to slow down, ease up, and take my foot off the accelerator, is like an instant jolt of energy without the buzz of the neon drink. Thank you. Yes, that's just what I need. Why hadn't I thought of it myself? Why not just stop the hustle for a few days? The corners of my mother's lips don't tip up with a smile, though. There's limited cell service, and you'll be responsible for all your laundry, meals, and cleaning. I can do that. My brother's eyebrows pinch together in a pitying, doubtful look. What? I can do laundry and wash dishes. How hard can it be? He titters. Hey, a little support would be nice, I hiss. Don't worry, I got your back. Like you did last night? What were you doing there anyway? If I'm not mistaken, by the looks of things, you're right on my heels trying to keep up the rat race pace. You think I'm in line to have a quarter-life crisis? You've passed that. Remember, you're 30 now. He scrubs his hand down his face. Don't remind me. I pitch an eyebrow. Does aging freak you out? Is that why you were at the party with those girls? They were 22. Barrett, I say flatly. Blakely? he repeats. Just listen to what mom has to say. I catch the corner of my brother's smirk as she calls for my attention. It's time for dessert. I don't get the sense that she's going to poison me, but realize too late that her suggestion simply to go to the cottage and decompress was too easy. It was too good to be true as a brute of a man walks into the dining room. Nope, I have a feeling Anne Benedict is going for the throat. I recognize the look in her eyes. It's the one I've had to wear successfully in order to climb to the zenith I have in the fashion world. Trouble is, from up here, it's a long way to fall. 
and I'm afraid I'm hurtling out of control on a sharp descent. And the truth is, my social battery is hashtag dead. Going to Lake has never sounded so good, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there must be a catch. Chapter 4 Dean Barrett and Mr. Benedict get to their feet and shake my hand. I've only met Bernard once before, and if I didn't know better, I'd say he was Bear Man's biological father. They're both average height, thickening around the middle, and with thinning hair. I'll have a word with my buddy to clean up his lifestyle and learn better methods than partying to deal with stress. The military straightened me out. Too late for Barrett to enlist, but he's not going to have this amount of kick and vinegar forever. The world of Wall Street may treat his wallet well, but you can't buy health and happiness. Dean Wolfson, so glad you joined us, Mr. Benedict says. I think you'll soon find our plans mutually beneficial. Thank you for having me to your home, and it's lovely seeing you again, Mrs. Benedict. Having only met a couple of times back in college, out of context, it's only now that I realize she was the woman standing in the doorway of the penthouse at the party last night. Confusion blurs my understanding of what happened there and what's going on right now when my gaze falls on a woman with smooth blonde hair and green eyes that remind me of the deepest, darkest forest. Nothing about her resembles the others at the table. She must be Barrett's sister. No wonder he wanted me to stay away from her when we were in college. We stare at each other for a long, awkward moment that feels like an old, dry rubber band stretching taut. Will it withstand the tension, or will it snap? This is my sister Blakely, Barrett says. Meet Dean. You were at the party last night, she blurts. The elder Benedict's gazes lock on me like a pair of lasers. He was tagging along with me, Barrett says, doing damage control. It started as a small dinner gathering like right now, and some ne'er-do-wells crashed the whole thing. I needed to bring in some muscle in case. Ne'er-do-wells? Blakely discreetly mouths in her brother's direction. It concerns me how easily he lies to his parents. Mrs. Benedict purses her lips with concern. Hmm, yes, you have to be careful nowadays. You just never know who might turn up. The Winthrops were having an intimate gathering in a restaurant, and that billionaire eccentric who trained at least a dozen monkeys to be his servants and even dressed them up just joined them at the table. Can you imagine? What a spectacle. They were chimps, dear, Mr. Benedict corrects. Did the guy bring the chimps with him to the restaurant? Barrett asks with a titter. I have no idea who they're talking about. Mrs. Benedict gestures for me to sit down at the table with them. I was just getting dessert. She excuses herself to the kitchen. Barrett mentioned you've done some traveling and you've been to all seven continents, Mr. Benedict says. Let's hear some highlights. Being a pilot has helped, sir. Australia was exceptional. I roamed through the outback, hopped over to New Zealand, tried surfing. Mrs. Benedict reappears with a cake printed with the word congratulations across the top. What are we celebrating? Blakely asks. Your engagement, Mrs. Benedict says simply. She laughs nervously. Is this a twisted joke because of the morning show incident? Like, congratulations for making a public mockery of yourself, dear? Blakely imitates her mother's voice. Thanks for rubbing it in, Mom. My stomach churns as what can only amount to a harebrained idea comes into focus. I'd mentioned to Barrett that my mom's charity, PCO Sisters, was in trouble. He said he had an idea for how to save it and to meet him for dessert tonight. It's no joke. We're celebrating your pending nuptials, dear. My what? Blakely's green eyes bore into her mother, 
At least they're not on me, because they could take me under, and no way will I let that happen. I'm as much in the market for a relationship or dating as I am a gold-plated Monopoly board, which I spotted when I came in. Blakely, remember when we were younger we'd play Truth or Dare? Barrett asks. She cups her hand over her mouth, then says, Did the Fab Five tell you about the forever marriage match? Barrett leans back in his chair and crosses his arms. His eyes take on a calculated gleam. Depends. What are you talking about? She asks. What are you talking about? He repeats. I don't have a sister or brother, but get the sense there's some high-level sibling telepathy going on right now. Children, Mrs. Benedict says. We're not children, Mom, they both say at the same time. You're acting like it. Listen, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible for all parties involved. As Bernard said, we've come up with a mutually beneficial proposal. Will you stop using that word? Blakely asks. Sticks and stones will... Barrett starts sing-songing the childhood rhyme. Blakely flashes a death ray. Would anyone like a slice of cake? Mrs. Benedict asks, as if her offspring aren't about to shoot invisible lasers at each other across the table. Mr. Benedict raises his fork in affirmation. Mom, give credit where credit is due. For the record, I came up with the plan, Barrett says. My eyes slit in his direction. So I have you to blame for whatever clown show I'm about to be privy to? Barrett titters. You're going to love it, old man. Old man? You've changed, Dean. You're a responsible adult. To say I'm miffed by whatever is going on is an understatement. That's exactly what we were hoping for. Mrs. Benedict claps and bounces on her toes before remembering her decorum. We don't want to sully the family name, and Barrett came up with the perfect solution to keep everything in order. Mr. Benedict says. Explain the forever marriage match so mom and dad understand. Barrett scratches his temple as he speaks. In college, we used to play cards on Friday nights, and I identified Barrett's tell. He's putting her on. He has no idea about the marriage match or whatever Blakely was talking about. Likely, he's testing to see whether it will work to his advantage. I'm not a businessman, but the pieces of his scheme start to drop into place. I'm two seconds from leaving because I want no part in whatever he has up his sleeve, but curiosity makes it so I can't pull myself away. Now that Blakely was offered the floor to speak, she's dangerously captivating. She folds her arms in front of her chest. Instead of being upset, it almost seems like a protective gesture. Back in high school, Cora, Paisley, Daisy, Mila, and I made a vow that if we weren't married by the time Miranda said I do, we'd tie the knot with the next guy we dated, but it has to be done before our 10-year high school reunion. Mrs. Benedict's eyes bug out of her head. See? So juvenile. Where did I go wrong, Bernie? Her husband pats her hand. Barrett snorts. Settle down, Mom. She's joking around. I'm not. Blakely recites. We vow to enact this marriage match. If we don't marry before our enemy, from that cue, we have one year to say I do. The next guy we date will be our fate. Our grooms-to-be hold the key. To our hearts it's true, so we won't die blue. The pact is a fact, an oath to betroth. To break is to partake in work for the snake. We all signed it. Mrs. Benedict sniffs. How incredibly immature. Barrett titters. Is Cora still single? She was always so cute. Blakely sticks her tongue out at her brother. She's happily married. Anne throws her hands in the air. This is ridiculous, Blakely. It's time you grow up. Mom, I run a successful multi-million dollar company. I'm plenty grown up. She arches an eyebrow. 
Yesterday's antics, both morning and night, suggest otherwise. They bicker back and forth. I scrub my hand through my beard. What have I gotten myself into? My last flight was from the Caribbean. Maybe I went off course and landed in the Bermuda Triangle, and I entered an alternate reality. I tune back into the Benedict family drama when Blakely says something about being the butt of a joke. Barrett tosses his head back with laughter. It's not funny, she grinds out. No, it's not. Not at all, Mrs. Benedict says. This is very serious. Meanwhile, Mr. Benedict works on his second slice of cake. He holds up a forkful. Then, in my and Blakely's direction, says, This is delicious. Did you make it, Anne? Don't be silly. Mr. Benedict says, Well, congrats, kids. Here's to your future. There is nothing kid-like about this brute of a man except maybe his table manners. What is he doing here? Blakely looks me up and down. I pull my elbows off the linen. I'm here because I don't want my mother's business to go under, but I certainly don't want to get involved in this hot mess. Blakely's cheeks flare. Yes, she's hot, but I'm not looking. Nope. I'm glaring at my college best friend, wondering just what he wants to talk me into. Blakely, remember your manners, please. Dean here is our guest and your future husband. Mrs. Benedict says with a genial smile as she sweeps her hand in our direction like she's presenting a game show prize. Blakely blinks a few times, then her jaw slowly lowers before she snaps it shut. Barrett slaps me on the shoulder, practically rattling my head in my brain. As Dad said, congrats, Wolfman. Oh, I almost forgot. The ring. Mrs. Benedict scurries out of the room. The four of us sit there in stunned silence, except for Mr. Benedict's chewing. Blakely leans her elbows on the table and spiders her head in her hands. I don't understand. Mom said I was going to stay at Nana's for a while. How does marriage fit into this? What are you all talking about? Dean here is a solid dude. He's also super mature. You sound like you're 13, Blakely and I say at the same time. Barrett titters. Mrs. Benedict returns and slides a diamond in an antique setting onto her daughter's finger. It fits perfectly. The sparkle catches in Blakely's green eyes as she admires the stone for one mesmerizing moment. Then she snaps too. I still don't understand. You and Dean are getting married, then going to the cottage to play house, Mrs. Benedict says. Ha ha. She's not kidding, Barrett says. You're both bananas. Mrs. Benedict smiles primly. My nutritionist says they're a potassium-rich fruit. Blakely fires back at her brother. I'd expect this from Mom, but she said this was your idea. Mom called me this morning, explaining that she thinks you need to settle down. Dean came to mind. He merges his hands, pressing his palms together. The perfect union. He's a mature, responsible, no-nonsense adult. 29, going on 50. Blakely balks. And what am I? You're 28, going on 16. Mom is concerned about your lifestyle. The pace, the pressure, the parties... How am I a solution? I ask, finally getting a word in edgewise. I confront the money to help recover the family biz. My parents run a charitable organization to educate and support those experiencing polycystic ovarian syndrome. PCO Sisters is basically my mother's second child, but someone who recently donated had a dubious background and mom returned the sum leaving the nonprofit short after they'd invested in a new initiative. So you're buying my love? Blakely shoots a laser death ray at her family. Who said anything about love? I shift in the chair, knocking my knees into the bottom of the table. Barrett rolls his eyes. Love, marriage, whatever. 
So let's get this straight. You're arranging a marriage, and the bailout money is Blakely's dowry? I ask. That's about the sum of it, yeah, Barrett says. Some friend? What did I ever do to you? My tone drips with sarcasm. You've been a great friend, but after hanging out, I see now that you're husband material. You'll make an honest woman out of my sister. There's no one in the world I'd trust to take care of her more than you. So you think if you just stash me up in the sticks with this lumberjack, like this is the 1800s, and I'm some cow to barter, all my problems will go away? Blakely asks. Mrs. Benedict shrugs like it crossed her mind. Blakely's mouth twists. The obvious answer is no, absolutely not. Under no circumstance and in no reality will I marry a stranger because you want me to settle down. Despite what you say, I'm a legal adult. Mrs. Benedict slowly drums her fingers on the table. Her eyes flash and narrow. On opposite ends of a second, she went from an overbearing but well-meaning mother to the kind of creature that gives children nightmares. The other option is selling Nana's cottage. You wouldn't, Blakely says. When was the last time you were there? Mrs. Benedict asks. Blakely's shoulders slowly lift and lower. I drove by when I was up there for Miranda's wedding. I've been paying the taxes and upkeep all these years. It's a seller's market. The smart thing to do would be to list it. It's a liability, but I've encouraged Mom to wait at least until after Nana passes, Barrett says to his sister. Blakely pouts. You're both so insensitive. Say I do or lose the cottage and Nana. Mrs. Benedict drops the ultimatum like a gavel. What's that supposed to mean? Blakely asks. It means I will revoke your visitation rights. You're a monster. No, I'm your mother. Same thing. Oof, even I wince at that one. You have no idea what that place means to me. Obviously I do. This is a reasonable offer, and it's the only one I'll make. Mrs. Benedict speaks in a cool, calculated tone. Mom, I don't know the first thing about... Does the cottage even have internet? Obviously, Blakely made her decision. Well, no, but that's the point. Get you out of the rat race, away from the bad influences. You're the one who put me in the rat race and forced me to become a model at such a young age. It served us at the time. Blakely presses her palm against her forehead. How will I work? Mrs. Benedict taps Blakely's other hand and goes from beast under the bed to mom in an instant. The idea is to take a break, dear. Remember, we lived there until I met Bernard. It was a simpler time. It's going to be great. Trust me, I think you'll find Dean to be a perfect gentleman and husband. When put that way, the air sucks out of the room. The last weeks of my life have been like a twister, carving a path between the constructs of my life. It was a close call with Chelsea, but I found out this morning that I am not the father of her baby. Now she's putting the little girl up for adoption. Then I found out my parents' company is in trouble. Hours later, Barrett came along with a plan to bail them out. The only catch is I have to marry his sister, who turns out to be a spoiled, high-maintenance drama queen. Although she is hot. There's no denying that. The military may have tamed me, but I'm still a red-blooded man. I haven't been attracted to someone in a long, long time. Too bad Blakely doesn't have a better personality. My parents worked hard, and they're about to lose everything. I can't let them, so I convince myself the marriage will just be temporary. Then I can get on with my life. So what do you say, sis? The ring looks good on you. Barrett must be appealing to Blakely's fondness for expensive shiny things. I'm not sure she's my kind of woman. Blakely sulks. Okay, fine. I'll do it. But only because then I'll be able to visit Nana. 
You really just speak your mind, huh? I ask. Get used to it, honey, she sings songs. I smirk. Okay, sugar muffin. This might be better viewing than the coffee break morning show. Barrett rubs his hands together. Blakely flashes him a thumbs down. No one here subscribed to your newsletter, so there's no need to share your opinion. It's then that I realize that I'm about to marry a brat. Chapter 5. Blakely After Dean, my future husband, stomps out of the apartment without so much as a proper goodbye, Barrett, the traitor, and my stepdad adjourn to the patio to smoke cigars. This is normal and not part of the engagement party festivities. My mother remains at the table. The cake is half gone, with thanks to the two Benedict men. Mom, is this for real? As real as my marriage with Bernard was. But you were in love. She tilts her head slightly. Love? It was more of a business transaction. I had two kids who needed care and saw an opportunity. Are you serious? As serious as your little stunt on the television yesterday morning. I've told you that was an accident. Or a cry for help. A public breakdown. I bury my face in my hands. I have to go. My mother wears a prim smile. To Lake Winnipesaukee? When... I drag my hands down my face, no doubt terrible for my skin, and now my lower eyelids sting because the traction pulled too hard. You head up in two days after we go to City Hall to sign off on your wedding. You make it sound transactional. This is all happening so fast, too fast. I need time to prepare everyone at the studio. Then I remember that in a late-night frenzy in reaction to the outpouring of social media commentary about my, ahem, situation, I told the team to take a hiatus. Paid, of course. At least until this blows over and I figure out how to do damage control. The headlines are already coming in. Get to the bottom of fashion show trends showcased on the Coffee Break Morning Show. Fashion model turned designer bears all on the Coffee Break Morning Show. The Coffee Break Morning Show was a hit today, but... Getting married at City Hall isn't romantic. I always dreamed of a big wedding, with a bridal party, decorations, and a gown, at least. Trust me, it's going to work out splendidly, my mother says. I grunt and aggressively push the chair in. I feel like pouting, slamming things, and stomping like the lumberjack. Instead, I go to the kitchen and nab the bag of cookies my mother keeps for guests who bring children. Not that she ever let so much as a morsel of something with sugar pass my lips when I was younger. She had to keep me looking svelte, like a model. Then my mother adds, And dear, I wasn't joking about taking you off Nana's visitors list. Tears pierce the corners of my eyes, and like driving rain, the threat takes the wind out of my sails. Since they officially ousted me from my apartment, I spend the night in my bedroom, not the one I grew up at the cottage, but the one I've used here when visiting. It's like I'm moving backward in time, a child in an adult's body. Then again... I did wish to press rewind and not guzzle that can of buzz pop. I pound my fists into the bed and then stare up at the ceiling. My phone beeps with a text. Maybe it'll be a good thing if I don't have Wi-Fi for a while. To my relief, it's Daisy in the Fab Five group chat, asking how I'm holding up. The others have been supportive, but not intrusive. I'm guessing Daisy told them I need some space. Me. Hmm, how am I? Let's see. Ruined. Mortified. Engaged. Mila. What was that last one? Darn that autocorrect. Cora. Forever marriage match coming in hot. 
Did you get a series of marriage proposals after the on-air airing of your... Cora. Oops, I thought twice about sending that, but my finger slipped. Sorry, sore spot, I know. But you do have a really nice butt. Paisley. Back up. Eep. Sorry, didn't mean it. But seriously, what was that about being engaged? I don't answer for a long minute, letting the butt jokes roll off me like water off a duck. Daisy. Do I need to come back? Me. As a matter of fact, I'll be coming to you. Cora. Oh, good. I'm worried about you, sweetie. It's best not to isolate yourself during difficult times. Me. I mean that my mother decided to kick me out of the apartment and banish me to Nana's cottage. Mila. Oh, that's what you meant by engaged. Paisley. It still doesn't make sense. Mila. Engaged like busy, meaning she has plans. I give myself another moment because as soon as I tell them, it'll be official. Real. Me. No, like engaged to be married. Part A of my mother's master plan is for me to settle down with a nice man, more like a brute with a beard. Part B is for us to, and I quote, play house up north. Cora, that doesn't sound like an Anne Benedict evil plan. Paisley, that's exactly what it sounds like. Remember the Girl Scout cookie gambit? Mila, how could you have let this happen? If you do this, the balance of power shifts. It'll only be Daisy and me who are unwed. Cora, you have to fulfill the pact or else you'll be working for Miranda. Me. This whole thing is kind of her fault. Paisley. As Cora pointed out, her getting married was a blessing in disguise. Me. Because you guys met your forever men, I'm being farmed off to some lumberjack my brother knew in college. This is very much Miranda's fault because she was staying with me and begged me to have a party. Mila. You could have said no. Daisy. I still want to know why Miranda isn't up here with Reed. Mila writes a few unkind words about our frenemy. Maybe things aren't working out between the newlyweds. Even though I'll fulfill the dare, I'm also certain to be the first to divorce. No way will things last with the lumberjack. I don't plan on trying to make it work. I just want to appease mom and dad, retain visiting rights with my beloved grandmother, then go back to business as usual. This time, I'll just skip the energy drink. Cora, are you even single? I thought you were dating. Me, I'd been using Miranda's app. Mila, traitor. Paisley, what about Jackson, Caden, and Aiden? Me, Jackson only wanted a friends with benefits situation. Turned out Caden was married to a woman in Estonia. Aiden didn't approve of swimming in lakes and other bodies of water. Said we were intruding on fish's homes. Mila. That's oddly specific. Cora. But weren't you seeing someone named Leon? Me. The not boyfriend. Daisy. What does that mean? Me. He refused to label us. Wouldn't let me call him my boyfriend refused to call me his girlfriend. Also, he went home with someone else after the party. Safe to assume we're not anything anymore. I've dated plenty, but never to find someone to settle down with, as if that's some kind of life requirement. Lady bosses like me have had to put work first to get to where we are. Anyway, finding the one is pointless. It's not like I can ever have a family, the tears from earlier try to make a second appearance, but I push them away. Mila, can't you rent your own place? Scrap the plan. Show them who's the girl boss. Me, even though I run a multi-million dollar business, my money is tied up right now. My liquid assets aren't enough to rent or buy the kind of apartment in New York that I'm accustomed to. Paisley, Rents are high. If I'd known, I would have tried to get you into my old building. Me. Thanks. 
but I've gotten used to a certain kind of lifestyle, but also caught up in a certain lifestyle. Cora, could you talk to your mom? Me. I did, and I've learned to pick my battles. The thing is, she said that if I don't go through with this, she'll sell Nana's cottage and keep me from visiting her. Mila, she didn't. We all know she did. And deep down, I know my Neon Nouveau life isn't sustainable. Or healthy. Kind of like reaching into the bag on my bed for the third, okay, fine, the tenth cookie. Daisy. In that case, congratulations. Paisley. Tell us about him. Me. He has a beard. Not my type. Gruff. Serious. Kind of rude. Went to college with Barrett. Actually, he was at the party last night with my brother. He can't be all that straight-laced. He called Barrett Bear Man, and Barrett called him Wolf Man. That's the extent of what I know. Oh, and he's taller than me. I leave out the part about his full lips and shiny hair. I'm supposed to be the one with the good hair. Also, he looked pretty strong under the plaid shirt he wore, but they don't need to know that. Daisy. That's a plus. Cora. Sounds like he has a sense of humor with the bear man, wolf man thing. Mila. Or too much testosterone. Daisy. I like a manly man. Paisley. Does he have a job? A criminal record? He must have a good reason to go along with your mother's outrageous plan. Me. I think Dean's a pilot. Mila. So what's in it for him other than marrying you? Me. I gathered that my brother is helping his family's business out of financial trouble. Daisy. How altruistic. I like a man who puts family first. Cora. Send us pictures. Where is he on social media? Me. I checked. No obvious accounts. Daisy. A man of mystery. The girls text a bunch of emojis. I send them a photo of the ring on my finger. Nana's ring. When times were tight, she offered to sell it to help support us after my dad left. Looking back, that was around when Mom met Bernard. I always saw her departure from our family to New York as a selfish act, but really, she did it to help support us. Right now, it's just me. No kids. No real responsibilities other than to BB Style and my crew. And if I'm honest, piles of fabric, clothing designs, and racks of clothing aren't the greatest company. In two days, I'll no longer be single. I click over to the Scroll Click Date app, Miranda's dating site. May as well flirt while I can. I open the conversation with at Fly Guy. We've never met, but have flirted with going on a date. He's based in Atlanta, but frequently comes to New York for work. His avatar is a jet, and mine is a dress. The app has a blind date feature, so you don't know what the person looks like unless you choose to meet. Because this is a unique feature, and since I'm a public figure, I set my issues with Miranda aside and created an account. I click the bell icon to see if he wants to chat. He doesn't answer right away, and I make the mistake of scrolling social media, getting an eyeful of my own butt. I'm not sure which is worse. Paisley's utter humiliation when her famous movie star boyfriend was cheating on her or the world seeing my rear end. At Fly Guy. Hello. At Fashion Girl. What you doing? At Fly Guy. I'm contemplating what's become of my life. At Fashion Girl. Me too. Remember when things used to be simple? At Fly Guy. Yeah, when the only responsibilities that mattered were making sure you showered, ate, and made a productive contribution to society. At Fashion Girl. Those were the days. Now they're rife with big life decisions, commitments, and change. Constant change. At Fly Guy. Totally. I had a day. At Fashion Girl. I'm not trying to one-up you or anything, but I've had a week. At Fly Guy. You can tell me about it if you need to rant. At Fashion Girl. 
Let's just say that I drank an obscene amount of a highly suspicious beverage containing caffeine, took a temporary break from reality, publicly embarrassed myself, and now am paying the consequences. At Fly Guy. Oof, that's rough. Did you get fired? At Fashion Girl. Something like that. I was just checking my email and learned that key investors pulled funding from our projects. At Fly Guy. I'm sorry. At Fashion Girl. Actually, that's not even the worst of it, but I don't want to bore you with my sob story. What's going on with you? At Fly Guy. Also a boring sob story. How can I tell him that our little online flirtation isn't going anywhere? I'm tempted to ask the Fab Five what to say, but feel so pathetic. I don't want them to know that I met a guy online that I actually like a lot but have been afraid to meet in person, and now it's too late. Hmm. I'll go with that. At Fashion Girl. Hey, I have something else to tell you. I know this thing with us isn't serious, but, um, I wish we'd met before now. Unfortunately, I'm no longer available. A long moment passes before he replies. At Fly Guy. I understand. Wish we'd taken the risk. As it stands, I'm going to be busy for the foreseeable future. Dating doesn't fit into the equation. At Fashion Girl. It's been fun. I really like talking to you. I hope you find someone special. At Fly Guy. You too. At Fashion Girl. I guess this is goodbye. I delete the app, but hope it isn't a goodbye forever. Maybe just a goodbye for now because I can't imagine connecting with anyone like we did. Well, at least online. The idea of spending forever with one of Barrett's friends makes me wish I'd never taken a sip from that can of Buzz Pop. Chapter 6. Dean I toss and turn, unable to sleep. I tell myself that I made the right decision. Barrett can offer the funding my family needs in exchange for helping out his sister. I'd have bailed them out myself, but my money is tied up with Chelsea's mess right now. Anyway, babysitting a grown woman can't be that much harder than taking care of an infant, right? I scrub my hand down my face. What have I gotten myself into? Oh, the simple life. How I long for the days when my only obligations were to the skies and my flight squadron. Soon I'll have a kid and a wife in my care. Then again, I've never traveled the traditional route. I'm not the kind of guy to ask for directions or follow the signs for a detour. For better or worse, I pave my own way, fly my own plane. Only this time, it's going to involve till death do us part. But I remind myself this is merely a marriage of convenience, a business deal. I'll say I do, save my mom's charity, and then get out and have a quiet divorce. No harm done. My phone beeps with another message. I sigh, saying goodbye to what could have become something good had I been in one place long enough to pursue dating. I send a quick reply to at Fashion Girl. I don't use social media or the internet much, but a while back I lost a bet to another pilot, and he forced me to get an account on a dating app. I met one girl, and we hit it off right away. Too bad we played it safe and kept things app-only, since it's a text-limited program, meaning no photos allowed, for all I know, she might look like one of those inflatable windsocks outside auto dealerships. I'm probably better off not getting involved in anything real anyway. I turn off the sound on my phone and force myself to go to sleep. The next morning, I wake up to the typical hustle, bustle, and blare of New York City. Good thing I'll be in the air soon. I'm not going to think about going up north to the Benedict's cottage just yet. For the next two days, I have a full schedule with lawyers, filling out paperwork, 
and avoiding Chelsea's chilly and irritable gaze. My phone vibrates in my pocket while her lawyer explains the terms of our agreement for private individual adoption. Barrett, bachelor party tonight, woot woot. He sends a bunch of emojis when I don't reply right away. Mrs. Benedict isn't entirely wrong about the maturity level of her offspring. I haven't seen Blakely since the engagement dessert. Have I thought about her? With those green eyes, long, shiny blonde hair, and legs for days, how could I not? When my phone buzzes silently again, I send Barrett a quick answer. Me. How thoughtful. Unfortunately, I can't make it. Have a class. Barrett. Work thing? Me. Something like that. Barrett. I'm talking late night party, like the old days. Surely you can break loose when it's over. Me. I'm getting married tomorrow. Barrett. I know, and I'm your best man. Me. That's up for debate. Barrett. Oh, come on. If it weren't for me, you wouldn't be saying I do to Manhattan's most sought-after fashion celebrity. If only Barrett knew that I have zero interest in celebrities, fashion, or the lifestyle he lives. My ideal evening involves a slight breeze, the soft lapping of a lake, the clicking of frogs, and the sun setting over the mountains in the distance. I might wait for the fireflies to appear, gaze at the stars, or just ponder my thoughts. If I had a companion, we hold hands talk intimately, maybe more. Barrett. I'll be at the dome at 11 and expect to see you there. From across the broad table, Chelsea scrolls on her phone and snickers under her breath, while Henry Hackworth, her lawyer, outlines her rights as the birth mother. Hackworth clears his throat a few times. Miss Arnold, is there something funny about this that I'm missing? She clears her throat. Oh, sorry. It's just this meme that's everywhere. She flashes the screen in Hackworth's direction. He pales and averts his eyes. How unfortunate for that poor woman. I think it's hilarious. Everyone does. It's gone viral. She was on a morning show thinking she was all that when she strutted off the stage not realizing her skirt was tucked into her tights and her butt was hanging out. I am so concerned for my adopted daughter's genetics. Well, let's return our attention to this matter, because the biological father is deceased, and because you're opting to waive all future rights and contact, this is a relatively simple case. Hackworth and my lawyer go on to outline the exchange of custody. I'd like to say that I thought long and hard about being a father, that this was something I've wanted for my entire adult life. Nope. When I learned that I was not the biological father and that Chelsea no longer wanted the baby, I made a snap decision. When I met Olivia, there was no way I could abandon the child. As a pilot, I do my level best to avoid storms. Instruments and radars can detect them from a distance. However, on the rare occasions that I've been surprised, I fly around, above, or under. Ironic how right now I feel like I'm flying directly into one. After I find out what my soon-to-be wife is like, hopefully nothing like Chelsea, I'll decide whether it's safe to introduce the little bundle of joy. I may as well have moved into City Hall, having been here numerous times recently for both my mother's business and the arrangement with Chelsea. I streak from the cab through the rain and up the bird-dropping stained cement steps. Not knowing the protocol for a civil wedding, I'm wearing a gray suit and tie. I picked up a corsage for Blakely because that's what I did for prom. I left the box in the cab, so it's rumpled and droopy from my mad dash. Never having thought much about my wedding day, I have to admit, 
I didn't imagine standing in a hallway alone, except for several strangers. What I assume is a homeless man seeking dry weather, a woman with three kids climbing all over her, a guy that doesn't speak English, and another couple who won't stop talking. Some version of English that contains a lot of slang. I gather they're getting married too. As for the others, they may be here for parking tickets, to make tax payments, or routine affairs, like I was earlier this week, to clear up some discrepancies with PCO Sisters nonprofit status. For my wedding day, I did envision something more romantic, intimate, and personal, maybe in the mountains or by the sea, and surrounded by family and friends. I haven't told my parents about marriage or parenthood. Those are problems for another day. But they did call to discover they'd received an anonymous donation to their cause, pulling them out from under the burden of having to shut down operations. I'm grateful Barrett kept his word. Now it's time for me to hold up my end of the deal. Jumping beans make a mess of my stomach when I think about how I'm about to go through with this and marry my fake wife. I eye the stairs at the end of the long, wood-paneled hallway. I could make a run for it, scrap the plan, and claim I forgot that I had an important commitment in Alaska or Algeria or somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. No sooner do I have this thought than a woman glides up the stairs dressed like a princess. Backlit by the rainy daylight, Blakely glows in a gown embroidered with crystals, on a fitted bodice and with organza flowing elegantly toward the floor. The horns blaring from the busy city street below are like a trumpet call, announcing her grand entrance. My breath catches in my throat. Sweat beads my hairline. I'm the kind of guy who remains cool under pressure. Flying jets in the Air Force, with my eyes closed. Being accused of being a baby daddy, shut it down. Adopting a baby, I didn't think twice about making the honorable choice. Getting married to my college buddy's drama queen sister, that's another potato altogether. Blakely becomes more radiant with each step she takes. In the wide hallway, she practically floats. But as she gets closer, the scowl on her face doesn't match how lovely she looks. Barrett elbows me in the ribs and whispers, You missed a fun party last night. Yeah, because I was learning how to change diapers and sue the crying baby. Parenting 101. He passes me a small velvet box. The old ball and chain. Get ready to say goodbye to your freedom. Aren't you supposed to be encouraging this harebrained plan of yours? Have you met my sister? He titters. My jaw ticks. You're the one who said we'd be perfect together. This morning, after a tantrum because she was retaining water from the salty meal she had last night, the panic about her hair frizzing in the rain, and requiring special transportation because of that monstrosity of a gown? She reminded me of what a diva she is. I'm lucky I moved to the city with Mom before she hit her teens. Then again, I don't think she's ever really grown up. That makes both of you, I mutter. He titters like I'm joking. Barrett's warnings aside, there is no denying Blakely is beautiful. She's not the kind of woman you'd describe as cute or pretty. Gorgeous or striking doesn't quite do it either. She's the embodiment of beauty. Feminine curves, smooth skin, bright eyes, silky hair. She glances over her shoulder as her mother fusses with something on her gown. The slightest tease of a smile appears on her lips. It either says, you're in for it, buddy, or, yeah, I feel it too. There is absolutely nothing remarkable about the hallway in the office of the city clerk. Nothing romantic about the nasal voice that calls out the three-digit number when it's our turn. The chapel isn't a holy place of worship, or a place my parents would approve of for my union. 
However, I feel something when Blakely and I stand in front of the officiant. I close my eyes for one quick moment, and when I open them, the small group joining us, the Benedicts, Barrett and a photographer, blur like I'm looking at them in a funhouse mirror. The surrounding sounds garble. The air takes on a hazy quality. But the world and my life snaps into focus when Blakely's hand presses into mine. It's clammy and shaky. Mine, too. Are you sure you want to do this? I ask her softly. Her hair with the top twisted into an elaborate updo tickles my nose. Are you? She counters. Just keeping my eyes on the horizon. She grips a bouquet of autumn flowers. Yep, keeping my eyes on the future when we can undo this. The ceremony only lasts ten minutes, plus an extra five for photos, mostly of Blakely in her gown. I learn she designed it. Strangely, I can't think about anything other than right now and how beautiful and bratty my new wife is. Chapter 7. Blakely. I wish I could claim my hands and voice are steady as Dean and I exchange I do's. This is not at all how I expected this day to be. Not that I'd been dreaming about it. This gown I'm wearing is just a little something I whipped up after at Fly Guy and I met online. It was like scratching an itch. I just needed to know what it would be like to wear yards and yards of gossamer fabric and twirl in front of a mirror like a princess. I suddenly feel like I'm a teenager again, dreaming big with my best friends about our future husbands. But the insecurities from back then that I carried like baggage drop into my mind. There were my two big feet, two thin hair, how one of my teeth rebelled against the orthodontics I'd endured for two years. It clutters and churns in my mind. I'm not like Cora, Paisley, and Daisy, who'd planned their nuptials down to the tiniest detail. But I did plan for Nana to walk me down the aisle and for my four besties to be here. However, I'm lucky this chapel is big enough to contain me in this dress. The Fab Five, my bridal party, would have processed along to the song Perfect by Ed Sheeran and featuring Beyonce. The only rhymes here belong to the secretary in the other room feverishly typing on her ergonomic keyboard. And I may have researched which caterers were the best at preparing my favorite Caribbean hors d'oeuvres during the cocktail hour. I spent some time there during my modeling days and became slightly addicted to pepper, lime, shrimp, and filuri. Also, my future wedding was slated for the Glenmere, outside the city. I merely booked with them a half dozen years out, just in case, because their calendar fills up fast. One has to be prepared. So maybe I considered a few tiny details. Don't judge. Mila and I were more like the lone wolves content to be independent, and I'm content to remain that way, this arrangement notwithstanding. During high school, we were all about girl power. Now, I'm a lady boss. Well, I was a boss. Key investors pulled their financial backing, discouraged by the accidental display of my assets. I'll take some time to regroup and figure out my next moves later. For now, a shiny gold band slides onto my finger. Dean's dark eyes capture mine. My breath catches at the intensity of his gaze. Warmth floods me, and for the first time in my life, my mind goes quiet. The old baggage and insecurities dissolve in the reflection of Dean's gaze. For one glittering, evanescent moment, I feel whole. The officiant declares, you may now kiss. A playful smile plays on Dean's lips. I crash back to reality. I faint to the right, going in for a hug. My mother hisses like the velociraptor she is. Barrett starts chanting, 
Kiss, kiss, kiss. He says something about Wolfman's reputation in college, but I don't want to hear about it, so I dive-bomb the man, pressing my mouth to his. The photographer snaps away. When we part after the rather forced and tame kiss, Dean's face flashes from sunshine glancing off colorful hills in autumn to panicked uncertainty before settling on cool ease and confidence. In that briefest moment, I'd bet my stake in BB style that I'd glimpsed pure emotion, raw and honest. It was provocative and striking. But there's no time to think about what it could have meant, because it's time for the next happy couple to make a life commitment in this too small space. And how did kissing a veritable stranger make me feel? It wasn't the first time. My mother would faint at that notion. But it wasn't bad. Agreeable. The right amount of pressure. Texture. Intensity. All at once, I feel like the stage lights are back on me. It's as if the flap of my skirt exposes my backside, and the world is laughing, choking off my air supply. I'm married. This is real. Well, real-ish? Dean links his arm in mine as we march out of the room. The geometric lines of the walls tilt. My vision blurs. I've forgotten the mechanics of walking. The others go out ahead of us. Dean tilts his big, bearded face in my direction. Hey, are you okay? Concern laces his voice. I could fib, but my trembling limbs would betray me. This is the first time we've ever been alone. There's an entire city hall worth of people beyond that door. I'd hardly say we're alone. But we will be at the cottage. Low-level panic sets in. Even though I haven't been up to the house in ages, it's home, so that's not the problem. But I can pinpoint what is. My mouth waters slightly. I press my lips shut. No, I'm not about to be sick. That would be the worst kind of icing on this inedible cake of a week. Rather, I, uh, never mind. I don't need to think about how I feel about that kiss. Big, daring, curious, heartfelt. The corners of Dean's lips drop a fraction. Technically, we were alone in the hallway at your penthouse. You spilled something on me. That's not assuring, because that's what set this entire circus in motion. Then we agree on something. That's a start. I tip my chin up, because although I'm tall, he's taller. Dean seems like a sincere person, and after being surrounded by social leeches and wannabes for so many years, that terrifies me. I reinforce my protection mechanisms. I'd say we've gotten off to a rough start, but I'm not overly interested in this arrangement. Can we agree to just go through the motions and then move on? Before he answers, Barrett claps Dean on the back. You're a lucky man. I blink a few times. Dean doesn't look convinced. His cocky confidence slipped after we kissed. I saw it. But what did it mean? My mother and Bernard usher us from City Hall. Softly falling rain dots my shoulders during my brief exiting through the secret back door my mother arranged, so I wouldn't spend day two splattered across social media reels. Strangely, Dean doesn't let go of my hand. I exhale, steady again, and smile, because, like it or not, this is my wedding day, and that kiss send me sideways. Back at the apartment, Mom, Bernard, Barrett, Dean, and I essentially replay the meal from the other night, while she outlines our future and when Dean will meet me at the cottage. All I hear is womp, 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 like the adult voices in the Peanuts cartoon. They may say a thing or two about my maturity, but my mother and brother's collusion in my future is equally questionable. Then again, I went along with it. They should be concerned about the lack of love in Barrett's life. 
I was doing just fine. Thank you. Leon and the others were pleasant enough diversions. From what, though? Well, they're nothing like the massive man seated at the table beside me. I mentioned that he's taller than me, which is a plus because that's hard to come by, being a shade under six feet tall myself. Five other things I notice about Dean. One, he's left-handed. Two, his hands are massive, bigger than the dessert plates. Three, he has a slender scar on his forehead. Four, his eyes are dark and penetrating. I get the sense he doesn't miss a trick. Five, he smells like, like comfort. The autumn woods, the cinnamon spice of apple pie, and man. Pure man. Not cologne or artificial scents like Leon and the others. I inch closer, trying to determine what it is. Deodorant? My mother has been shuttling us through the event and meal. So, unless he has superpowers, we haven't really been out of each other's sight long enough for him to reapply. Could it be fabric softener? Unlikely. He's wearing a custom-tailored suit. It's dry-cleaning or bust for that form-fitting creation. I study the stitching and recognize it as Italian-made. An air-freshener pine tree in his pocket? Nah, that would be weird. Some kind of hippie oil concoction? Not the vibe. He gives me a subtle side-eye and I lean back in my seat, picking at my slice of Genoese cake with strawberries, chocolate, and cream. Dean steals a bite from my plate. This is delicious, Mrs. Benedict. I slap his hand. Hey, no poaching my dessert. You weren't eating it. That's beside the point. Barrett leans back in his chair. And so it begins. From now on, there are two rules. One, no eating off my plate. Two, I ban my brother from all communications related to our marriage. That sounds pretty official. Are you sure you only have two rules, Cupcake? Dean asks. Status pending, sweetie. I fire back, biting into the pet name like it's lethal. Well, it's been lovely. I should be heading out soon, Dean says, setting his napkin on the table. You aren't going to carry your bride over the threshold, Barrett teases. Irritation prickles my skin. My husband and I won't be spending our first night married together. He has a red eye to catch, or fly. I have the rest of the cake to eat. I'm too nervous to digest food in front of him. Why? Ask me later when I'm alone. Dear, why don't you walk Dean out? It's been lovely getting to know you. We trust you'll take good care of our daughter. My mother flashes a pleasant smile, but underneath it oozes with a warning that he'd better make sure I behave. It makes me want to throw something expensive. By take care, do you mean tame? Now, now, let's not get testy, Blakely. My mother is the queen of the patronizing tone. I push up from the chair, nearly knocking it over, because yes, I'm still wearing my gown. Fifteen minutes in the courthouse wasn't long enough in this fabulous confection of lace, gossamer, and glitter. I follow Dean to the hallway and say goodbye. He pauses and turns around slowly. Oh, one thing. Were you smelling me earlier? I tuck my chin back. Smelling you? No, that's weird. Why would I do that? His lips quirk. Just thought I heard you sniffing or something. I was not. I channel my mother and innocently deny it like a lady. Can eyes quirk? His do something that suggests he's on to me? and my hidden heart eyes after that kiss we exchanged. Then what were you doing? he asks. Admiring the stitching on your suit, obviously. Italian made, right? In my expert opinion, that's the best way to go. He dips his head in an affirmative. Good to know. I'll see you soon, 
Blakely Wolfson. Something warm fizzles inside me at the way he said my first name, then my married name. It was soft yet solid, gentle yet possessive. I close the door, and despite my finery, I slide down the back, wondering what I just got myself into and why it makes me feel wobbly need like all I ate all day was a rice cake. The next morning, I leave the city early to beat traffic and to avoid my mother. Truly, I love her, but being in her presence brings out the worst in me. I revert to being an obnoxious teen. I hate it, but can't stop it, like a row of lined-up dominoes. Her ultimatum that I marry and settle down didn't help matters. Shortly out of Manhattan, massive buildings and signs of industry give way to a tree-lined highway. At this hour, there aren't many cars on the road. As the miles pass, I start to feel like I can breathe again. Suddenly, flashing blue lights in the rearview mirror signal for me to pull over. Chapter 8 Blakely The state trooper hovers over my window. Good morning, young lady. A memory of a road trip to Long Island, when the police pulled over a car full of models, cruises into my mind. Sweat pierces my brow as the whirling lights scold me like a slap on the wrist. I think of Dean stealing my cake. Mind telling me the hurry? the officer asks. Numerous excuses come to my lips. I'm tired and don't trust myself with caffeine. It's early, and I wasn't paying attention to the speedometer. Even though I have my license, I'm not the most practiced driver. Not lies, but not as pathetic as the full-blown truth. I'd been alternately replaying the wedding in my mind, trying to understand the way Dean smelled, thinking about visiting Nana and worrying about getting poison ivy. I read the name stitched on his uniform. I'm sorry, Officer Dodd. I got married yesterday and... Before I can finish what sounds like a bride-on-the-run story, the cop calls, Hey, Diaz, come check this out. Officer Diaz's eyes grow with recognition the moment he sees me. It's the fashion designer from hashtag coffee break butt. Can we get our photo with you? I squint. Is this professional? You are speeding, just doing my job. Are selfies included in that description? But I give them my best smile anyway, if that means driving off with just a warning. The next leg of the trip passes painstakingly slow as I keep to the posted limits. But when I cross the state border into New Hampshire, I drop the pedal again. Soon the roads turn familiar. The cool morning air is more invigorating than a cup of coffee. I'm taking a hashtag coffee break, at least for a while. When I reach my hometown, I make the turn on the north side of the lake and bump along a lonely road. Everything looks dark and close, almost eerie with a light layer of fog compared to the vibrant lights of the city that now lays hundreds of miles behind me. The overgrown trees nearly brush the car. After winding around tight turns, I finally pull into the driveway of Four Lakeside Drive. The gravel crunches under the car's tires. I kill the engine and hesitantly open the door to the BMW. This is home, but not like I remember. Foolishly, I pictured the trim yard blooming with late-season perennials the cheerful cottage waving a flag in the light breeze, and Nana popping out at the sound of the approaching car. Instead, it's lonely, neglected. Leaves scratch along the wooden floor of the porch and hide the welcome mat. A crow caws. A spider scurries behind the row of empty flower pots. I reach up for the key hidden on the upper door frame. I wonder when my parents were here last. When they brought Nana to the care home, 
that would have been years ago. Aha! Uh -huh. I let myself in and flick on the lights in the spacious cabin that my grandfather built and my mother, Bernard, paid to have remodeled. Compared to most of the residences in the relatively rural town, it's luxe. But despite my mother's eye for design and the interior decorator's generous budget, dust covers the surfaces. The throw pillows and couch cushions sag, and a steady drip, drip, drip sounds from somewhere in the kitchen. Cobwebs arch across the vaulted ceiling and I shiver. After unloading the car, I take a long shower, letting the city grime wash down the drain of the tiled walk-in. Not that I'm actually dirty, but the crystalline water cascading from the oversized showerhead and the streams coming out in all directions makes me feel cleaner and fresher than I have in ages. It's only after I pull on a pair of designer jeans, simple red high heels, and a white neck v-neck sweater, then go on to the back deck overlooking the sparkling lake, do I realize why I feel so supremely relaxed. My phone hasn't been blowing up with notifications. I've escaped civilization. Sure, this is my hometown, but there's no way anyone knows about hashtag coffee break butt around here. The reception is notoriously bad and there's no Wi-Fi. I'll get back to you about how being disconnected feels in a week or so. I glance up as an airplane flies overhead, most likely destined for somewhere more exotic than the cabin by the lake. Dean, the pilot, lands squarely back in my mind. Guess I can't escape thoughts of him. As if on cue, my phone beeps. Daisy, welcome home. Paisley, wish I was there. Cora, I sent a care package. Check the mail in a few days. Mila, still in Canada, not far. Maybe I'll swing down for a visit, although I don't want to run into Miranda. She includes the red-faced angry emoji. I want to answer their enthusiasm, and I'm happy to be here, but something feels off. My finger hovers over the smiley face to leave in response, when my phone beeps again. My pulse ratchets up a notch. Dean. Hey, it's me, Dean Wolfson. Your brother gave me your number. Want to make sure you got up there safely. Me. Of course I did. This is home. I grew up here. Why do you care whether I got here safely? Did my mother tell you that she thinks I'm incapable of conducting myself like a responsible and self-reliant adult? Dean. No, I'm your husband. Just checking. Sheesh. Me. Where were you flying again? Did you get there safely? Dean. Germany. And yes, all's well. How's the cottage? Me. Ship shape. I leave out the part about the leak in the kitchen and the odd smell coming from the basement. I'll deal with that later. He asks me a few more questions, but I leave to go visit Nana. She wears a slim smile when I enter her room at Whistling Creek Care Home. Her eyes follow me as if she wants to ask a question. I do as instructed by her caretakers to introduce myself and make small talk. But before I realize it, I'm pouring out my heart. I'm so frustrated with mom. Dad left us when I was young and she took on the role of single motherhood like it was her job doing everything except actually getting a job, to figure out a way to support us. She paraded me around the city until an agency took notice and signed me as a model. Barrett mowed lawns, delivered newspapers, and kept up things around the cottage until Mom found a rich guy to marry. Nana nods as if this is news to her and gazes out the window. I promised myself I'd be my own rich man, I figured out how to support myself. The plan was working marvelously until I bared all on TV. Overworked, overtired, and fueled by caffeine, I was a public embarrassment. Now I'm back here at square one, 
except I'm too old to model, too proud to mow lawns and deliver newspapers, and forced into marriage. Nana, I'm very confused about how I feel about this guy. Er, my body is confused. What do I do? Let's have donuts, Nana says. I snort a laugh. Those were always her favorite from the shop in town. I guess that's as good an idea as any, and you're in luck, because I brought some. I spend the next few days unpacking. I had most of my stuff put in storage. Waiting for the cleaning service I presume my mother hired to come. They don't. And visiting Nana. Our time together is bittersweet because, of course, she doesn't remember me. One evening, I walk down to the lake, recalling Barrett, me, and our cousins playing Marco Polo until the sun set over the hills. I sigh and sit on the end of the dock, letting my bare feet dangle over the edge. My toes skim the water. Can I find a balance between feeling youthful and being responsible? A clap of thunder sounds in the distance. In the silence that follows, my thoughts settle. I love working in fashion and design, but took a detour into toxic territory. There has to be a balance. I can take care of myself and run a successful brand. I love my family and will try to make this work, if only to continue my relationship with my grandmother and save the cottage. But at some point, I'll have to talk with my mother and dissolve the marriage. There's no way it can work. But how long do I play along? Do I stay here? Can I work remotely? Is it possible to rebuild BB style? Do I want to? What will I have to give up? Mom may not have worked, but what did she give up to give us the life we have? I think of her and Nana up late in the painting studio, laughing and creating masterpieces in bold colors, velvety shades, and faint pastels that forced the viewer to focus. As another long roll of thunder rumbles in the sky, plump drops of rain fall, dotting the lake. Each possible choice for my future forms concentric rings, possibilities, pros, cons, and various outcomes but no clear choice comes forward. I don't want to end up like my mother. She bears the kind of bitterness a person could drown in. I see longing in her face whenever art history comes up in conversation. It's the fraction of hesitancy whenever Anne commits to yet another item on her social calendar. It's in the tears I've only heard during the lonely nights mom spent without our father which pointed toward dissatisfaction and regret. She'll never admit to any of those things, though. It's also true that although Anne Benedict likes her socialite status, she must miss this too. Modeling and running my own business opened up a window of possibilities, but it's also made me unwilling and unable to settle for a life living someone else's dreams and expectations. The pouring rain saturates me, cools my skin, and drenches my shirt. I get to my feet and whoop at the sky. Show me what you got. I'm ready. My voice echoes across the water. Moments later, by some miracle, the rain lets up. A bird streaks overhead, and I admire nature's splendor. Incredibly welcome after so much time in the city. Then a wet plop lands on my forehead, but I'm not standing under any dripping trees. I tap my hand there, and something sticky and whitish comes away. A thick, gagging feeling rises within me. I didn't mean that I wanted to get pooped on. Hasn't this week already been bad enough? Nope, nope, forget I said that. I rush toward the cottage, trying to dodge puddles. After showering and freshening up, I pull out my phone to find a signal. Holding my device at chest level, I feel like a ghostbuster, trying to detect paranormal activity. Zero bars in my room, the kitchen, bathroom, and living area. A couple of bars appear near the built-in bookshelves, 
and get stronger the higher I go. I bring over a stool and finally get a connection. I send a test text to the Fab Five group. Me. I just got pooped on. How's everyone's day going? Daisy. Welcome to the club. Happens to me weekly. Are you babysitting? Me. No, the offender was a bird. Cora. That's supposed to be good luck. Paisley. Unless it's a terrorizing seagull. She tells us a story about a bird named Thorndike. We chat for a while like we would if we were in person. It feels good to be home. Me. So, ladies, life is different up here than in the city. There's, um, not a lot to do. Daisy. Wait till you have kids. They'll keep you busy. Mila. Where's Wolfman? Me. I don't know. We're married, but it's not like we're married, you know? This arrangement is temporary anyway. He needed the money to help his family. I had to appease her royal, heinous Benedict and keep the cottage. I get four sideways laughing emojis in response. Mila. I remember we used to call your mom that. Me. She hasn't changed. Cora. Clearly. But do you think she may have had good intentions? Me. You sound like Daisy. Daisy. Is that a bad thing? Paisley. I think what Cora means is maybe this guy will be good for you. Arranged marriages happen all the time and work out splendidly. Me. Name an example. It's not like this was a carefully vetted situation. My brother picked him. Have you met Barrett? He's a man-child. The text bubble pulses as I wait for a response. Instead, I get a text from the lumberjack himself. Dean. Hey there, honey bear. Me. Ew. Dean. What? Me. Too sweet. Dean. What am I supposed to be? Salty? Me. I just huffed. Dean. Ah, that's what that turbulence was. Me. Should you be texting and flying? Isn't there a law against that? Dean. I'm at Chipotle. Me. They have those on planes? Dean. No, in Boston. Can I bring you something? Me. What gives? Why are you being so nice? Reaching out? Trying? You got your money. Dean. Uh, because we're married? Me. In theory. He doesn't answer, which is just as well. Life was better when I didn't have a phone signal. Maybe that was a bit much, but I don't intend to become like my mother. I've got a pair of bootstraps and I know how to pull them up. The damp wood on the back deck dries and the sun returns just in time to set, spilling like strawberry milk over the distant hills. When I crawl into bed that night, everything feels right. Yes, I'm a bit bored without the hustle and grind of my regular life. The house is in disrepair after years of neglect, and sadly, Nana doesn't recognize me. But tomorrow is a new day. I'll start cleaning since it doesn't look like Mom is sending a service. I'm going to take a jog along the trails in the woods, do a crossword puzzle, look through the stack of fashion magazines I brought, and maybe at some point I'll head into the studio. My eyes prickle at the thought, so I push it away. Far away. No, the studio will have to wait. I drift to sleep, feeling something like hope. In my dreams, I dance in a sea of nameless faces. The music is too loud and too fast, but I can't stop moving. No matter how hard I try, my feet and legs and arms won't stay still. In the dream, I close my eyes and the music changes, no longer sticking to a rhythm of drum and bass. A tense rumbling grows louder as if coming closer. I start to panic, spinning dizzy circles in the dark vacuum of sleep, then shoot upright in the large bed. The thin camisole I'm wearing sticks to my sweating skin, and my pulse throbs in my ears. 
For a split second, I think I hear something crash outside, but the noises of my dream stick in my mind. Perhaps it was just thunder. I lay back down in the bed, kicking the sheet off and smoothing my hair out of my face. Unable to go back to sleep, I trail through the dark to the kitchen in need of a glass of water. I hear another sound, this time closer, a bang, and then a thumping noise followed by the brushing of leaves. I stiffen. Something might be out there. If I scream, no matter how loud, no one will hear me in the remote cabin. I creep to the door, feeling along the wall in the shadows for the lock to make sure I bolted it earlier. As I'm about to turn it, the door swings open. I jump back, a shriek escaping, but then I slap my hand to my lips and retreat backward in the dark, hoping the intruder can't see me, even though I disclosed my location. Terror makes my skin chill, despite the relatively warm night. I grasp in the darkness for something I can use as a weapon. The silhouette of a figure with cropped brown hair that's growing out, blue jeans, and boots fills the doorway. He wears a wicked grin and says, Hi, brat. I'm home. Chapter 9 Dean Something metal clatters to the floor. I brush my hand against the wall, searching for a light switch, and flick it on. Wearing a camisole and sleep shorts, Blakely brandishes an umbrella at me. Relax, I say, lifting my hands in a sign of peace. I'm not going to hurt you. Put the weapon down. She blinks a few times and then presses her hand to her chest. Her cheeks are the prettiest shade of rose. I didn't recognize you without the beard. What are you doing here? This is my house. Considering I'm your hubby, what's that expression? What's mine is yours? Or in this case, what's yours is mine? Remember your mom said we have to play house. It's late. I've been traveling for days and admittedly feel a little punchy. She squawks a laugh. Not in this instance. In the future, you have to announce yourself. Call, text, send a smoke signal if you have to. But tell me you're coming ahead of time. I did text you three times. I finally got a hold of your brother, and he told me where the hidden key was. Cell reception is lousy here, but you terrified me. You can't just barge in unannounced. Blakely steadies herself on the coat rack by the door. Sorry, honest. I got in yesterday, had to make a few stops, and here I am. When do you leave again? I resist a frown. Logically, it would make sense for our union to be on paper only, but I'm a completionist. I finish what I set out to do. In this case, a marriage. How about you put the umbrella away? If it opens inside, I hear that's bad luck. I already got pooped on by a bird today, and then you showed up. I'd wager that I already used up my bad luck quota for the day. Don't tempt fate. Fair point. Blakely sets the umbrella down and slinks toward the hallway as if self-conscious. I'd be a more gracious hostess, but that's my mom's gig. Make yourself at home. Unfortunately, I'll see you in the morning. She turns on her heel to leave. Sweet dreams, sweetheart. I wouldn't mind some more banter, see more heat rise and bloom in her cheeks, but it's late and I've already had a day. Not so much with bad luck, but getting Olivia situated. For now, she's staying with my parents, and I hired a nanny. It's just temporary until I figure out how to approach the subject of a baby with Blakely. If she doesn't want kids, that'll be the deal breaker. If she does, maybe things between us will work out. I never expected to be a father, not this way, but couldn't give up on that little girl who no one seemed to want. It goes against my better sensibilities, especially with my job, but I'm now in the position where I can create my own schedule. To say my mother is over the moon about Olivia is an understatement. 
She always wanted a big family, and my parents tried after I was born, but I remained an only child. The door down the hall closes. I tow off my boots and remove my shirt, gazing up at the thick wood beams, the state-of-the-art electronics, and the spaciousness amidst the rustic and modern touches in the cottage. The couch looks comfortable enough, and after the long drive and late hour, I don't want to poke around looking for a guest room. The space tastefully combines natural textures such as maple hardwood flooring and river stones surrounding the chimney hearth. I'd hardly call this a cottage, I mutter. You can thank my mother for the modern amenities, a female voice says. It's my turn to startle. We call it the cottage, but with Bernard's money, my mother had the place expanded and remodeled, presumably thinking she'd live here if things didn't work out. Once she got used to a life of luxury, she said she'd never go back. Blakely tosses me a blanket and pillow. I'll make up the bed in Barrett's room tomorrow. I can do it. Good, because I don't know how. My eyebrows pop. You don't know how to make a bed? I'm not the housewife type, if that's what you're expecting. Blakely, I'm not expecting anything other than civility. Your family proposed a situation that I couldn't say no to. I grip the back of my neck with my hand. My life is complicated. Welcome to the club, Angel Bear. As she speaks, her gaze belatedly navigates my chiseled waist and fit chest, tanned from the summer sun. Her brilliant green eyes pause on the tattoos lining my arms. Like two colorful sleeves, words and images hug my back, twisting around my muscles. Her gaze stops on the howling gray wolf emblazoned on my bicep. Your brother's nickname for me was Wolfman. More like Brute. What's with the tattoos? Clearly you're no angel. I grunt. Not always, but I have consistently served my country with loyalty and pride. The other fly guys in my squad and I get a tat for different occasions. Her eyebrow arches. You have a real top gun thing going on, Maverick. I give Blakely a lazy salute and use one of the other names from the movie. Can't deny it, Hollywood. Hollywood? Hardly. I was a model and work in fashion, not to be confused with actresses and celebrities, Goose. She snorts. I'll take the nicknames as a compliment. Now, as much as I want to return the favor and admire the smooth lines of your silhouette, your captivating green eyes, and your bee-stung lips that speak nothing but sass, I'm like a tree just before the lumberjack yells timber. She gasps. Are you insinuating that I was checking you out? Not insinuating the major ogle stinger, I say, using another one of the pilot names from the iconic movie. I'm calling you out. I was not checking you out or ogling. You were staring, Viper, and it's okay. We're married. My lips twitch with mirth. She crosses her arms in front of her chest and pointedly turns her head away from me. I was taking your measurements, force of habit, occupational hazard. Now put on a shirt or a parka. Cover yourself, for goodness sake. A chuckle escapes. I happen to know you don't design men's clothing, but if you do, I'll be first in line for a shirt. She huffs. I might someday. It's not off the table, but I don't really do your style anyway. Oh, and what's that? This whole lumberjack pilot hybrid thing? Is that a runway look? I don't let her answer. And for your information, I always let my beard grow when I'm not flying. Shave it when I head back. Razors are expensive. Sounds like you're lazy. Our wedding kiss comes to mind. It was exceptional and worth marrying for. Keeps my face warm. And the hair? It was shorter before. I got accustomed to wearing it short in the military. It grows inordinately fast. So you're a hairy brute. Jealous? Ha! Huh, not at all, wolfman. She flips her hair, 
and attempts to stomp out of the room, but with those long legs, it's more of a glide. Admiring her, I don't look away until she flips off the light, submerging me in darkness. I saw that you were ogling, she calls. I was admiring. There's a difference, brat. I guess I got my banter after all. As the new day dawns, my growling stomach wakes me. When a tall female shuffles past, yawning, I remember I'm not in the dormitory with the rest of the squadron. I rub the sleep from my eyes, recalling the night before, the day before, everything that led to this strange situation. I check my phone, but don't have any texts or cell service bars. Even though I'm not Olivia's biological dad, the instinct to protect and care is there. The situation is unconventional, but I don't know the first thing about babies, and until I have this situation settled with Blakely, the baby is better off with my parents. Mom couldn't be happier because she always wanted more kids. And grandkids. Even though that wasn't on the table with being married to the military, as she so often said about me. Blakely clangs around in the kitchen. I sit up and stretch. Morning, love muffin. She jumps at the sound of my gravelly voice. Thankfully, the butcher block is on the other counter. There's no telling what she'd do with a knife with the way she wielded the umbrella at me last night. There aren't any muffins, just saltines. But my friend Cora said she's sending a care package. I'm, uh, just going to change. She thumbs the hall. Before you go, is there a good spot for cell service? I scrub my hand down my face, wondering if I'm dreaming, because Blakely is even more beautiful at this early hour, with her bedhead, heavily lidded eyes, and that pale pink camisole displaying her collarbones and curves. I get up and look down at the phone while looking at the service bars. We bump into each other in the space between the couch and the kitchen. She looks up from my bare chest. The sun streaming through the oversized windows kisses her cheeks. Good thing you didn't spill anything on me this time, I say, recalling our first encounter. She swallows hard as if flustered. I was, uh, going to change. And I'm going to make a call. Try over there, by the bookshelf. She turns to go. Again. Oh, and I made coffee. Help yourself. I watch her retreat. Not a bad view. You're ogling, brute. Admiring, I correct. She disappears behind a door. I find a signal and try calling my mother. It doesn't go through, so I send a text and get an update that Olivia is doing great. Of course she is. My mother is the most maternal, caring, and generous woman on the planet. I'm not just saying that because she's my mom. Anne Benedict's intentions may be well-meaning, but my mother is heaven-sent, with the way she mothers women who can't conceive. She's a true angel. I shower and freshen up in the bathroom, then go to the kitchen for coffee. Blakely remains behind the closed door of her bedroom. I fix myself a cup black, take a sip, and then practically spit it out. Just as I'm dumping the pot of the coffee-like product down the drain, Blakely walks in wearing a form-fitting wraparound dress that hits her knees. I do a hot take. That's like a double take, but more discreet. I just made that. It was fresh. It was awful. It tasted like gritty, acidic sand scraped from the bottom of the lake. That's very specific. It was specifically horrendous. Who taught you how to make coffee? Wait, let me guess. You've never made it before. I don't defeat the smirk that appears on my lips. That seems to push her buttons because her pout turns into a snarl. What makes you say that? You said yourself that you don't know how to make a bed. Figures you wouldn't know how to brew coffee. I'm off caffeine for your information, so I couldn't taste it. The story of Blakely's unfortunate moment on the morning show comes to mind. 
Barrett mentioned that she'd been up for a while and pounded an energy drink, causing the moment to get away from her. You made it just for me? How nice of you. I never said I was nice, and I certainly didn't request that you rate my coffee or homemaking skills, or... I never asked, Buttercup, I say, testing out another nickname and attempting to dial down the tension. But what? Her nostrils flare as if I hit a sore spot. Buttercup, I repeat. Her expression flashes from hurt to rage. You're the one who isn't nice to bring that up. I've seen and ignored the chat show incident, so if you're referring to the hashtag coffee break butt meme, drop it. She tucks her head back. I'm the one who's supposed to say that. I have a real problem with the culture of purposefully embarrassing people. Accountability can be effective where it's due, but that incident was clearly an accident, and you did not deserve to be plastered all over television and media. Blakely straightens. How evolved of you. I may be a hairy brute, but I believe in justice, fairness, culpability, and a proper cup of coffee. Here's how you do it. I scoop just the right amount of grounds into the filter. Also, freshly ground beans are much better. You're definitely a brute. And you're a brat. My lips play with a grin, and I indicate she pays attention to how I'm measuring the grounds. Okay, do it your way, coffee snob. She pulls out a sleeve of saltines and sets them on a plate, then pours a cup of water. The machine gurgles as it brews, filling the silence. Kitten, that's no breakfast. Is that a model's meal? With a toss of her hair, she huffs. No, I just haven't been to the market. Do you mean that you don't know how to cook? No comment. I smirk. Good thing you married me. I happen to know my way around the stove, oven, and grill. In the meantime, there has to be a breakfast joint around here. Let's go. I'm fine. This doesn't constitute a balanced breakfast. Do I need to watch out when Wolfman gets hungry? I pitch an eyebrow. I thought it was the coffee maker. Your stomach keeps growling. I said I'm fine, schmooky kooky. My smile grows at her playing along with the pet names, and so does her fervor to defend her saltines and water position. We go back and forth until I hoist her over my shoulder. She kicks and screams, Put me down, brute. I thought I was your schmooky cookie. You're not my anything. I'm your husband, and it's my duty to see to it that you eat properly. It's the hunter alpha male in me. I can gather just fine on my own, thank you. I don't need a hero. I have to admit I like it when she's feisty. Amidst her protests, I deposit her in the truck, strap in her seatbelt, and get in the driver's seat. Dean, you can't just kidnap me. Her lips curl defiantly. I'm taking you to have a proper meal. Now she pouts. Did I ask you to? Do I care? I fire back. Brute, she mutters, and turns toward the window. But I think I do care about this brat. At least a little. Chapter 10. Blakely. As Dean blusters along the dirt road and away from the cottage, the trees shiver as we pass in the truck. Even though it's still relatively warm, the early autumn leaves scatter. A knurled awareness from deep inside groans and nudges, making me feel unsettled and it's not because I'm hungry. Late last night, what I thought was an intruder turned out to be my disheveled husband. The red-rimmed eyes, wind-blown hair, and fuzzy scruff on his face suggested haste. He didn't have to come up here. We could have gotten away with staying apart. As long as I lay low, Mom wouldn't have suspected we weren't actually together. This is what bothers me. Why the effort? Why go the distance? He doesn't owe me anything. In fact, I had plans to sit on the back deck, listen to the birds chirp, 
inhale the fresh mountain air under the deep blue sky, and figure out my next steps. Emphasis on no one around for miles. That's not quite true. Daisy and Nana are nearby, but I didn't want the added complication named Dean Wolfson. That's exactly what this is. Complicated. Because I have feelings, but I just don't know what they mean. Attraction? Appreciation? Affection? No man has ever gone out of their way for me. No one has ever kissed me the way he did on our wedding day. No one has ever slung me over their shoulder like I'm little more than a feather. Sure, I'm a model, but I'm a giantess. I'm a lady boss in charge. Dean just comes in here and sweeps me off my feet. Literally. And I'm not sure how to feel about it. Flattered? Flustered? Flabbergasted? As we leave the cottage behind, I wonder what else from the old me is left in my wake. Because one thing is for sure. Change is afoot. I have many fond memories of rainy days spent reading inside or lazing in the hammock out on the deck or under the sun swimming in the lake. Can I get those back? Have they passed? Dean had to go and ruin my peaceful retreat from the public eye and humanity in general, along with my perfectly acceptable plan to sulk by making the effort to come up to the cottage and making coffee and bring me out to breakfast against my will, for the record. As Dean drives, his broad shoulders hang slightly, like an invisible weight presses down on him. His t-shirt reveals the tattoos lining his arms, all the way up to the snug hem that hugs his muscular biceps. I wonder at the arrangement of the art, who inked him, and the occasions he mentioned. Battles with the enemy? Fallen comrades? Jumping out of planes? I peer out of the corner of my eye at him, which makes me feel like I'm free-falling without a parachute. No net down there either. If you must know, I was ogling him last night and this morning. How could I not check out Dean Wolfson? Yes, the man is a brute, but a very nice-looking one with his Roman nose, chiseled jaw, now that it's partially visible without the full beard, and his lips. They're honest lips. They say whatever he's thinking. They're a paintable, kissable pair of pillows. I sigh, wondering where the heck that notion came from. I don't want to kiss Dean. Again. Not with the way he took command of the situation, planting his mouth on mine like he meant it. I'm used to being the one who takes charge. Nope. Don't want to kiss him again. No way. Ew. Kissing is gross. The strangled sound Dean makes suggests I said that out loud. You all right over there? I said that aloud. I can't blame a caffeine-induced high this time. I snapped too. Pfft, me? Yeah, I meant to say that. Just thinking about, um, the gross display of public affection nowadays and on television. Don't get me started. I mean, keep it at home, right? That was a nasty case of verbal diarrhea, if there ever was one, and I instantly regret nibbling those decades-old saltines. Dean stops at a traffic light, and the corner of his lip twitches. We need to get you a meal, stat. He turns onto the main road of the town I grew up in. So where are we? Lake Winnipesaukee? Surely you knew that. Right but you're from here, right? Give me the lay of the land. He points to a diner on one side of the street with a broken electric sign that only illuminates part of the word DIN, and on the other, the local market. The bulbs at DIN's have been out for 20 years at least. They have free coffee refills, so it's popular with locals. Then DIN's it is. We take a booth by the window. The thick grease in the air forms a film over everything. The vinyl seats and gold-flecked tabletop echo the past. I pick over the menu, sticky from countless jelly-coated fingers. My stomach is on edge. 
hash, sausage, and an assortment of fried foods hold the opposite of appeal. What can I get for you? asks the server, a matronly woman wearing a stained apron. I'll take the hash browns, sausage, and two eggs over easy, please, Dean says. I try not to wrinkle my nose and hesitate, not sure what to get. Um, make that two. Dean, I can't eat like a lumberjack. Sure you can. It'll put some hair on your chest. I don't want hair on my chest. He chuckles. Figure of speech. It'll toughen you up. You seem picky. You're the one who criticized my coffee. That was sludge. This place seems like it makes real food. I snort. We'll see when you're doubled over with indigestion later. Nope. Stomach made of steel. He pats the abs I spied last night. Fine. I was ogling. Practically drooled. It couldn't be helped. A guy like him can't hide and then showcase merchandise like that without some kind of reaction. Well, I have more delicate sensibilities, I say, after I gather my composure. Oh, right, especially since you think kissing is gross. My cheeks shade pink. You caught me mid-train of thought. It was out of context. Sounds like you were speaking your mind. What were you thinking about? I told you, PDA. What prompted it? I force myself to look at anything other than Dean's mouth. Nearly impossible, because he's talking, sipping coffee, and then grins when I don't answer right away. Hmm, I see. So how do you want to handle things? You should know that I'll only be around four days a week. The other three I'll be in Boston or working. What's there? This time, he hesitates. My, uh, family. Huh. What's their business again? My mom founded a non-profit. Dad handles the accounting and such. He bites his lip. Have mercy, please. What's it for? Integrating brutish men like yourself into society? The softness in his eyes suggests I'm as far off the mark as I could get and that it being a non-profit and all, it holds great significance. He grunts. When my mother was pregnant with me, she had gestational diabetes. After I was born, she was diagnosed with PCOS. They tried to conceive again, but due to some complications, she couldn't have any more children. Now she helps raise awareness about the syndrome, as well as counsels women who have it, particularly if they want to have children but are unable. Have you heard of it? My chest tightens. Polycystic ovarian syndrome? Yeah, I've heard of it. I look away, out the window at the life I'll never have. Truth is, I'm one of those women. When the food comes, the server offers Dean a refill and asks me if I'd like a cup. I wave my hands in the air. No, no, I'm off the stuff. I tried to kick the habit once and got headaches. Good for you. When she walks away, I say, gosh, I miss coffee. Then drink it. And risk doing something ridiculous? No thanks. It doesn't have to be one extreme or another. You can have a cup. As in, one cup. Do you want to talk about what happened? I already told you that topic is off limits. Let's set some ground rules, shall we? We're not going to discuss anything personal, controversial, or political. Dean smooths his hand along the regrowth of his beard. Hmm, that leaves us with cars, music, and food. And a whole slew of mundane topics. Music isn't mundane. Neither is food, but you're hardly eating yours. The truth is, I was already on edge. But when he brought up PCOS, skydiving took on a whole new meaning. After we leave the diner, we drive down the street to the market while Dean discusses food. Health food, ethnic food, food groups, foods to avoid, all things food. An open flag blows gently in the wind. A couple of lonely rocking chairs sit vacant on the front porch. And a corkboard advertises events like rummage sales. Home sweet home. Then you like it here? I figured you already missed the city. 
I stop in the entryway because not once has that crossed my mind. Only the Wi-Fi and the non-greasy food. There are plenty of diners in Manhattan. What do you like? Name it. I'll cook it for you. Before I can answer, a woman shrieks and rushes over to me. Blakely, what are you doing here? Miranda's gaze snaps to Dean, whose hand rests on my low back, sending a surge of warmth through me. She makes the sound the Fab Five and I have dubbed the Maven Moan at the sight of him. Who's this? Him? My high-pitched laugh in reply can only be described as soundiculous. I've never seen him before. Sir, please stop touching me. Dean is an immovable object, a boulder, a cement construction, a donkey. In other words, he's stubborn. Why won't he go along with my impromptu plan to pretend we don't know each other? If Miranda finds out we're married, I'll have to fend her off. She has a history of wanting whatever the Fab Five has, particularly guys. Miranda lifts and lowers her eyebrows like she doesn't buy anything I say, not even if I threw in a free bonus, like a pair of designer sunglasses. In my defense, I didn't have time to develop my sales pitch. I should have anticipated seeing people I know and developing a cover story with Dean. What's this on your finger? Miranda wags hers at me. Shame, shame. I think little Miss Blakely here has a secret to spill. By now, the workers and customers in the market are peering at us with interest. I'm not a local celebrity by any stretch, but my modeling career during high school gave me some clout and a certain amount of mystique. No doubt they recognize me here. I wave my hand dismissively. A secret? Pshaw. If by secret you mean this guy I just met outside the market, then yeah. It's hard to keep someone as tall as he is under wraps. We were discussing the benefits and drawbacks of height, me also being a tall person. Miranda fans herself. How tall is he? Six five at least. Gotta love those good boy dimples and the bad boy smile. Blakely, tell me you met this big hunk of a man on my app. I shake my head slowly at her, but also so Dean doesn't say more. Figuratively speaking, Miranda has a long neck and a big mouth. That's saying she's always craning in the direction of scandal and is the town gossip. I can only imagine what she reported back about my life in New York. You'll have to write a review and leave a note in the app shop telling the story about how you met on scroll click date. Wait, Blakely, is this the guy you were messaging with? I'm a matchmaking genius. The woman practically hugs herself at the assumed success. Why won't Miranda close her mouth? I don't want everyone to know I was using a dating app. Nope, really, we just met. No past, no future, just some guy following me into the market. I laugh nervously. She taps me on the arm. You could have a second career as a comic. Despite how serious you can be at times, you keep surprising me, Blakely. I sense Dean's eyes singe me at the lie about us not knowing each other. Snookums, we really need to get you something else to eat. I think the low blood sugar is going to your head. He extends his hand to shake Miranda's. It's then I notice that he's wearing his wedding band. You might consider me Blakely's other half. More like better half, I mutter. My, 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 Blakely, you go from laughingstock to married? When did this happen? Do the girls know? Where was the ceremony and reception? Her beaming smile falls. Wait, did you not invite me? While Miranda fires questions at me, Dean disappears down the aisles, filling his cart. Fortunately, my frenemy hardly lets me get a word in as she gushes over my catch. As Dean approaches after pain, I can't help but see him in a new light. There's no mistaking his outrageously good looks, but there's also his confident manner, the smile that Miranda was right about, 
fluctuating from nice to naughty and kindness under his rough edges, that's not obvious at first. He grips my shoulders and gently tips me into the cart. I let out a little yelp at the playful gesture as he wheels me toward the door. Okay, time to take this one home. Nice meeting you, Miranda. Once outside, he gains steam, and we fly through the parking lot to the truck. He whoops like a ten-year-old. I can't help but tilt my head back and roll with it, letting my laughter flow out of me. His smile is irrepressibly wide, and his eyes are bright when we reach the truck. He holds out a hand to hoist me out of the cart. That was fun, right? You needed to have fun. I have plenty of fun. According to Barrett, you're the boring stiff. He grunts. We load the bags into the truck, and he opens the door for me. Wait here. I'll be right back. The truck faces the back of the parking lot, so I don't see where he goes. But when he gets back, doughy cinnamon and nutmeg fill the cab. I'll forgive you for lying to Miranda if you eat this. He plucks an old-fashioned donut, glistening with cinnamon sugar out of a wax bag. He must have seen the famous donut shop when we drove past earlier. Memories rush at me. I wave it away. I couldn't possibly think of the calories. He digs into the bag and produces a glazed donut. I can't help notice he pinches the side of it like he would an engagement ring. It is rather shiny. My mouth waters. He holds my gaze in his. Come on, you know you want it. Dean may as well be saying that he knows I want him. The thing is, he wouldn't be wrong. Not wanting to take any risks, because I already blurted something about kissing being gross, and because I don't say anything incriminating out loud, I grab the donut out of his hand and devour it. Chapter 11. Dean I am positively tickled by how quickly Blakely eats the glazed donut. She houses the thing and then repeatedly eyes the bag containing the other one. When was the last time you ate a donut? I ask. November 10th, 2014, she says matter-of-fact. Is that an arbitrary date because you're messing with me, or does it have some significance? I ask as we drive back to the cottage. Blakely gazes at her hands. It was the last time my grandmother remembered me. In fits and starts, she gives me sparse details about how she'd spend time with her grandmother, then got wrapped up in her career and neglected to visit. Six months later, her nana received an Alzheimer's diagnosis. At first, she'd usually know who I was. Now I'm a stranger to her. I hate myself for not seeing signs or being there for her more in the beginning, spending more time with her. I didn't realize how bad it would get. I had that whole, it can't happen to her kind of mentality. I nod slowly. But you get to see her now. Her long lashes graze her cheeks, but it's not the same. I imagine not, but she's still there somewhere. She may not recognize you again, but she's still your nana. I draw a deep breath, no stranger to aging family members. Why don't you have that other donut? You can have it. Remember, what's mine is yours. How about we split it? She dips her hand into the bag and breaks the cakey, old-fashioned donut in half and passes it to me. These were Nana's favorite. Is that so? Where is she now? The Whistling Creek Care Facility? It's only about 15 minutes away. I guess my mom thought it would be best Nana stay close to what's familiar. She pauses a beat. Then again, she hasn't visited her in months. I checked the registry. After all that Nana did for us... She raised me when Mom moved to Manhattan with Barrett after she married Bernard. Blakely wrings her hands. I hate the idea of Nana being alone. I mean, she has the caretakers, and they're great, but it just seems so... lonely. I turn this information over in my mind. Family has always been important to me. My parents taught me that. 
The military taught me that. Olivia is now too. And if nothing else, a marriage is a family. And it seems that right now, whether she'd admit it or not, Blakely needs family. I reach over and place my palm in her hand and give a squeeze. I'm not the most talkative guy, and I feel like this gesture says more than words could. Sunlight glances off the passenger side window as Blakely watches the forest bump by on the dusty road back to the cottage. In the reflection, she wears the hint of a smile. Last night, it was late and dark when I arrived, so I was hardly able to see much of the property and cottage. It's about a dozen yards from the lake, with a sweeping and overgrown lawn. The structure itself looks sorely neglected. Winter this far north is unforgiving. After unloading the groceries, I tell Blakely, I'm going to step outside to take stock of this place, check on the gutters, the roof, and other things. Are you a lumberjack and a handyman? My father was a building contractor, so I know my way around foundations, siding, framing, and roofing. I thought you were a city guy, a real fly boy. Fly guy, I correct. I grew up outside Boston, so not outside of the northeastern corridor of severe weather. Well, have a look. Hopefully not too many repairs need to be made before the winter sets in. First, I walk to the shoreline and take a deep breath, letting the last day settle as the water ripples gently over the rocks and sand. The lake is vast and glassy. I make a mental note that donuts and Nana are important to Blakely. Miranda and household tasks are not. From the corner of my eye, I spot a sturdy swing set with a tattered canopy made to look like a fort. It's hard to imagine Barrett and Blakely playing here, but I glimpse a vision of Olivia in a few years, squealing with glee as she slips down the slide. My heart warms, but I'm not sure Blakely is fond of kids. I'm afraid she'll force me to drink her sludge-like coffee, or worse, if I dare bring up the baby topic. After surveying the property and exterior of the house, I explore the shed and garage that houses what looks like an art studio. I also take note of what we'll need to do, clear the overgrown brush, chop down a few trees and split wood, clean the gutters, repair a few loose shingles, and definitely get a new roof at some point. I spot scat and wonder what kinds of critters have taken up residence while the house has been vacant. I linger on the back deck for a moment gazing up at the tall windows and picturing a Christmas tree lit up inside. It's a foolish notion. Probably a waste of my time, but I can't help wondering if we, Blakely and I, could do this, raise a family here. Motion from inside catches my eyes. Blakely sneaks over to the couch, where I left my overnight bag. She glances around, but must not see me against the glare of the sun on the windows. She kicks the boots I'd been wearing and swapped out for sneakers when we went to town. In a crouch with one finger extended, she pokes my leather jacket like it might come to life. Pinching the neckline of one of my t-shirts, she holds it up and then brings it to her nose, inhaling deeply. I step into the doorway and lean against the frame arms crossed. If this were the barracks, I'd be infuriated at the invasion of privacy, but amusement overwhelms me. If you look inside the small front pocket of my rucksack, you'll find a set of keys, a pocket knife, and loose change. She inhales sharply and rocks back on her heels before unsteadily getting to her feet. You startled me. Again. Just what do you expect to find? I ask. I, um, was looking for the receipt for the groceries. I was going to pay you back. Seeing as you planned on living off saltines and maybe a donut or two, consider it a donation. I'm not a charity case. No, you're my wife. I can buy the groceries. And if there's something you want to know, then you can ask me. I mean for my tone to come off gentle, but it's kind of gruff. Maybe it's because my sense of duty is strong. Sheesh, 
Don't bite my head off, brute. No, I'll leave that to your mother. When I commit, I go all in. This arranged marriage is entirely unconventional. But I'm taking it seriously, Blakely. How can you? It's just a scheme cooked up by my family, so you could help out yours and so I'd settle down. Look, I'm settled. No more public outbursts. I'm fine. I agree. You are fine. Your mother overstepped big time. In fact, I'd argue that's not how a family should respond to one of their members during a difficult time. Blakely scratches the back of her calf with the top of her foot and gazes down. I've had more than a few episodes, though none quite as outrageous. They meant well. I can see that, but I want to show you what family really means. She snorts, as if a rash of anger replaced her uncertainty. You think you can do that? Marching in here all high and mighty, all strong and swarthy, Mr. Know-it-all Lumberjack thinks he can teach me what family means? No, I can show you, and we're going to start right now. Do you have laundry that needs doing? I was going to run a load later. Have you ever used a washing machine before? I ask, just to be sure. Of course, you may think I'm a spoiled little rich girl, but... I fold my tattooed arms across my chest. I think nothing of the sort. Rather, you're an intelligent, entrepreneurial, spoiled, beautiful rich girl. You sound like my mother. Then she goes silent as if belatedly realizing I'd called her beautiful. Just telling the truth. You could have told her no, that you didn't want to marry me. You didn't. I already told you about Nana. You have no problem arguing with me. I'm sure you and your mother aren't strangers to drop-down, drag-out fights. You could have caused a fuss. You could have said no. So what exactly are you doing here? Why are we married, Blakely? She straightens up, as if a powerful resolve pumps through her veins. I'm spending the rest of the year here, so I'll become... Self-sufficient? Independent? More self-righteous? I'm pushing her on purpose forcing her to see past the stubborn walls she's built to what's glittering beneath. I don't care what you think of me. It doesn't matter. But yes, all of those things. And not a coffee maker, a washing machine, or you are going to stop me. She proffers a smug grin. A deep well of desire and respect fills up inside me, threatens to overflow. I stalk toward her. She narrows her eyes suspiciously. And if my family is so broken, and it's just you and me, how do you expect to show me what family means? I have no doubt I wear an impish grin. We're going to clean up the yard. She balks. That won't do anything but make me sweaty. Sweat is good for the soul, and working together builds a strong foundation for any relationship. I have a staff of over a hundred employees. I work with plenty of people and can't attest to our working together as the foundation of any kind of relationship other than a superficial small talk water cooler one. Then you're doing something wrong. That's not leadership. You're telling me I run my multi-million dollar company incorrectly? Her expression sharpens with anger. I don't know anything about BB style. I'm just telling you what I know, what I've experienced. In the Air Force, we worked together. There's laundry duty, the latrine team, the house mouse. While individual effort is important, team effort is the proving ground. You're so authoritative. A faint smile crinkles around Blakely's eyes. Does she like me taking charge? Go put on something you don't mind getting dirty, I order. All my clothing is designer and expensive. I have boxes being shipped, and there might be an old Dolce shirt that I could never remove a stain from. But other than that, I don't have anything that fits the bill. Although you just gave me an idea for a household chore style line. She tips her head to the side, thinking, There's no time for you to sew yourself a shirt. Do you have leggings? Yeah. Sneakers? She flips her hair and then crosses her arms as if to say, duh. I toss her the shirt of mine she sniffed when she didn't think I was looking. 
the top of my lip curls as I belatedly wonder why. I discreetly give myself a B.O. check, but don't smell bad. Wear this and meet me outside in five minutes. Your shirt? I don't mind if it gets dirty. What's in it for me? A donut. And me. She laughs and stands at attention. Yes, sir. I tuck my head back, surprised at her change in demeanor, her sudden willingness. Do I just need to use my platoon sergeant voice to get you to do things? No, you just need to bribe me with donuts. This and this alone tells me we're already making progress. I find a container of fuel in the garage and do a quick safety check of the riding lawnmower. Seems good to go. I also pull out yard tools and eye a chainsaw that needs sharpening. My body heats up when Blakely struts out of the house wearing denim shorts, my t-shirt, and her hair in a ponytail. If she made an appearance looking like that at my old barracks, she'd have to use special weapons training to fend off the guys. Not that they'd disrespect her, but there would be so many of them flocking to her side. Blakely Wolfson is nothing short of a knockout, and I'm happy to say she's all mine. Chapter 12. Blakely Summer clings to this northern latitude even though it's officially fall. As a kid, I'd spend every second I could outdoors before the colder weather set in. But that didn't include the labor Dean has planned to show me what family means. In my experience, it means division, dysfunction, and a grandmother I miss terribly. Does he want to show me the meaning of hard work? I know a thing or two about that as well. It doesn't involve family. Maybe Bernard in the beginning, when he made some good investments. But unlike other people who do work for every silver cent they have, my mother and brother do not. Does Dean think he can prove differently? Challenge accepted, buddy. After a quick tutorial, my hashtag coffee break butt sits in the driver's seat of the lawn tractor. I am a woman of the land, powerful, capable. This isn't a disaster waiting to happen. Nope. No chance of me driving into the lake, crashing into the evergreens that border the thin strip of grass next to the driveway, or somehow making a fool of myself. At least I'm wearing shorts instead of a dangerous vinyl dress. Learned my lesson. The shorts are purposefully ripped and distressed in a tough girl way and cost a fortune, but I'm sacrificing them to prove to Dean that I'm not fussy, fancy, or spoiled. I'm also 10 days into caffeine deprivation. I'm not twitchy, not me. As easy as the breeze, which does nothing to cool the sweat beating along my hairline, as I drive the lawnmower around the sweeping lawn leading to the lake. Dean clears brush around the edges of the property. When I start on the side yard, He's got his shirt off and rakes up the leaves. He told me the trick is to stay on top of them rather than trying to rake them all at once. No, the trick is not to crane my neck every time I drive past, feasting my eyes on those muscly bits that Dean usually hides under his shirts. A crime against humanity, if you ask me. His well-built silhouette, when he emerges from the garage to grab another garden tool, is enough to distract me from the fact that I have not set foot in the painting studio since arriving. Oh, and the whole thing about bribing me with a donut and him? Ha! I'm not bought off that easily. No, 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 my friends. Being a lawn boss comes down to my quietly competitive nature. Hence my title as a lady mogul by my employees and admirers. I don't need to tell my opponents to watch out because I'm coming in hot and will knock them from the top. I just do it. No announcement, fanfare, or posturing necessary. I don't accept anything other than perfection from others and myself. Another designer launches a line similar to mine. We up our advertising. 
influencer reach, and getting as many garments as possible on humans with clout. Our bottom line looks a little wobbly. We create pop-up events and sell our inventory. A new brand gets touted as the latest and greatest. I remind everyone who's been around longer and will still be when the fad passes. So Dean thinks he can woo me with his biceps, triceps, and donuts? I'm in it to win, and I'll be the last woman standing. Thing is, he won't even know what hit him. That being me. Well, not him, but I swerve too close for comfort. When my ankle hits a lever on the mower and suddenly it doubles in speed. My pulse picks up and I feel out of control as I move herky-jerky across the lawn, making another rough pass. Watch out, I holler, as I hurtle past on the mower. He leaps out of the way and shouts, What are you doing? Mowing, obviously. I take my hand off the wheel and make a yahoo, yeehaw, lasso motion in the air. Dean cups his hands around his mouth, then shouts, You're going too fast. I said third gear tops and to stay turtle mode. I wanted to get it done faster. This is not true, but I'm not about to admit that. Aside from the profusion of sweat, pondering life while I cut neat lines in the grass was rather pleasant and satisfying. Blakely, shift the lever back down. By now, Dean is hopping around the yard, trying to keep up with me while staying out of the way of the machine, which I've now lost control of. I think the thing is stuck in rabbit mode, I shout as I make another pass. Turn the key, turn it off, he hollers over the roar of the motor. I scramble to find the ignition as the mower lurches at the same time a bug flies into my left eye. I blink and liquid streams down my cheek as I fumble blindly with the controls. The machine turns sluggish. Then it abruptly goes completely still. I careen forward, and like a bucking bronco, I'm ejected off the lawnmower. Dean hurries over, hollering at me while at the same time asking if I'm all right. I cover my eye with my palm and force away tears at the way my body aches, From where the ground rose up and bit me, I refuse to show weakness. His big, calloused wolf paws grip my upper arms as he surveys me from head to foot, presumably assessing for damage. My skin warms all over, and it's not from a rush of adrenaline or the sun. It's because, instead of pity, I'm surprised to see softness move in his eyes. Care a kind of attention I never really got from my mom, who shuttled me from agency to go-sees to fashion shows. It reminds me of the way Nana doted on me before she forgot who I am. Maybe before I forgot who I am. Dean pinches my chin and looks into my eyes. You didn't hit your head, did you? Are you hurt? No, I'm fine. I swallow back emotion. He tucks a piece of hair that came loose from my ponytail behind my ear. My gaze doesn't know whether to settle on his lips or his eyes. They're both works of art. He could be a sculpture, a study in the male form. My breath doesn't know whether to move in or out. It sticks between my stubborn aversion to an arranged marriage and the possibility that I don't hate my fake husband. The way he makes me feel cared for, adored, and like I'm the only girl in the room can't possibly be real, can it? A growly grunt issues from his chest. Do I take that to mean he thinks that I'm hopelessly incapable of performing meaningful work or relief that he's not going to have to call my mother and explain the lawnmower accident? Dean checks a few things on the machine and refills the gas tank which I presume caused it to stop abruptly. Okay, get back on and stay in turtle mode. Got it? Funny thing, that is exactly what I needed to hear. It's a better option than handling me like I'm porcelain and relegating me to the porch. Maybe he's starting to understand a woman like me. 
First, I go get a pair of sunglasses so I don't get another bug in my eye. While inside, three things log jam in my mind at once. One, I thought Dean and I were opposites in every way. Lumberjack and fashion maven. Crude table manners and a respectable member of the upper class. Mr. Boring and Mrs. Fiesta. Turns out he gets me, or at least this aspect of me. Two, I've met my match. I'm used to telling people what to do, being in charge. For once, it's a relief to follow orders from someone who knows what he's doing. For the record, Anne Benedict does not. Three, nothing in my recent life tops watching from behind my shades, as Dean Wolfson does yard work, shirtless. I'm guessing he uses some tactic of his military training because, for the next few days, we work on the yard from the outside in. We started on the periphery of the property and move ever closer to the house. I also wonder if this strategy helps us get to know one another without working side by side right away. If so, I'm on to you, Mr. Flyboy. Er, guy. He's all guy. All man. All brute strength, chopping down trees and moving logs into a pile to split for winter. The way his muscles glisten with sweat in the sun is nothing short of a feast for the eyes. And don't get me started with the way Dean smells. It's that cinnamon spice scent mixed with man. There's no trace of body odor whatsoever, like when my brother went through puberty. If I could identify the smell, I'd scrap the fashion enterprise and bottle it. On Sunday afternoon, the rhythmic splitting of wood goes abruptly quiet. It was helping me keep pace while clearing out my grandmother's garden beds. I plan on visiting her tomorrow with an update on what we've done to the place. Dean's voice rises and falls. I peer up from where I'm on hands and knees, pulling weeds from around the place where Nana would plant her beloved vegetables and tend to her herbs. He comes around the corner, scowling like he's ready to blow something up. Everything okay? Yeah, cockroach problem back home. I raise my eyebrows, a little nervous at the sight of fuming, angry Dean. They must be extremely persistent if they're making you this upset. A friend of mine swears by an essential oil concoction. I could ask her for it. His phone beeps with a text, and he sneers while he stabs the buttons in reply. Or you could get in your fighter jet or whatever you fly and bomb the place. Evacuate the civilians first, obviously. That's an idea. At my joke, his lips go from frown to straight line, which is an improvement in the direction of a smile. I'll see what the guys in my platoon think. His tone could slay a dragon. I was joking. I don't advocate violence against cockroaches. I was too, but I'm going to violently grill us a steak dinner because I'll be heading out of town tomorrow for a little while. Work stuff? Family. Something inside me deflates slightly. Because I thought all this work together was for us to become more like a family. As I watch Dean stomp toward the cottage, I tear off my gardening gloves. It's not in reaction to how his absence and dismissal carve something out inside. No way. I'm not attached to him or expecting anything. If he's not working, I'm not either. I go inside and get a can of fruity, sparkling water and try to distract myself with one of the thick, glossy books on interior decorating my mother had artfully displayed on the coffee table. The cold liquid sends a dozen carbonated thoughts racing through my mind. What will I do without Dean here? What's my company going to look like now that things have changed? Can I come back from my fall from grace? How much is Wi-Fi here? Is Nana okay? Then I have the unusual and deep thought that everything my mom created is artifice. An outward display of perfection and an ideal she quested to obtain. I'm no exception. Tall, blonde, a model. 
but with dirt under my nails despite the gloves I've been wearing. I'm wondering if there's more to me than I've let myself believe. I also wonder what role Dean plays in this and if he's part of my future. The late day sun beams down as I step outside, slowing down my thoughts and they relax, drift and settle like silt as I gaze at Dean flipping the steak on the grill. As gruff and unlikely as he is, I'd like him to be part of my life, at least for now. His dark eyes are the exact color of an exotic spice I can't recall the name of, but had to throw toward the camera during a shoot in Morocco. His hair, his pilot status, the motorcycle he's told me about, and his voice are as all-American as they come. But there's also something about him that feels just out of reach, mysterious and off-limits. I want it. Chapter 13. Dean. The text I got from Chelsea yesterday, requesting money to pay for her various postpartum requirements, raises my hackles. The lawyers negotiated a generous sum for the adoption. I paid for all of her medical bills, as well as the follow-up appointments with her doctor. She claims she needs new clothes because she doesn't fit into her old ones after being pregnant, and asked me to pay for her rent because she had to move. What does that have to do with the baby? If I were actually a wolfman, I'd growl right now. I'm going to New York tomorrow to meet with the lawyers and hash this out once and for all. But for now, I want to enjoy playing house with Blakely. If I squint my eyes, I can envision our lives together here, but I'm still not sure if she wants children or a family in the traditional sense. A shadow crosses the window behind me, and Blakely comes out of the house carrying a bowl with potato salad and a container of pickles. Her smile borders amusement. Her lips say so much. There's her bratty smile, the lopsided devious one. Her playful smirk gets me every time, the cute grin that makes me want to kiss her. Then she has a tight, I'm going to punch you smile. There are shades of happy, excited, and pleased smiles. She has her model smile, smug smile, and lady boss smile. My favorite is the smile I've noticed she only gives me. I call it the brute smile, but there's nothing brutish or brutal about it. More like sweet, soft, and flirty, making my chest thunder. Looks good, I say, eyeing the potato salad, one of my favorite barbecue side dishes. Did you make it? Um, yeah. Smells good out here. Great timing. I'm taking this off the grill in a minute. Even though the deck is spacious, we do an awkward dance of me reaching for the platter on the outdoor table and her setting the bowl of potato salad down. My pulse quickens at her proximity. If I'm not mistaken, something has shifted between us. Instead of being adversaries, we're now playing on the same team. Her lawnmower accident notwithstanding, I think working together helped. But the shift also brought a certain primal awareness of each other, especially with all the sweat and grit of the last days. The primitive part of my brain works it out in simple terms. She woman, me man, we married. Blakely grabs silverware and napkins. I pull the steak, onions, and peppers off the grill. The scent makes me want to cling to summer. The sight of her with her hair loose over her shoulders and having changed into a sundress with thin straps and a light sweater makes me want to cling to her. We sit down with our dinner at the outdoor table on the patio. She adjusts her plate. Looks good. My specialty, I say. Thanks for cooking. It's like we each received a memo, reminding us that we don't really know each other. Her family made the marriage arrangement, and this forced proximity is crossing up our wiring. 
are we supposed to love each other or hate each other? I cannot ignore how the golden hour sun brightens Blakely's green eyes, how her shoulders are forever pressed back with perfect posture, highlighting her collarbones, and how she moves so elegantly, even when tearing into a steak. Because, dang, the woman can put away a steak. At the Benedict's, she picked at the green beans on her plate. At the diner, she hardly touched her meal. But conscript her into a couple of days of hard labor, and the woman has a healthy appetite. Which I appreciate, because I despise food waste and appreciate a home-cooked meal. After a few minutes of us eating in silence, she leans back and says, Gosh, I didn't realize how hungry I was. This potato salad is the best I've ever had, and that's saying something because it's my mother's summer specialty. Blakely bites her lip. What do they think about our arrangement? I wipe my mouth with my napkin and lean back in my chair. They think I met a beautiful woman, fell in love, and that you're a huge fan of Star Trek. Her brow pinches. Uh, I'm not. I've never even seen the show. Well, I arranged for us all to meet up in Manhattan at the annual Trekkie convention. Don't worry, I'll get you a costume. Her eyes bug out. A what? Yeah, we all get into character, speak Klingon, and reenact our favorite episodes. I gulp back laughter. We can't build our relationship on a foundation of lies. I tip my head from side to side. Their only requirement for marriage is that my wife likes Star Trek as much as they do. If you don't, you won't fit into the Wolfson pack. Dean, that's not okay. I can't pretend to know anything about the show. I take a sip of my sparkling water. I'll quiz you. It'll be fine. She blinks rapidly. We can't go through with that. I'm a model, not an actress. They'd be on to me in a minute. You have to tell them the truth. I can't hold my laughter in any longer. I'm joking. Mom and Dad's only requirement for marriage is that I'm happy and we love each other. They'd like grandkids, but that's not up to them. She throws her napkin at me and then lets out shaky laughter. You had me going. I lift my can of sparkling water. To us, may we live long and prosper. We clink. But seriously, they can't wait to meet you, and everything else I said is true. This is new. My lady boss wears a nervous smile. That's a really big step. I'm not sure I'm ready. I mean, I wouldn't want to disappoint them. You couldn't possibly. Seriously, they'll love you. That's not the response I generally get when I meet mom and dad. She fiddles with the hem of her napkin. Have you been serious with anyone in the past and met the parents? I risk asking. She shrugs. Not really. More like in passing. Nothing serious. You've already met my parents. The real litmus test is meeting the Fab Five. She goes on in detail to describe each of her friends from the forever marriage match dare. Daisy is the one who still lives here. She has a baby. This piques my interest and gives me the perfect seg to test the waters about whether Blakely wants children. But how do I phrase it without scaring her into the woods? Does Daisy plan on having more kids? Does she want a big family? I don't know. In fact, she never told us who the father is, which is concerning because we're all so close. We know everything about each other. I worry about her being alone but she's strong. I sense more of a story there, but it's none of my business. Good thing you're nearby now. Maybe you can help her out. Blakely seems to shrink in her chair. I don't know if I can. She glances toward the lake, and if I'm not mistaken, her eyes are just as glassy as its surface. I'm sure she'd appreciate your company, help with laundry or a nap while you sit with the baby. She rapidly shakes her head and then moves to the hammock on the other side of the patio. Whatever the story is there, 
at least as far as Blakely is concerned. As her husband, it is my business. I clean up dinner and then pull a chair up next to the hammock. I settle into the peaceful stillness of the evening with the faint hum of crickets and frogs chirping. Otherwise, it's quiet until Blakely sniffles as if she's been crying. Whatever it is, I want to make it better. The hammock sways slowly as the sun dips toward the lake. I lean my head against the back of the Adirondack chair. She glides toward me, her face just inches from mine. Splotches from crying stain her cheeks. She gazes at my lips as if waiting for me to say something. The hammock sways, carrying her away. When she returns, I ask, Do you want to talk about it? I saw you come out of the studio the other day, she says. Was looking for a cell signal. Didn't find one. My grandmother used to paint. Me too. Did you stop? She tucks her chin with a nod. Same day I found out I can never have children. I do want to meet your mother, because the thing is, I have PCOS, the kind that interferes with my fertility. My throat thickens. I've never been particularly close to my parents' work, but I've heard enough stories over the years to be aware of the depth of pain this can bring women. I doubled down on work and built my fashion empire, so I wouldn't leave myself even a second of free time to think about it, but I do. Every time I see babies, when Daisy had her baby, when we got married, that's why this can't last, Dean. I can't give you the family you want. She rocks toward me in the hammock. I'd like to scoop her into my arms, but given the unsteady nature of a hammock, I wouldn't want to miscalculate my movement and send her spinning onto the deck. Before you found out, did you want children? Conflict ripples across her features. If I was maternal like Nana, then yes. If I turned out to be like my mother, no. I believe you could be any kind of mom you'd like to be. Dean, have you met me? They say humans are composed of 90% water. I'm made of 100% selfishness. I'd wager that you're made of 50% water, 30% talent, beauty, and intelligence, and about 10% potato salad. I eye the lake. I was able to shift us from teenagers on a first date awkwardness to good humor by making up the Star Trek marriage requirement. I'm confident I can shift her mood now. She almost laughs. Well, it was really good potato salad. I'll have to get the recipe to give my mother. Blakely tosses her hair like she doesn't want me to win this particular argument so she can prove how self-centered she is. And what about the other 10%? Perfection. We're a breath apart, close enough that I could touch her lips. I shut my eyes, imagining our mouths meeting. I want to kiss her and promise her that it's okay that she can't conceive but the hammock glides away. Instead, I get to my feet and hold out my hand for her to take. Where are you going? She asks. I thumb over my shoulder. Way for September to end with a heat wave. Good thing there's a lake right over there to cool off in. With that, I throw caution to the wind, scoop her up and run headlong toward the water. Unlike when I carried Blakely over my shoulder to the truck, like a sack of flour, she doesn't shriek or protest. It's almost as if she welcomes the security of my arms around her. When we get to the end of the dock, I reluctantly set her down. I shed my t-shirt, kick off my shoes, leaving me in my shorts. Then, without preamble, I dive in. When I surface, Blakely stares at me with an astonished smile. It's not that I don't want her to think about babies or her inability to conceive, but I do want her to know that it's not a deal breaker. I'm not sure she'd accept Olivia, but there are other ways to make a family. I have to show her that we can still have a life together. My whoop echoes over the water. Come on in. I have something to tell you. Tell me from there. Nope, 
Top secret. You have to get in if you want to know. She glances back at the house, and then at me, as if deciding whether to stay or go. Is it that your family are actually Renaissance Fair diehards? Because, if so, I can probably help them out with costumes. That sounds like a strange kind of fun, but no, it's about us. She bites her lip, and then, as if ignoring her grip on being cultured and self-controlled, she jumps in, wild and free. I let out a loud whistle. When she rises up, she whips her head back, sending a shower of water droplets over the both of us. She giggles and her cheeks are flushed. Feels good. Ripples form circles and spread out from where we tread water, reminding me of the rings we both wear. Despite the unconventional way we entered into this union, I start, I want you to know that you can tell me anything. Thanks, by the way, for sharing what you did about your fertility. For the record, not being able to conceive the conventional way isn't a deal-breaker. Not at all. If you think about it, we didn't get married the conventional way either. I can't read the emotion that flickers across Blakely's face. So I take her hand and move a few feet toward the shore where I can stand. Then I draw Blakely into my arms, pulling her close. Her skin is impossibly smooth against mine. I hold her green-eyed gaze steadily, but instead of letting them ask the question, I say, Blakely, can I kiss you? I thought you'd never ask. Her breath is whisper-soft. I caress her jawline. Then, as the space between us closes, my breath catches. The minute our mouths meet, I don't need oxygen. This kiss and it alone could sustain me. I don't need air, or food, or water. I have Blakely. She grips me hard and returns the kiss like she means it, like the meal we ate earlier did nothing to satisfy her hunger. Our first kiss at the chapel after we said our vows was restrained, comparatively speaking. I sense this all-consuming desire has been building between us for days. It's as if jumping into the lake freed us from the last hesitations and constraints we had. The world around us stops, and I'm convinced the only thing that could make it spin again is the power of this kiss. It electrifies and grounds, illuminates us both like the power of the sun and moon combined. Blakely's hands run up and down my back as she tries to pull me closer, but it's not possible. Even though we're in the lake, I don't think even a drop of water separates us now. My entire body hums for this woman, my wife. I crave more of her. I want you, I whisper, between nibbles on her lips. I want us. What's between us is no longer an arrangement made by her family and my interest in bailing mine out. This is ours. The kiss deepens as the sun sets. Our mouths move fluidly together, as if we've done this countless times, as if we were made for this, for each other. I want this moment to last forever. We don't part until the stars appear, painting the sky with sequins. Words don't need to be said, but the awkwardness between us before dinner vanished, replaced by comfort in each other's presence. Floating there for a few minutes, Blakely looks over at me and says, Kissing you is so not gross. Our shared laughter echoes across the water. If I had to guess, she's been thinking about doing that with me again for a little while now. That makes two of us. We walk hand in hand back to the cottage, and for the first time in a long time, I feel like I'm exactly where I belong, grounded, no longer obsessed with a desire to fly away. She goes into the bathroom to get us towels. I'll take our clothes down to the washer in the basement, I offer. She gives me the laundry basket, and I add my sopping wet shorts to the pile after changing. I haven't been downstairs yet, but a peculiar smell meets my nose. My father, a culinary enthusiast, and who I have to thank for my ability to cook, 
would describe it as an earthy umami scent. When I flip on the light at the bottom of the stairs, I call, Blakely, I think we have a problem. Chapter 14 Blakely Buoyant from the kiss, I hardly register the concern in Dean's voice when he calls to me from the basement. While I freshen up in the bathroom, there's no denying the delightful flush in my cheeks. I have sleepy kitten eyes like I've had my belly rubbed for an hour, or just kissed the most handsome guy I've ever laid eyes on. I swear he gets better by the day. It's so not fair. In addition to his masculine scent, if I could bottle the way he makes me feel when I look at him, it'd be love potion material for sure. I'd make a fortune. I smooth my hair, swab on some lip gloss, and hurry after the sound of Dean's voice. He fills the space at the foot of the stairs. You said there's a problem? I secretly hope he doesn't know how to use the washer and dryer either. He's so good at all the things, I'd like for us to be even for once. He points to the main room of the basement. It's carpeted, but not fully finished off. Barrett and I used to play down here, I say, peering over his shoulder and still standing on the lower step. Did you play mushroom farmers? Because it seems you have a crop growing down here. My stomach turns queasy at what was once a cozy playroom. What may as well be thousands of wrinkly brown mushrooms curling into each other like flaccid lasagna noodles cover the carpet. There are enough for a commercial harvest at least. I take it this wasn't intentional. I almost gag. I haven't been down here since I've been back. You must be amassing quite the laundry pile. Now is not the time to discuss my housekeeping abilities. How did this happen? What do we do? I imagine there was a leak somewhere. As for what we can do, there are companies that will remove the mushrooms and likely mold, dry it out and clean it up. The good news is the washer and dryer are not across this mushroom field. We walk carefully along the slim layer of flooring not impacted by the mushrooms, toward a door on the left. Water damage stains the walls, and I can't help wonder how long the repairs will take or how much it'll cost. Nana's old washer and dryer were loud, so she had it closed off from the play area. Looks like it was spared. I'm guessing that's what's called a wet wall over there. He thumbs behind us. I'll talk to my dad and see if he has any suggestions. Otherwise, we'll get it figured out tomorrow. Dean flips a switch behind the washer, between a hose and a valve. As he moves, I can't help but think about his chiseled muscles, toned abs, or how capable he is. The guy can do anything, including getting me to fall for him. No, never mind fall. I crash landed, right into his lips. When he turns around, catching my kitten eyes fixated on him, he says, Caught you ogling me again. You wish. I do wish. With a quirk of the lips, he steps into the hallway. What's down there? He pulls open another door and turns on the light. The wooden frames of the bunk beds stand empty the mattresses removed. Another spare room? My brother and I used to stay down here until Mom remodeled and built the addition. And you call this place a cottage? More like a mushroom farm, but yeah. We move to the stairs, and he tugs on the hem of my shirt. I turn around, and we're eye to eye. He's just a few inches away. Even though the lake dropped my core temperature, Heat radiates between us. We let it build and build until a scratching sound comes from upstairs. I startle. Since coming up here, to say I've been jumpy is an understatement. Living in the city, I got used to the urban noises. Country sounds remind me that I'm on my own, especially since Dean is leaving in the morning. 
but I've staked my flag. I'm committed to staying through the holidays or until I get my life figured out, whichever comes first. And maybe I'm committed to giving this relationship a try, at least for now. Knowing that Dean is leaving, I get up early, determined to send him off with a full stomach and a keen desire to come back. It's one thing to be up here with him, a very nice thing, I might add. It's another to be alone. I pull out a package of pancake mix that we picked up at the market and follow the directions as I measure and mix. There's no chance I can mess this up. Although I do make a bit of a mess, dripping egg and oil all over the counter and getting a little carried away with the spoon, sending the dry ingredients down the front of my shirt. I warm up Nana's old griddle, feeling confident and caring, not selfish at all. I've never told a guy that I can't have children, not that it ever came up in conversation, but it was a big deal and one that made me feel more vulnerable than I ever have. With all his talk about the importance of family, I didn't expect the embrace or kiss that came after my confession. The thing is, I'm as clucky as they come. Put me within a mile of an infant, and I'm overcome with maternal desire. That's why I hardly visit Daisy. Yes, it's selfish. I'm a terrible friend, but I can't bear the vacancy. How I'll never be a mother? It eats away at me, leaving me empty and feeling like I'm inept. I'm good at pushing my whore motions away and return to my task, making the best darn pancakes I can for my husband. I even pull out the container of blueberries, which immediately scatter onto the ground when I try to open the plastic clamshell container. Dean inhales deeply as he enters the kitchen and then drops to his knees to help me clean up. I wasn't going to cry, but emotion overwhelms me. Maybe it's hormones. Yeah, I'll blame it on that. My body wants to have babies with the guy I married, but I can't. I'll have to reconcile that after he leaves. I made breakfast, but ruined it. I'm a second away from sobbing, then I realize it's probably PMS. Dean wears his good boy, non-brute smile this morning. This may be an unpopular opinion, but I don't like blueberries in my pancakes. Oh, in that case, I don't feel so bad. What do you like on them? Maple syrup, peanut butter, and bacon. Seriously? Scout's honor. Actually, it started when I took my first Cub Scouts camping trip. The Cub Master made it, and I haven't looked back. I'll cook us up some bacon. No, no, I can do it. Sit your pretty little backside down and enjoy a cup of coffee. You made coffee? I cock a hip. You sound surprised. No, I'm worried. Ha! Huh. I'm of the mind that I'll fake it until I make it. In this case, breakfast. I fry up the bacon, ignoring the rolling feeling in my stomach at the possibility that I'll screw this up. I texted my father this morning. He recommended a mold remediation company. I'll call them when I get on the road and schedule a visit. We really should get a landline. Who even has landlines anymore? I ask, warming the syrup. Grandparents. They're called grand lines. Har har, I think I'll have to start getting up early and drinking coffee again in order to find that funny. That's a dad joke, in case you were wondering. My parents still have a landline. My throat squeezes, and the corners of my eyes pinch at the reminder that I can never make Dean a father. I plate us up a stack of pancakes, put the bacon on a paper towel, and bring over a jar of peanut butter. Okay, Chef Wolfson, show me how it's done. He spreads the peanut butter over the warm pancakes and then crumbles the bacon and sprinkles it on top. I copy him, and then we clink forks before digging in. He chews for a long time. I do too, but it's not because of the peanut butter, which is all melty and soft. Dean takes a long sip of coffee. 
Did you follow the recipe? I nod, my mouth still full of what feels like doughy paste. I try to play it off like this is how I normally chew. Did you use the measurements for one serving, or... It's then I realize I got the table on the batter box mixed up. I may have used the 12 servings for the dry ingredients and the 4 servings for the wet. The coffee is great, but these taste like hubcaps. He's not wrong. I was thinking more like hockey pucks. I nibble on the bacon. A smirk lights up Dean's lips as he eats them anyway. Do you think you'll be able to stay out of trouble until I get back? His dark eyes trace my features. My heart races as if I just downed a double shot of espresso, leaving me feeling breathless. Depends on what you mean by trouble, I say. Don't attempt to make anything involving the oven or stove. He chuckles. I don't think your strengths lie in the kitchen. What? Just because I made bad coffee that one time and pancakes this time? He gets up from the table and pulls me into a bear hug, closing me in a cinnamon man envelope. Good thing I swiped one of his shirts to sniff while he's away. I move in for a kiss, intending to make him want to come back for more. Our lips collide, but before the kiss deepens, his lips brush along my jaw to my neck, lingering there long enough to cause butterflies to scatter in my belly. He dabs a kiss on each of my collarbones and then leaves a little breadcrumb trail to my ear. Dean whispers, I want to leave you waiting and wanting more. His eyes shine like an invitation for us, for our future. I could wade into their depths and get lost there. I hope to. With that, he saunters out the door. I clean up the kitchen, trying to remember how Nana kept everything so tidy. She was so capable. I wish I could ask her how to do basic things, run the dishwasher and the garbage disposal, without making it sound like it devoured a metal spoon. I don't dare stick my hand in to check. However, there is the matter of the basement and laundry. Dean assured me the mold company would be in touch today. That leaves the final frontier, washing my clothing and linens. The morning sun melts through the windows like liquid, bathing the wood floor in golden puddles of light. It would be a shame to go into the basement on a beautiful day like today. But I rally and march down there, determined to become a domestic goddess no matter what it takes. Holding my breath, I tiptoe past the mushroom farm and hurry to the laundry room. There, on the front of the washing machine, Dean taped a note. In ink, it says, Sugar Plum, lift the lever to the right of the washer before you turn it on. Sort the colors into lights, mixed, and darks. If you toss your pink pajama shorts in with the lights, you'll learn that the hard way. Then fill the first container with soap, blue bottle, and the second one with fabric softener, white bottle, adjust the dial to the corresponding load, cottons, whites, etc., then press start. XO Dean. The brat who first met Dean wants to shake my fist at him, but the woman I'm becoming is touched. I've dated guys that have taken me on tours of the Mediterranean by yacht, eaten at the finest restaurants in Paris, and spent two weeks in those iconic grass huts poised over the turquoise ocean in Tahiti. However, at the moment, I can't imagine anything more uniquely romantic. You'd think I'd know this basic skill since my work entails textiles, presumably clean ones at that, but I've always had someone to do the dirty work for me. And if you really think about it, love is dirty work. I discover I have full service bars down here, must have to do with the high-frequency mushrooms, and open up the Fab Five group text thread. Me. I think I'm in love. I press send before I can talk myself out of it. Chapter 15. Dean. 
After getting closure on the aggravation with Chelsea and spending every other second with Olivia, I roar back to Lake Winnipesaukee on my motorcycle. It's probably the last time I'll be able to take it out this season. As I cruise along the winding roads, scattering the changing leaves in my wake, I try to tune out my thoughts, but they repeatedly break in. Life fills full with the baby, but empty without Blakely. It's like she's the missing piece, and not just because she's female and a potential candidate to fulfill the maternal role. Rather, it's because of feelings. Big ones. For her. I can't make sense of it or apply logic to how I fell in love with my fake wife. But it happened. Do I even need to understand it? For instance, I've learned that the world is a sphere, spins along its axis while traveling around the sun, and that gravity somehow keeps us from flying into space. But I don't grasp that in the same way as I know how to fly a jet. The mechanics and physics are plain to me, but the science of aerodynamic lift is a hotly debated topic and not one I fully comprehend either. However, that doesn't keep me from doing my job. So if love is like that, is it necessary to pinpoint every facet of it? Or is it enough to know and honor the fact that it's there and let it take flight? As I speed down the road, anticipation to see my bride builds. I slow when I reach the long dirt driveway leading to the cottage. Up ahead, two vehicles face me and sit inches from the drainage ditch. The car's emergency flashers blink. I slow for safety purposes and then recognize Blakely seated in the driver's seat. Her forehead rests on the steering wheel. My mouth goes dry and a pit hollows out my stomach. Is she all right? Was there an accident? I'm known for being calm in the face of disaster but we're talking about Blakely here. I cut the engine to the bike and hurry over. A pale worker type of guy with a sorry excuse for facial hair appears from behind the truck. If I didn't know better, I'd think he just emerged from a hole in the earth. He looks about our age and wears a smug smile. I got this under control. His pot belly and stooped stature suggest the lifted truck compensates for something. If I'm Wolfman, then he's Goblin Man. What seems to be the problem? I ask, as I rap on the window to Blakely's BMW. Goblin Man says, No problem, unless you plan on making one. Just here helping this pretty little lady, your services won't be needed. My eyebrows climb my forehead at his gall. Blakely unfolds herself from the vehicle, and is beautifully out of place with her designer clothes, shades, and long, lean physique. However, a pretty little lady she is not. I know this firsthand. She has many favorable qualities. She's motivated, hardworking, and knocks me out with her mouth and those eyes. But she's not some dude's find on the side of the road. Mrs. Wolfson, what happened? Are you okay? I say with a smirk, and emphasize the missus part. She tilts her head, hiding a knowing smile as if she immediately reads my intentions. I plaster on an expression of innocence. If this guy thinks he has a chance with the pretty little lady, he's going to meet hammer and nail, my right fist and my left. Blakely lets out a long exhale. I was driving along on my way to the market and the car stopped. I tried starting it again, but it won't go. Goblin Man must not be very bright or perceptive because he didn't seem to respond to the Mrs. detail. He says, Pop the hood, miss, and let me take care of this for you. I snort. I got this. Considering you ride a motorcycle and I have that truck there, I think I'm more qualified for the job. Goblin Man thumbs his Ford over his shoulder. He hisses so only I can hear. Also, I was here first. 
Blakely must have heard because the slant of her head deepens in warning for me to be a good boy. I think I can sort out the problem just fine. Thank you. My tone is even and clear. Goblin Man shakes his head. I've been working over at Miss Wolfson's house all week and know my way around if you catch my meaning. I'm roughly a foot taller than this dim-witted goblin man, but he won't back down. I hiss at Blakely. Nothing about this guy threatens me, and I admire his confidence. But this is about to turn south if he doesn't shut his mouth. Thanks for your concern, but you can be on your way. Don't want to block up the road, he says to me. And then to Blakely adds, Miss, my cousin has a shop on the edge of town, and we can get it towed there. So you don't think we can get it started? She asks. I'll do my best. Goblin Man pokes around under the hood. Miss, why don't you go wait in my truck while I figure this out? While he's occupied under the hood, I get behind the wheel and turn the key in the ignition. It cranks and the interior lights blink on, but it doesn't start. I study the instruments and immediately land on the problem. Goblin Man stomps over to the driver's side. If you had any sense at all and knew a lick about cars, you wouldn't have tried starting it without telling me. Were you trying to take off my hand? He fires at me. I shrug as I get out of the car. It crossed my mind. I thought I was clear. Mosey on your way and leave getting this car fixed to me, he says. As if foreseeing what's about to go down, Blakely says, Sir, I appreciate your help, but... And I do aim to help you, miss, but this dillweed doesn't seem to be getting the message. I square my shoulders and straighten to my full height. Considering this dillweed, as you said, is Mr. Wolfson, making me Mrs. Wolfson's husband and a pilot, I think I'm more than qualified for the job. Unless you want to see what it's like to fly without an airplane, I suggest you... What was it you said? Mosey on your way. It doesn't seem possible, but the guy pales even more and says, Oh, oh, I didn't mean any disrespect. I was at the house all week working on the basement and never saw Mr. Wolfson enter the picture, so I just assumed. Assume that your services will no longer be needed, I grind out. Goblin Man scurries back to his truck and leaves us in a cloud of dust. I wave my hand and step toward Blakely, backing her against the side of the car. Adrenaline and alpha male chemistry detonates inside me. Dean, you didn't have to terrify the guy within an inch of his life. He was just being gallant. Did he finish the work in the basement? Yes, they harvested the mushrooms. My nose wrinkles, but my eyes remain sharp. She gently taps me against the chest while I press against her. I'm trying to lighten the mood, tough guy. They removed everything. Mushrooms, carpeting, drywall, everything down to the dirt floor. Turns out that the carpet was laid on bare earth, hence the problem. I guess Nana didn't know. Anyway, they poured a new slab and installed drywall, and that nice man was part of the crew. A gentleman with pure intentions wouldn't look at a woman stranded on the side of the road like a juicy burger. My crystal ball is a little cloudy, but if I'm not mistaken, he was just trying to help, and you were about to bash his face in. Goblin man looked at you like a tasty meal. I pound my fists together. Hammer and Nail weren't going to tolerate that. Goblin man? She squawks a laugh. A marriage is built on trust, and you'd better believe you can trust me not to hook up with some random goblin man on the side of the road, Dean. Give me a little credit, please. A marriage is built on trust and love, I blurt. As the thoughts that followed me here finally land after the near confrontation. Her cheeks tint pink when I say that last word and heat tips my ears. Our gazes lock and hold. She looks from my wind-blown hair to my broad shoulders, 
to my hands bracing the car, to my lips. Blakely's throat bobs as she swallows. Right, well, this is an arranged marriage, which is built on something else entirely. Is it, though? I ask. What are you doing here? You think you can just come up here, have a good time, leave, and... She says, trying to duck under my arm. I cage her in. I was handling a few important matters, arranging things so I won't have to be gone so often. She puts her nose in the air. And who says I want you around anyway? Your expression says everything I need to know. Well, do you know how to start my car? I release her and step back. Yeah, it's out of gas, much like the lawnmower. What? That can't be. I filled it up on my way out of New York. That was over a month ago. You've driven it since then, right? It's supposed to be fuel efficient. For goodness sakes, how often do I need to fill it? When the indicator on the dash tells you it's running low. I take it you don't frequently drive in the city? What about when you lived up here? Mila was always the getaway driver. Is she your ride or die? One of four. I can't wait to meet the women who somehow shielded you from basic car maintenance. I sling my arm around Blakely and say, Come on, let's go home. She digs in her heels. Considering you just said my car is out of gas, how do you suppose I'll do that, genius? Two wheels, we'll ride. I point to my Harley. Your motorcycle? Uh, no. I'm not getting on that thing. It's too far to walk in those shoes. I point to her stilettos. She crosses her arms, unyielding. I chuckle. You're such a brat. Do I have to pick you up and put you on the thing? You know I will. If I get thrown off it like I did the lawnmower, the blood will be on your hands, buddy. I cup her chin. I consider you precious cargo and promise to take good care of you. I kiss her nose and then get on the bike, instructing her on how to straddle the saddle behind me. When her arm wraps around my chest and her cheek presses against my back, I kick into gear and drive slowly down the dirt road. I have to admit, with Blakely so close, this is better than flying. Chapter 16 Blakely Dean and I go to the basement, and I show him the work that was completed while he was gone. Thankfully, the mystery, musty smell no longer assaults my nose when I come in and out of the cottage. Now I just need to find someone to paint it and finish it off with trim, or whatever. Also, I have to pick flooring. Goblin Man said there is a kind of click-down style that works well for spaces like this. He said he could do it for about $10,000 plus materials. Dean chuckles as he paces through the room, looking at the ceiling, floor, and the walls, as if they're not all blank canvases of nothing. I'm reminded of the garage studio that I still haven't set foot inside. What's so funny about click-down flooring? I ask, confused. Nothing. I'm familiar with it. Goblin Man must need you to expand his underground lair, because that price he gave you is ridiculous. He's trying to take you for a ride. Considering my car is out of gas, that's doubtful. He did tell you to get into his truck. Dean wears a cocky smile. My nostrils flare at the way he's acting jealous. And if you were paying attention, you'd notice I didn't get into his truck. He wraps his arm around my low back, and like when we were standing by the car, he presses against me. My thoughts flutter to the all-consuming panic of getting on the back of his motorcycle, and then the safety I felt when my arms wrapped securely around him. I was used to traffic, long cab rides and traveling, of course, with its own brand of excitement, but I've rarely felt so free as I did when on the back of Dean's bike. Even though we weren't going more than 20 miles an hour, the wind in my hair, him in command, 
I feel like I can breathe, and not everything rests on my shoulders. He called me precious cargo. Maybe he is just trying to protect me. I'm not used to having a man in my life. Barrett and my stepdad are more like adult children. In some ways, I've behaved that way too. But I also learned to take care of myself, at least financially. Can I let Dean take care of me too? I tip up my gaze to meet his. My mom told me to marry a rich man. Instead of following in her footsteps, I became a rich man. Well, not lately, but this past week while the workers remediated the basement, I created a plan for my company and how I'll extricate myself from it. I'll ensure that Tiff, my assistant, and everyone keeps their jobs. That leaves me with a vast openness of what to do with my life that leaves me restless. Perhaps this shakeup is just what I needed. Brett, you are not a man. Dean's voice shivers. But I am rich, brute, I smirk. In that case, together we make a whole, and we're going to do this, you and me, DIY. My pulse jumps at the notion. While Dean was gone, I divided my focus between my company, him, and the future. I know he's talking about the basement, but I want our relationship to work. Even though my mother and brother started the Brat Brute Project, we'll finish it, DIY style. I spent summers and school breaks working with my father. I know my way around hammers and nails. I thought you were going to pound Goblin Man's face in. I was. He turns to me. I made a sacred vow to you, Blakely. I intend to take it seriously. When we met, you were like a hurricane in a jar. I like you a lot. I'm glad we got married. What am I now? Mine? His tone is commanding. I lift onto my toes and plant my lips on his to stake my claim. He's mine too. My mouth, my heart, and my entire lady boss body melts into Dean. I've been so used to doing things myself, it's a relief that there's someone else big enough, strong enough, and capable of holding me up for a minute. He pauses and then whispers, This gives new meaning to DIY. I like it. My breath turns shallow as our lips meet again. Tingles spread from my head to my toes. This brute of a man managed to tame me, and I'm not sorry. Because if this kiss is tame, I cannot imagine what wild would be like. The next day, we go to a warehouse-sized hardware store with fluorescent lighting and aisle after aisle of building materials that I didn't even know existed. It's like a loud, bright shopping mall for home improvement enthusiasts. Where do we start? I ask, feeling slightly overwhelmed. My penthouse apartment was just a place to live. Once more, the cottage is starting to feel like home, even though I didn't think that was possible without Nana there. At first, what were painful reminders of her absence? Her favorite tea on the shelf and the omnipresent painting studio I cannot step foot in, now feel very much like her presence. It brings to life her unique quirkiness and attentive care that she always brought to everything she did. Part of me doesn't want the change, but the other part hurries toward it. As present as Nana is, Dean has also taken up residency. All week, he found his way into my thoughts, daydreams, also when I made my morning coffee, only a cup a day, did laundry, it's surprisingly easy, and watched the sunset every evening. It's not the same without him there. He manages to wiggle his way into my mind and stubbornly stay there, even though I figured this arrangement would be short-term. We walk through the labyrinthine aisles, and Dean points out various options for the basement. I say, all of this looks the same, and I feel out of place in my favorite pair of black jeans and brown ankle booties with a zipper up the side amidst all the flannel, denim, and work boots. 
I'm surprised, having an eye for fashion, fabric, colors, and style, you wouldn't see the nuance in this acacia golden sample and roasted hickory. Dean holds two pieces of flooring side by side. Some people take comfort in predictability, simplicity. I suppose so. You don't? Dean asks. I actually don't know. The monotonous scenery on the ride here. We took my car after Dean got gas, but he drove. And row after row of flooring forced me to look inside. Foreign territory I'm sure I'm ready to explore. But every time I veer off course, Dean is right there to guide me back onto the road. Maybe that's another piece of the marriage puzzle. Except when I take a deliberate detour. Like right now. Ahem. I was thinking something a little more bold. Exciting. I flash sparkle fingers. Like LED light-up flooring, glow-in-the-dark paint, sparkles on the ceiling. His eyebrow lifts. If that's what the missus wants, were you planning on installing a disco ball and sound system down there too? I don't miss the bunny twitch of his nose. I poke him in his muscly side. I'm joking. I think light colors would be best to give the illusion of space. Maybe a home gym down there, man cave, playroom. Really, the options are endless. As we drive back to the cottage, we pass signs for the harvest fair. I tell Dean about how the Fab Five and I would live for this annual event. Where I expect him to take the turnoff toward the cottage, he continues to the colorful lights of the Ferris wheel. He pulls into someone's lawn and pays $5 to park. So, have you ever been to a small town fair before? I ask. Not with you. He slings his arm around my shoulder as we pass through the gate, then stroll past prize tables for the biggest pumpkin, best apple pie, and tastiest preserves. We go on the zipper, in the funhouse, and watch a country band for a few polite minutes. While we stand there, Dean grips my hand, transporting me to the last time I was here with my high school boyfriend. Unlike Dean, he was nervous and cautious since being around girls was new. Nor does Dean have greasy skin and pimples. He grips my hand snugly, and that's when I realize another difference. He's not my boyfriend. He's my husband. The gravity of that fact is like the bell on the feet of strength game, where Dean rolls up the sleeves of his flannel, takes the mallet, and then strikes the base. The game barker's eyes pop when the light indicates he won the biggest prize and reluctantly hands over a teddy bear the size of a small child. I'd like to see the goblin man win you this, he gloats. The goblin man doesn't stand a chance against hammer and nail. I say, gripping Dean's bicep and feeling as cheesy as the fries at the nearby food truck. Are you hungry? There are corn dogs, funnel cakes, onion rings, and it looks like the donut shop has a stall. I won't deny how my mouth waters over the rich, buttery scents in the air and my date. My mom let me come to the fair, but I had to stay away from the fried food. That seems cruel. Come on, we're getting one of each. Dean leads the way to the concession stands. He gets the cheese-covered french fries and then orders a second basket when I devour more than half of them. While we stroll around, he keeps his arms snugly around me as we each sip cider, fending off the crisp chill of the evening. When we were at the store earlier, you mentioned converting the basement to a gym, man cave, or playroom. Does that mean you want to stay? It's a good change of pace, being back here, like a rural refuge. It's helped me clear my head and focus on what I want. Does that mean you want me to stay? He asks. We stop in the middle of the fairway as people with glow sticks, massive balloons, and teetering cotton candy cones pass. Dean's dark eyes hover over me. I take a deep breath. Do you want to stay? 
Well, there's the cold winter, the ice and storms, then spring with the mud and bugs. Don't make it sound so appealing. My heart drops like the nearby elevator ride. My ears hum with the surrounding sounds, shrieks, and music. But I can't hear anything distinct until Dean says. But there's also you, Blakely. He smooths his rough fingers along my jaw. It's tender and possessive at the same time. It feels good to be wanted, but amidst the sounds, a slithery hiss of doubt tells me it's too good to be true. I'll end up unhappy like my mother, that what we have isn't real. It's arranged, a convenience for our respective families. Dean's lips drift to mine at the same time fireworks explode overhead. We both look up with oohs and ahs as light bursts in the sky. I can't help wonder if I'm meant to be reminded of beauty and delight, or if this whole thing is going to blast apart before my eyes. When we get back home, Dean makes good on that kiss before we go to sleep. As I lay there, filtering through the day, things said and unsaid, and trying to puzzle out my emotions for the man I now call my husband, I tell myself not to overthink. Instead, I listen to my breath and start to doze. But the muffled night noises enter my drowsy thoughts. It falls quiet and then comes again, a rustling sound and then scratching like nails on a chalkboard. Ice crawls along my spine. Is Dean digging a hole to bury stolen money from a bank robbery or valuables from a heist? Is the goblin man trying to break in, starved for a juicy burger? There's plenty of ground beef in the freezer, but we're fresh out of buns. Never mind. I pull the blanket up to my chin and whisper into the darkness. Do you hear that? But no one answers. Chapter 17 Dean A faint scraping sound comes from somewhere in the house. I roll over, trying to sleep, but my mind fills with Blakely on a runaway lawn tractor, jumping into the lake, tucked under my arm at the fair earlier. When the scratching continues, I toss off the covers and pad into the hall, attuning my ears to the source. Goblin man, if you're messing with me. I follow the sound to the kitchen, where something soft brushes up against my arm. Even though it's dark, I breathe the almond rose moisturizer Blakely uses before bed. I grip her with one arm and put my hand over her mouth with the other so she doesn't alert whatever is out there to our presence. It's me. I heard it too, I whisper. She mumbles something under my hand and her hot breath comes and spurts across my skin. I say, I'll let go if you promise not to yell. Blakely shifts her head up and down. I remove my hand. Taking a deep breath, she says, I think it's coming from outside. Where's the switch for the floodlights off the back deck? I ask. She must point, but of course I can't see her. Just go turn it on. What if it comes at us? She asks. Don't worry, I've got this lamb chop. Exactly. I don't want to be goblin man meat. I stifle a chuckle. Remember, I'm trained in combat. The switch clicks and then bright light floods the back deck. I train my gaze on the depths of the yard. I sigh. Likely the trespasser took off because we were being so noisy. Uh, Dean, maybe it's because you're so tall that you failed to look down, Blakely says. I shift my focus to the wooden deck, but don't see anything until I'm staring right through the glass. At first glance, the animal looks like a small cat standing on its hind legs. However, this creature has a pointy face and a scaly tail. With little pink paws, it scratches on the glass. Looks like we have a visitor, Blakely says. I saw a possum sleeping in that hollow log over on the edge of the property. I point vaguely in the direction and scrub my hands down my face as the adrenaline leaves me. Blakely cringes. Do you mean the log I let Goblin Man take for firewood? 
Seriously? At least I didn't give him any from our piles. While I like all this talk of we and us, now we have a homeless possum on our hands. It's pretty cute. I tilt my head from side to side, in a wild kind of way. Like you? She leans against me while searching online for what to do about a displaced possum. It lowers onto all fours, gives me what's very close to sad puppy dog eyes, and then waddles off. Looks like it moved on. I read here that they're transient animals and don't stay too long in one place. Well, it looks like it's heading toward the garage. Did you close the door after we unloaded the materials from the home improvement store? I thought you were going to. I asked you to because I had to bring the gas can from filling your car back to the shed. Blakely bites her lip. Miss Communication? Let's just hope Pete doesn't get too comfortable, I mutter. Who's Pete? The possum. If you're going to give it a name, you may as well invite it over for breakfast, Blakely laughs. I scoop her into my arms and then go tuck her in. Good night, brat. I love you, brute. Hovering over her, I freeze. Did I hear correctly? Did Blakely just say that she loves me? Her eyes search mine, just like they did when she asked if I wanted to stay and I didn't answer. I can't. Not until I know for sure whether our family can be complete with Olivia. The next day, I find Blakely outside, on hands and knees, by the far edge of the property. Morning, sunshine, I call, raising my mug of coffee in the air. She pops up, reminding me of the possum. What are you doing out here so early? The fair last night reminded me of Nana's pumpkin patch. It was uncanny. Every year, pumpkins would grow over here, even though they're an annual crop, meaning you have to plant them every year. Barrett and I always thought maybe magic was involved. I didn't remember until this morning. I glance around at the bare land. I take it they didn't grow this year? Blakely stares at the earth like she can't fathom it. When she looks up, her eyes glisten. Hey, I've been wanting to meet this Nana of yours. How about we go over there today and ask her? I'm afraid she won't know. Maybe not, but we can still talk to her about pumpkins. Maybe bring her a pumpkin spice donut. Do you really want to meet her? The woman who raised my wife, who made her strong, independent, and brave enough to investigate a potential intruder in the dead of night? Heck yeah. Blakely beams the biggest smile yet. On the drive over to the care facility, I ask, So what's your Nana's name? Barbara Fields. So you were Blakely Fields before you became Benedict? Did Bernard adopt you and your brother? I was Blakely Appleberry. That was my biological father's last name. He left when he found out Mom was pregnant with me. They'd never married. Didn't hear from him again either. I'm sorry, Blakely. I cup her hand in mine and kiss it. It's okay. Since I never met Ken Appleberry, it's not like I've missed him. Barrett was also too young to remember him. Not that he was around much to begin with. Mom lived with Nana until she married Bernard. He adopted us because of health insurance or something. He didn't act like a father, per se. He's just Mom's husband. I'm glad I got to grow up here with Nana, aside from when I was traveling. Looking back, what with the modeling gig, it helped give me perspective of what's real, you know? I let out a long breath, because after the I love you last night, I can't help but wonder how real this is getting. Barbara B. Fields, I say. Your grandmother painted all those canvases, landscapes, and portraits of you in the garage studio. Even though Blakely was stationary in the passenger seat, she somehow goes even more still. I'm excited to have made this discovery and then make another connection. Your mother never married Ken, so she wasn't an Appleberry. Does that mean you did the other paintings, initialed B. Appleberry? A long beat passes before Blakely waves her hand in the air. That was just silly, me fooling around. My grandmother had to do something to keep me out of her hair so she could paint. We pull up in front of the donut shop. 
I blink a few times at the parade of donuts marching along the brick wall of the exterior. In the lower right-hand corners are the names B. Fields and B. Applebury. Blakely, what aren't you telling me? Instead of answering, she hops out of the car, calling, I'll grab the donuts. Be right back. The morning at Whistling Creek Care Facility and meeting Blakely's Nana was pleasant enough. She appreciated the donut and told the story about painting the mural with her granddaughter, but didn't make the connection that said granddaughter was seated right there beside her. It sounds harsh, but no one ever promised life was going to be easy, and if they did, they were liars or lacked faith. On the ride home, we stop to grab cold cuts for lunch, and Blakely remains quiet. At the deli, I spot a bowl of potato salad that looks suspiciously delicious, and much like the one Blakely said she made when we had our first barbecue, after clearing the yard. I ask the clerk for a half pound and then grab a few more ingredients. Back at the house, I say, I know that must have been hard. She sniffles. I'm used to it. You don't have to be, nor do you always have to be brave and strong. I wrap her in my arms as she falls to tears. When she pulls away, I pass her a tissue. I've never cried like that. Not when I moved away, learned the diagnosis, or when my mother put Nana in the care home. I'm here for you, brat. But I say it the softest way I know how. Do you feel like painting? Yeah. Blakely says, and starts toward the basement. I don't clarify, meaning that we head to the garage studio. I suppose she'll go there when she's ready. I mix the sunny yellow shade for the basement walls. I'm glad we didn't go with white for down here. Too sterile. Blakely cuts in the paint along the ceiling as if she's done this before. The woman never ceases to amaze me. Sometimes I'm glad my mom sent me up here to play house. Sometimes mothers do know what's best. She scoffs. Careful, we're talking about Anne Benedict, a.k.a. her royal heinous here. She's the same person who got me into modeling. What got you into fashion design? I used to, uh, paint. Then when I was too lazy to go to the studio, I'd sketch in a style called croquis, you know, the classic minimalist model figures. Mila and Daisy would tease me because they were naked, so I started dressing them. I can't ignore how Blakely's smile makes her look more youthful than ever. You're a woman of many talents. I'd love to see your sketches sometime. Are you putting me on? Not even a little bit. How can she not see how amazing she is? Blakely casually walks over and grips my hand with the paintbrush, lightening the pressure I apply with each stroke. She grips my shoulder with her other hand and indicates I loosen it. She smiles as she looks warmly into my eyes. You're such a brute. This isn't quite the same as painting on a canvas, but you don't need to be so heavy-handed. I try her method and find the strokes become more uniform and my shoulders don't feel like they're on fire by the time we're halfway done with the room. As if picking up on a train of thought, Blakely says, Back in the city, I was gripping too tightly to the kind of life I thought I was supposed to have, but at the same time frustrated, fed up, desperate, lost. That's often the catalyst for change. Aren't you wise, she says. Really, though, some people go through life doing the same thing over and over. But are they happy? Isn't that the point? To experience and spread joy? There's something mellow about painting, I add, as I run the roller into the pan of paint. Blakely knocks into my hip. I think you've been breathing too many fumes. Come on, let's get some fresh air. We walk to the dock to watch the sunset. The three words I want to tell Blakely perch on my tongue, but I can't seem to cast them into the twilight. Instead, on the way back to the cottage, I say, Since you gave me a painting lesson, how about I give you a cooking tutorial? That sounds dangerous. At least with paint, you can't melt, burn, or blow something up. Have you blown something up? I ask. Only my life, 
my heart. Just a marshmallow in the microwave once, Barrett dared me to do it. And I have Barrett to thank for introducing me to the love of my life. I pull the container of potato salad out of the fridge. Blakely's smile drops. What do you have there? Oh, just a little something I picked up at the deli. I take a bite. Tastes a lot like your famous potato salad. Her head bobbles as if she's not sure whether to continue the lie or come clean while she has the chance. I taste dill, chives, mustard. But you don't taste celery. That must be why I like it so much. Celery does not belong in potato salad. Blakely bites her lip. That's why I bought it. Ha, so you didn't make it. Dean, up until recently, I couldn't even make coffee. But see, I'm resourceful, I know my strengths, and I know when to ask for help. So do I. Now grab an apron, roll up your sleeves, and give me a hand. Today is going to be monumental. You're going to make your first dish. But you can leave the pork chops to me. I wink. Just as I take the meat off the grill, a distant crack of thunder sends a shudder through the cottage. I dash inside and Blakely hugs me. Not a fan of thunder? Or lightning? I hope the rain stops before tomorrow. Why? I have to head out again. It's time for me to bring Olivia home. Blakely's chest caves and she pulls away. I tug her back to me, linking my fingers in hers. Please be patient. Because if she can't be patient with me, how can I expect her to be a mom to a baby who needs more than just the love that I have to give? She needs this woman who owns my heart. Chapter 18 Blakely Early this morning, Dean left on a gust of cold air and fog. My heart plummets because the truth of the matter is, I can't be in a relationship with someone who comes and goes, who's hot and cold, a brute and a gentleman. When I wander out to the kitchen to make a single cup of coffee, if I can't have him, I can have caffeine, I find a thin parcel wrapped in brown paper and tied with a red string on the counter. I unwrap it and find a simple journal with the word smile, written in small gold print along the bottom. I'm more known for my signature pout, but sure, I'll smile. I part the pages and find a handwritten note on the first page, in the same writing as the directions for the laundry. Until someday, wait patiently for your hopes and dreams, and what is yet to be. I cannot ask you for forever, but only for every someday that we will spend together. XO Dean The sunshine beams through the big windows as I read and reread the message from Dean. Like a helium balloon, my heart tries to float away with happiness, but I tether that thing down. The fact of the matter is, he's gone. Again. I wonder when our someday will come. For now, I'm determined to make the best of what I've got. I'm not really the free-form, write-down-all-my-juiciest-secrets-dear-diary type. That's Paisley. But I do make a list. Or two. Five things I've learned from my brief marriage some of which may have been induced by paint fumes. 1. Be humble and kind. 2. Satisfaction comes from doing it yourself. DIY. 3. Comfort can be found in predictability. 4. Self-sufficiency is underrated, but it's okay to ask for help. 5. Smile. Thoughts of independence bubble through the spaces between Dean's love note. Is he telling me not to wait like my mother did and reach for a man while letting go of what was important to her? Or am I to keep going, not stopping for anyone, not even Dean? I was lost before, but have I really found myself? Even though I know I love him. Part of me feels the sting of abandonment. 
Another part, the ache of missing out on a family with kids. Something I'll never be able to have. Whatever the case, I'm not going to waste any more time lamenting, loathing, or feeling lost. I double down on dissolving my business and envisioning my life here at Lake Winnie and planting pumpkin seeds for next spring. A few days later, I flip to the next page in the journal. Across the top, I write, Goals for Self-Sufficiency. Then, in a numbered list, I add, 1. Learn to cook and bake. 2. Clear spare bathroom shower drain. 3. Clean house, including windows, vacuuming, polishing things. 4. Stack wood and shovel as necessary. 5. Garden. I sink back on the couch. Seriously, that does not sound like me. I'm selling the fashion business and not because I'm shamefully backing out. No pun intended. Rather, I don't feel like that world fits anymore. Pun intended. I've changed. There's no going back. But where to from here? I pause, letting these revelations settle and align with my inner truths. I can learn my way around the kitchen and do yard work, laundry, and maybe putter around the garden. But the plumbing stuff is a big fat no. As for my inner truths, my biggest one tells me I'm hungry. I open the cabinet to find stale saltines. Do I dare lower my snack expectations? Time to be resourceful like Possum Pete and scavenge for some chocolate. Speaking of chocolate, Dean's 30th birthday is soon. Time to scavenge and sleuth because one thing I definitely know how to do is throw a party. And what better way to lure him back up here? I go to the market and browse the bakery area. The woman behind the counter says, Blakely? I glance up, braced for a comment about hashtag coffee break butt. Instead, Cora's mom comes out from behind the counter and wraps me in a hug. We chat for a few long minutes, and then I say, Did your daughter get her baking talent from you? Quite the opposite, actually. The girl had a sweet tooth, so I blame her for insisting I learn how to bake. If that's the case, could you make me a chocolate cake for someone special? Is this someone tall, handsome, and your husband? I can't help blush. This woman has seen me through diapers and now a wardrobe malfunction involving the same region of my body. I have an even better idea. I'll teach you how to make the best triple chocolate cake you've ever eaten. I tell her that I'm planning a party for Dean and will insist he come up here for it no matter what he has going on. His birthday falls on a weekend and even if he had to work, surely he'd get it off for this special occasion. Cora's mom, Patty, offers to make food for the shindig including spirals of tenderloin with Parmesan herb stuffing, Chantilly potatoes with a cheddar crust, a warm Brussels sprouts and kale salad, roasted carrots with pesto, and more. You don't have to go through all that trouble. What else am I going to do? My kids are all grown up. I work here part-time because of my book addiction, and my little Blakely got married. You didn't have a wedding reception, so this is the least I can do. She leans in. It's probably too late now, but I always wanted to open a bakery and call it Patty Cakes. Wouldn't that be cute? I love it, but Cora told you about the arrangement. She may have mentioned your mother was involved. Otherwise, I just assumed. Anne was always... How can I put this delicately? Pushy? Patty laughs like she had another word in mind. Now, of course, we haven't even started with biscuits, rolls, and bread. It's perfect. It all sounds so good. You're a miracle worker. 
We arrange to meet in a few days to test run the cake, and then it'll be up to me to actually bake it the day before Dean's birthday. When I get home, I realize I was so distracted by chatting with Patty, planning the party, and sending out dozens of text invites because I had reliable service in town that I forgot to get snacks. I find a very sad chocolate kiss in the baking drawer. When I pick up the foil wrapper to throw out, a piece of mail addressed to Dean from the Air Force on the counter catches my attention. He must have forgotten it. I probably shouldn't read it, but it's already open. And what belongs to him is mine, right? Guilt squirms in my stomach as I unfold the paper. I read about his military retirement info, dated well before our wedding. If he's not going back to work after periods of leave spent here, what's he doing? I wrestle with this question in the coming days. While doing my baking lessons with Patty and every moment in between, I wonder if I should call off the party, confront my mother, and tell her how I really feel about our relationship. Make a public comment criticizing the ridicule I received for hashtag coffee break butt, and track down Dean and ask him what's going on and where he really goes when he leaves. Then again, if he is on a military base, a brat or not, I don't think they'll take kindly to me marching in with guns blazing, figuratively speaking, of course. As the sun sets and the last of the leaves fall from the trees, heralding deep autumn, I gaze toward the back lawn. A slinky figure scurries through the grass and toward the garage studio before disappearing inside. Pete, you rascal, I shout as I hurry outside. I may not have been able to bring myself to visit the studio, but no way is Pete taking up residence. He can live in the shed, no problem, but not in Nana's and my sanctuary. When I throw open the door, he disappears behind an easel. I draw back and then my breath catches. Everything in here is exactly as I remember. My life may have done a 180, a twist, turn, and a few loop-de-loops, but the spot where I spent some of the best moments painting with Nana a few yards away, her oldies tunes playing softly in the background, and losing track of time, space, and thought, remains whole and solid. It fills me in a way nothing has in as long as I can remember. Amidst the uncertainty and challenges, this space brings me relief, calm. In a blink, I realize I may have lost parts of Nana, but what I can hold on to and not let go of are the memories of the time we spent together here. I drop onto a paint-splattered stool and marvel, just marvel, at all the stories that surround me. The bouquet she painted that was her best recollection of her wedding day flowers. My grandfather picked them from someone's garden before they said I do in the town hall. They only had one photo from that day, and it didn't contain the flowers, so she tried painting what she recalled of them. There's me, on my first day of third grade. Mom and Barrett had recently left for Manhattan, and she said it was the biggest she'd seen me smile in weeks. I count at least 20 paintings of the view of the lake. Another of naughty vines with a pumpkin playing hide-and-seek. And to my surprise, there's a little painting of what might be a cat, but as I step closer, I quickly realize it's a possum. I wonder if Pete's a third-generation resident. A bottle of acrylic paint spilled on the work table, and when I set it straight, I spot a trail of little paw prints scampering over the edge. Rascal! When I look up, I find my workstation exactly as I left it. Paintings of my friends, random objects that I thought were cool when I was 13, and a portrait of Nana and me that I never finished. I pick up my brush right then, 
and don't leave the garage until my eyes burn and I'm squinting. Task number five to becoming a domestic goddess is to learn how to change fluorescent light bulbs. When I get back to the house, my phone beeps with a message from my brother. Barrett. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to the party. Too bad it won't be like the old days now that my man Dean is married with children. Er, child. How is it being a mom? Me. Barrett Kenneth Benedict. If this is some kind of joke, I'm not laughing. Consider yourself warned. If you dare come up here for the party, I'm going to come at you with my garden shears. Barrett. Sheesh, so violent. Trouble in paradise? Or is the rug rat keeping you up all night? I've never seen Dean so demolished as he did a few weeks ago. Chelsea is the worst. Me. Why? Who's Chelsea? What rug rat? Barrett. Sis, you've been up in the sticks too long. Did you forget how to text? Do I really need to spell it out? I'm talking about your daughter, O-L-I-V-I-A. The phone nearly slips from my hand as my mind tries to catch up with what he could mean. Does Dean have a secret family and that's who he goes to visit? Does he have a child with another woman that he didn't tell me about? Is he cheating on me? Dean made me feel cared for. As a model, I often felt like an object, a thing to be admired. With Dean, I felt truly seen for who I am, not just what I look like, a person to be adored. I told him I love him. I gave him the opportunity to back out of the arrangement. We'd just be married on paper and could go about our lives. I feel used and deceived. My mother wanted me to settle down, but he'd better watch out because it's going to go down. Regret and humiliation fill me all over again. This moment doesn't just call for chocolate. I need a donut and my Nana. I should call off the party. I shouldn't bake the cake. But I want him to taste my bitter chocolate spite. I want him to feel the burn of my embarrassment. Oh, we're going to celebrate all right, and he's going to face my wrath. Not everyone from the Fab Five can make it, but I do manage to wrangle Daisy and Mila, my parents, Barrett, and even sent an email to Dean's mom and dad after I found their contact info on the PCO Sisters website. My stomach has been tying and untying itself in knots since Barrett accidentally told me Dean has a kid and is wrapped up in some lie about how it's ours. Not last I checked. Nope. Can't have kids. Never have. Never will. He must really love whoever Chelsea and Olivia are. On the day of the shindig, Mila and Daisy arrive together. The former wears all black, and Daisy dons a sweater dress and looks adorable as always. I see I'm not the only one who dressed for a funeral, Mila says, in her typical dry humor. You have no idea, I mutter. I'm going to slay Dean with this confrontation. No decorations? That's not like you, Blakely, Daisy says. I made a cake and wore black because I'm about to kick that brute's butt and don't want to stain my clothes. Mila wrinkles her nose, familiar with my culinary track record. All the guests filter in, including Patty, who I thought would enjoy seeing Mila and Daisy, my parents, Barrett, and last but not least, Dean. Prepare to pay, I say, as I stalk toward the door. Dean enters and calls, Brat, I'm home. Chapter 19 Dean I'm a pilot. I've been all over the world seeing, searching, and looking for home. And I've finally landed. I found a home with Blakely. I couldn't drive fast enough to reach the cottage. 
when I pulled in, several cars with both in- and out-of-state plates filled the driveway. A chuckle passed my lips. Either Blakely decided today would be a good day to host a knitting circle, or they're here to celebrate my birthday. What's more, and what she doesn't know, is it's going to be our family's birthday in a way. Funny that she likely has a surprise for me, and I have one for her. When I step inside, I playfully say, Brat, I'm home. Everyone except Blakely shouts, Happy birthday, Dean! In contrast from her, I get a chilly reception. Eyes slit, lips pursed. A woman on a mission, and I'm afraid I'm her target. What did I do? Yeah, yeah, happy birthday, Dean, if that's your real name, she hisses. Thanks, yes it is, and it's nice to see you all here. But is it really your birthday? All this time I thought you were in the military, when it turns out you retired a while back. Where do you go, and what do you do when you're gone? Play house with your other family? The whites of Mrs. Benedict's eyes grow. Dear, what's gotten into you? The truth, Mom. She whips her hair in my direction, and resentment burns in her eyes. You can't just come and go as you please, sugar muffin. I never specified when I retired. It was part of my identity and hard to let go, but necessary. In the meantime, I've been doing charter flights. Listen, Dean, I don't need a hero. I'm a capable woman, and you keep flying in here like I require rescuing. More like I need rescuing from you. Each of her words are like little barbs digging into my skin, penetrating my heart. Blakely, I had to take care of something, but I came here to tell you. I'm here to tell you that you can go back to wherever you came from with your other family and wife or girlfriend or whoever Chelsea is. I'm not just going to pretend I don't know what you're all about, brute. I steal a glance at Barrett, whose skin is pale. He gives his head a slight shake as if to say, Don't try to win this battle, bro. Just then, the door opens at my back. A woman with dark hair steps in with a thin guy who doesn't make eye contact. I recognize her from the first time Blakely and I went to the market. What's the occasion, and why didn't you invite me? She asks. Hello, Miranda, says another woman with dark hair. The redhead next to her glowers. I'm assuming they're part of the Fab Five. I saw all the cars. No invite? Blakely, shame on you. Miranda scolds, making her rounds to each of the guests as if the party is for her. Blakely snarls. Well, we're all here, I guess. I thought today would be a nice day to get real honest about some things and how it's going to work from now on. Blakely points at her mother. I'm tired of you trying to run my life. I can figure things out on my own, thank you. Your recent involvement in my love life was a big, fat fail, so let me handle things from here on out. What do you mean? Just the other day, you said things with you and Dean were going swimmingly. Well, now we're drowning. Blakely, let me... I try to interject. Just wait, you'll have your turn. She points at her brother. That goes for you, too. And why don't you try a little harder? You're just floating through life. Is it that boring? How about keep your nose out of my business? Stop messing around like you're still 21 and do something meaningful and visit our grandmother. Barrett titters. Blakely, I work hard at not working hard. I make a slicing motion by my neck this time trying to help my friend out. I don't think now is the time to make jokes. Blakely steps in front of her stepfather. Bernard, why don't you cut Barrett off and see if he can sink or swim? You've been floating all of us for too long. 
Blakely cuts a glare at her mother, presumably for enabling the relationship between stepfather and son. I appreciate all you've done for me, but in hindsight, I'm glad you kicked me out of the penthouse. I had to grow up sooner or later. Although I've gathered that Bernard is a successful businessman, he seems to shrink from the confrontation, even though Blakely let him off relatively easy. Patty, you're an amazing baker, and I'm sorry you have to be here to witness this. An older woman claps her hands slightly and says, Carry on. This is better than the romance novels I read. And don't worry, I'll be sure to give Cora a full report. Blakely's smile withers. Daisy and Mila, next time I fall blindly in love, please snap me out of it. Do whatever you have to do. Throw me in the lake. Chase me up a tree. Send me to a remote island. I cannot handle this, and I'm better off single on my own. Blakely, don't say that, one of the friends says. The other salutes her. Blakely flips her hair as she rounds on Miranda. And you, take your stupid matchmaking app, your big mouth, and get out of my life once and for all. Miranda shuffles back. I thought you liked at Fly Guy. You said you hit it off. I can't help that your mom forced you to marry this hunky dude. She points at me. I brace myself for impact. By far, that was the worst accusation Blakely's made so far. But then I tuck my chin at a comment Miranda made. What did you say about at Fly Guy and your app? Blakely pokes me in the chest. It doesn't matter, Dean. I deserve an explanation about your secret life and lies, but after that, we're through. She twists the rings on her fingers, then grunts, struggling to take them off. Figures, it's stuck. I'll give this to you later. Blakely, I'd like to explain. I start. She opens her arms wide. Have at it. We're all here listening. First, what is Miranda talking about at Fly Guy? So typical for someone like you to try to flip this around as if I'm at fault. No, Brute, you're the one in the wrong here. I haven't communicated with at Fly Guy since I agreed to marry your sorry butt. Hey, your butt is the one who got us into this, I counter. Blakely fists the air as if stopping herself from strangling or punching me. I take it that was the wrong thing to say. I fend her off. I meant that like I'm glad your butt got us into this. It's a cute butt. A good butt. Stop talking about my butt, she grinds out. Fair enough, but I'm not going to stop asking about the ad fly guy thing. That was my username on a dating app. The scroll click date app? Miranda asks. I'm the owner, developer, and all around matchmaking maven of that little gym. Blakely's lips slowly part. You're at Fly Guy? Does that mean you're at Fashion Girl? She nods slowly as our worlds slowly collide and then on impact bounce off each other, returning us to this dreadful moment. See, the perfect match, Miranda sings songs. My work here is done. The forever marriage match? Daisy, or Mila says, I'm not sure who is who. Blakely rages. This doesn't change anything. You've probably been talking to loads of girls on the app, ever since I said I was signing off. For instance, who's Chelsea? How do you know about Chelsea? I ask. Blakely jets her head in her brother's direction. Ask Bear Man. He sold you out. What did you tell her? Nothing. Honest. It must have been something, because this didn't come out of nowhere. I gesture to the room at large. No, this was supposed to be your 30th birthday party, but you ruined it by betraying me. I wanted everyone to know, 
because chances are they'd have thought it was my fault we broke up because I'm the one who's always so dramatic. Sarcasm laces each word. I promise I didn't betray you, Blakely. I dig my phone out of my pocket and flash the app. It states at Fly Guy's last login with a date of several months ago. What are the chances? Blakely mutters, as though temporarily taken back to our late night chats. The scroll click date app works, Miranda replies proudly, tapping the tips of her fingers together. I step closer to Blakely, wanting to draw her into my arms, but like a dangerous wild animal or a possum, I don't dare spook her lest she bites. And with the mood she's in, I have no doubt she'd draw blood. Listen, I've made some mistakes. I've probably done some bad things. But I want you to know that whatever pieces of a story you think you know, likely it'll make more sense if you let me explain. Never mind. You can't fix this, Dean. It's over between us. With that, she shuts down. With a flip of her long hair, she storms out of the house. Everyone watches in stunned silence as she walks toward the dock. Miranda snorts. Well, I'm not going after her. Not after the thanks she gave me. Dean, I'm sure you're a nice guy and all, but Blakely has always been a drama queen. Miranda, enough, growls the friend with the red hair. Daisy, at least she looks like she'd be someone named Daisy, elbows her. Mila, keep your claws in. Then to everyone, she adds, Blakely just needs a minute to cool down. Whatever is going on probably has an explanation. She flashes me a hopeful look. I nod rapidly as if that will somehow expedite my parents' arrival. There is, and it's on its way. I'm about to explain that I came here ahead of them to prepare things, but then the party came as a surprise, and I certainly didn't expect a welcoming committee when Mila advances. If in the past, present, or future, you do anything to hurt my best friend, I have a feeling hammer and nail have nothing on this pint-sized ball of fury. I know I'm the one who needs to go out there, but want to give Blakely space to collect her thoughts. More to myself than anyone else, I say. At first, I thought we were opposites. We're more alike than I could have imagined. Stubborn, mostly. But I love that woman. Can't imagine life without her. Does she know that? asks Patty, the older woman I recognize from the market. I shift from foot to foot. I hadn't quite gotten around to telling her the whole story, but I had a reason. Mrs. Benedict pats my arm. I'm sure you did, dear. Blakely wasn't wrong about being dramatic. I mean, look at the whole hashtag coffee break butt incident. Mrs. Benedict, with all due respect, that was an accident, Mila says. I suppose it's good to have someone like her in your corner. Mila and Daisy make their way to the door. We'll be right back, Daisy says. They disappear outside, leaving me with the Benedicts, Miranda, and the guy I assume is her husband, Barrett and Patty. I made a meal. Anyone hungry? Patty asks with a cheerful smile. I drop into the chair. Thank you, but... Mrs. Benedict signals her and they go to the kitchen. Mr. Benedict and Barrett wander off to a pair of reading chairs in the front room, talking about finances, stocks, and a bear market versus a bull market. As a pilot, I've never been grounded except in bad weather. Right now, I feel like my wings have been torn from me. All I want to do is take flight and escape this painful situation. I should have given Blakely the full story from the get-go. 
Now she likely feels betrayed and humiliated. I don't blame her. And I just feel awful. My chest aches. My head pounds. My vision blurs as I try to figure out a way to untangle this knot inside. I hold my head in my hands and stare at the floor. My thoughts bounce from our wedding day to jumping into the lake to working on the yard to everything before, after, and what I hoped was to come. I wanted everything to be perfect today, but without meaning to, I ruined it. I'd like to blame how fast everything has moved, the position Chelsea locked me in, and the unconventional nature of it all. But I ought to have manned up and told Blakely everything before now. Doubts about our relationship and all the ways I went wrong gut me, tear me up inside. Movement from outside catches my eye. A familiar SUV with Massachusetts license plates pulls into the driveway. Buoyant relief sweeps through me, and the second Blakely sees Olivia and hears what I have to say, I know everything will be okay. At least, I hope so. Chapter 20 Blakely At my back, the slats on the old wooden dock creak. I know it's Mila and Daisy without even turning around. I wipe away my tears. They drop down on either side of me. It's too cold to put our feet in the water. Instead, they each wrap an arm around me. That was pretty epic, Mila says, breaking the ice. Daisy shifts back, and I know these two well enough to be sure she's giving Mila a scolding look. How do you feel? Daisy asks. Awful. My confrontation didn't take away this crushing sense of betrayal like I'd hoped it would. Daisy's voice is soft when she says, Are you sure he betrayed you? Obviously, you heard Miranda and the whole app thing. Why was she even here? She'll never let me forget this. She's probably already posted it to the High School Reunion Forever Inc. app. I'm sick of social media. I came up here to get away from it all, but the drama seems to have followed me. Hopelessness wells inside. Mila squeezes my shoulder. You're still a lady boss. Don't forget that. But I don't want to be a lady boss anymore. I sold BB Style. You what? They both say at the same time. I decided a while ago I want out of that world. What are you going to do instead? Mila asks. I wasn't sure until the other day when I finally stepped foot in the studio. Inspiration struck and hasn't left. You're painting again? Daisy breathes, knowing this is hallowed territory. A tiny smile nips the corner of my lips. I'm doing it for myself, but I'll also be available locally for murals, signs, events, that kind of thing. That was the plan, the dream, before my mother farmed me out as a model. That's wonderful, she says. Mila slowly tips her head up and down. Carrying on Nana's legacy, I like it. But that doesn't change the fact that the rest of my life is in tatters. I don't know which is worse, getting married because my parents made me or because we made a pact when we were 17. I don't think you have to answer that question, Blakely. The whole thing is whacked. I'm never falling in love and I'm never getting married, Mila declares. There, now you're not the only one who broke the pact. Daisy pats me on the hand. I don't think it's in my future either, but it's fun to remember how innocently romantic we all were. Yeah, but the truth is, I do want to get married. I want to have a family. A sigh escapes. In any case, your husband has something to tell you. Daisy gets to her feet. My brow wrinkles at her abrupt movement down the dock. Come on. We should see what he has to say. 
She waves me to hurry along. Then I hear it, the wailing of a baby. Mila blanches. Is that what I think it is? Daisy smiles widely. My heart twists and sinks, and if I didn't know better, I'd have had to pick it up off the deck and keep it from flopping like a fish and then flatlining into the water. I cannot fathom what Dean can say to explain why there's a baby here. In fact, I'm not sure I want to know. I spot his outline as he strides toward an SUV in the driveway. Resentment burns up from my belly to my throat. I'm ready to tell him to go back to wherever he came from. But before the words can slip out of my mouth, he pulls me into his arms and buries his face in my hair. His cinnamon man scent, sunshine, and miles scent Dean's skin. It's irresistible, almost. I'm sorry, he whispers. Entranced by his strength and smell, I want to pull away, but cannot unadhere myself. I missed you so much, he says with a muffled voice. Where have you been? Who's that? I gesture to the SUV. A man and a woman wearing what appear to be coordinating uniforms in primary colors and a vaguely familiar insignia on the chest emerge from the car. I try to place the fashion line in my mind before realizing they're wearing Star Trek costumes. The woman rushes over to me and wraps me a bear hug that rivals her son's. I've been so eager to meet you. Dean has told us so much about you, your place up here, and the future he hopes for you to have together. Confusion robs me of the ability to respond coherently or appropriately. Well, beam me up? Dean thought this would be a great icebreaker, Mr. Wolfson says, extending his hand to shake mine. He told us a story about how he had you convinced we were Trekkies. He holds up his palm and opens and closes his fingers, then leans in. We're not, strictly speaking, although we did go through a phase in the early 70s. They both chuckle at what I presume is a private joke. I adore them already, but that doesn't excuse their son's behavior. Dean takes my hand and leads me to the rear driver's side door. She just started crying when we hit the bumpy spot on the driveway. I've been meaning to get that fixed, Dean says. Should call the goblin man. He'd probably do it. Mila squints in confusion. Daisy steps closer. I thought I heard a baby. Mom Radar. Her cheeks tint pink and she beams a smile. Blakely. I'm so sorry I've been scarce at times, but this is why. I peer into the car at an impossibly tiny face with pudgy cheeks and wisps of blonde hair. Mrs. Wolfson tucks her hand in mine, then says, Olivia, meet your mom. It takes me a concerningly long time to comprehend what's happening. In fact, I may have lost consciousness for a moment. Mom? My voice is itty-bitty. Yes, dear, my mother says. She joins us, huddled around the baby, still strapped inside the carrier in the back of the SUV. Where's my bundle of love? Dean says, pushing past us and hauling the carrier out. She's probably had enough of the car. Where's my little olive? There she is. There's my little love bundle, my baby cakes. Dean goes from lumberjack to doting daddy in two seconds flat. His expression softens and his eyes fill with what can only be called love as he cradles the baby in his arm. With his other, he draws me close, bringing me into what I realize is a family hug. Brat, say hello to your daughter. I'm not sure my limbs are going to hold me up, so I lean on Dean for support. My mouth is dry. The world has a surreal, carnival-like quality. What? I manage to croak. Dean has a ridiculous grin plastered on his face. 
I wanted to tell you. I didn't know how. And so much has happened. I want you to know everything. But we should bring her inside. Bring her home, if that's okay. I follow robotically, still not sure what's going on. But everyone else, Miranda and even my brother, beam with joy. Dean sits on the couch, balancing the baby in his lap, while she chews her fist and stares at me. First, I don't care who hears it this time, so long as you feel the truth in it. But I love you, Blakely. Those three words make the room spin, and the L, O, V, and E flutter and swirl around me, tickle my ears, tease me, caress my heart, and yet part of me demands more than that as an explanation. I never stop thinking about you, but I want to do this thing with you right. When we married, I can't explain it. I felt something for you I'd never experienced in my life. Like I wanted you all to myself, and yet would gladly announce to the world how crazy I was about you. I wanted it to unfold naturally, instead of just explode in a flash of other people dictating things for us. He goes on to tell me about Chelsea, her accusation, even though they'd never had relations, the paternity test, and the litigation nightmare he's endured. She sounds like the real brat, I mutter unable to take my eyes off Olivia. Turns out she was a scam artist, a deplorable person, has done this to three guys before me. Dean's voice lowers a decibel, as if he doesn't want the sweetest baby on the planet to hear, not that she can understand. From somewhere in the room, my mother gasps at the scandal. For once, I don't blame her. But from all that trouble, I was able to adopt Olivia. When I learned about your situation and kids, well, I felt like it was all meant to be and worked harder for adoption. I apologize for not laying it all out there. Coming up here to be with you was an escape from that difficulty, and I knew that you'd already suffered because of infertility. In case it didn't work out with the adoption, I didn't want to get your hopes up. Chelsea really turned the screws. But it did work out? My voice is uncharacteristically small, as if I'm afraid to hear the answer. She's all ours. Would you like to hold her? My arms involuntarily open as if my heart argues with my cautious brain, in case this is too good to be true. Dean wraps his arm around me and the three of us sit on the couch, for what feels like ages just looking at each other. I sense commotion in the room and then smell butter and herbs. I remember the party, my suspicions, and the confrontation. But suddenly, none of that matters. Tears pierce my eyes. My breath comes and goes. For once, I have no words. I press the gentlest kiss to Olivia's forehead and then mash my lips against Dean's. I'm sure I'll have a few things to say to the brute later. But for now and forever, I love this man. I love this baby. I love this life. With everyone here, including Miranda, because in a way she did connect at Fly Guy and at Fashion Girl, we have a wonderful birthday, homecoming, welcoming the new baby feast. Everyone except Barrett takes turns holding Olivia, leaving Dean and me for a moment to step outside to chat privately. We stand on the shore of the lake as the moon sparkles overhead and shines off the water. I bite my lip. Brute, I'm sorry for being a brat back there. And I apologize for being a brute and not communicating. You asked what I wanted. I want you. Us this family. Dean adjusts so he's facing me and plants his hands on my back. Brat, for a while, I'd wondered if what we had was real. All I know is that how much I love you is the realest, truest thing I know. I love you. I lift onto my toes and kiss him. My hands run along his strong arms, remembering the contours of his muscles. He brushes his palms along my sides, feeling my curves and nibbling his way along my neck. 
I knot my fingers in his growing hair, not sure if I like the clean-cut look or the lumberjack. His breath warms my cheek as he returns to my lips and the kiss deepens. The stars may as well explode in fireworks like when we went to the harvest fair. My world blew apart, but turned into the most unexpectedly beautiful splatter paint display of healing, family, and love. When we part, Dean says, We've done a lot of things backward and inside out. That could be the story of my life. I've had some stiff lessons and detours, but they each directed me to this moment where there is no doubt what I want. Dean drops to his knee. I didn't ask you properly before, but Blakely, you occupy my heart, and I would like to officially ask if you'd do me the honor of being my wife. To have and to hold, for better or worse, forever and ever, I say, paraphrasing our vows. Then, with starry tears in my eyes, I draw him to his feet. We did do things unconventionally, but I'd also say it turned out just right. Dean whisks me off my feet and spins me in a circle. A smile blazes on his lips as he captures mine in another kiss. I love you, we whisper at the same time. Then, hand in hand, we go back inside to be with our daughter and our family. Want to read a sample from book four in the Forever Marriage Match series, Dare to Love the Guy I Hate? With the high school reunion approaching, according to a pact among my friends, I have to find my marriage match. Too bad I hate him. I know exactly what I want. An epic adventure on the open road. Alone. Forget the silly dating dare. My quest is to visit all 50 states and find a place to call home. When my mom asks for a favor to help a family friend, I can't say no, even though I despise the guy. Elliot O'Connell is a rock star in recovery, with a debilitating fear of flying, but he needs to get to an awards show. To him, a road trip with a pretty woman sounds like a song in the making. Turns out he's my number one nemesis. Not a fan of his lifestyle or that thing he did that time. Me, forgive and forget, not on your life, buddy. We clash when tailed by a crazy ex, try to detour from past heartbreak, and take a wrong turn that leads us to discover what we have in common. When the trip comes to an end and real life intervenes, sending us in different directions. He says I'm like a tune he can't get out of his head. Forgive? Forget? Maybe. Will these speed bumps slow us down, or are we destined for love? Check out Chapter 1. Mila. If I were to name the soundtrack to my life lately, it would be dubbed Rocky Road. This is not to be confused with the ice cream flavor. Though I stopped at an ice cream shop in a little town during my travels, and hands down, it was the best ever. And I'm kind of a snob about things like that, especially if they involve chocolate. I think the place was called Queen's Cones in Liberty Lake, if you find yourself passing through. I could really go for some ice cream right now. I'd even take rum raisin, which is my least favorite kind. Back to the soundtrack. Nor am I on an actual rocky road cut through the woods or in the desert. Although I'll be hitting the road again soon enough. Rather, I've hit a rough patch in my life. My phone jingles with a tune by my dad's band, The Vines. In their heyday, they were like a combination of the Beatles or Led Zeppelin, but from the United States. They still tour, mostly overseas. This song used to bring a little smile to my face every time I'd hear it, but now it's like static, confusion, uncertainty, but that's life lately. However, right now, my stomach tightens at the sound of my cell phone's jingle, indicating an incoming message because last night I accidentally asked Siri 
if a guy I'd been seeing for a while a few months ago would ever text me back. Was it a moment of weakness and stupidity? Yes. Yes, it was. Do I regret it and wish I had a take-back machine? Yes. Yes, I do. It was a moment of weakness because I'm leaving New York in a few days, so dating is off the table. Though I doubt he's in this city, state, or country anyway. Like Dad, the heartbreaker I call Mr. X is in a band. Dating musicians is complicated. I should have known better. A little voice that sounds an awful lot like my father's low rumble when he's testing out lyrics whispers in my ear. But is it too complicated for love? Little known fact, Bobby Strickland, guitarist and singer for The Vines, and the guy I call Dad, may be six feet of bearded ferocity, but he's a romantic at heart, at least when it comes to my mom. Mr. X, on the other hand, is also six feet, but beardless and heartless. As far as everyone knows, I am not into ooey-gooey, sugary-sweet expressions of love. But as time passes and my best friends pair off, deep down it would be nice for someone to do things, like bring me ice cream when I'm feeling down. Even though Cora's a cook, her guy Shaw is all about making sure she always has something delicious at her fingertips. Or, you know, someone who is always there, rain or shine, Paisley and Griffin have weathered some storms together, proving they can survive and surf anything. I wouldn't mind a handy guy who can fix things when they're broken. I'm not talking about my heart. Nope, that thing is fully intact. Mostly, I was thinking specifically about Blakely and Dean. The guy can do anything. Oh, and about last night's blunder... It was also a moment of stupidity because I was acting like a 12-year-old with one of those magic 8-ball toys and not a device that has the ability to text the guy. Seriously, I don't know what Siri was thinking. Oh, right. She wasn't thinking because she's a voice-activated virtual assistant and somehow her wires got crossed. The real question is what was I thinking? Sure. Mr. X and I had chemistry, but it was nothing more than a fireworks and rainbows fling. Not a deep inside the heart connection or the fast and furious love that would compel two people to follow each other down any road no matter where it led. Ugh. I risk picking up my phone. Thankfully, the text I just received is not a reply from Mr. X. It's from my mom. I drop back onto my pillows and sling my arm over my face before I read it. But Mr. X could still reply, and that would be humiliating. Can today be over already? No, it's only like 8 in the morning. I'm supposed to be the cool girl in the group, the one who breezes through life without a care in the world, not the dummy dum dum who accidentally texts a guy late at night as if I were desperate. If you look up the word mortified in the dictionary, you'll see my photo. Red bedhead hair and all. I'm so embarrassed that I'd like to text Mr. X back and suggest that he plan my funeral. I'd like a proper burial too. White lilies, long eulogy, the whole thing. But that notion hits a little close to the chest. Instead, I'll pretend it didn't happen, just like other things in my life. My phone beeps again. This time, it's from Tanya, my mother, sort of. Mom, are you awake? I don't reply because she's in the other room and will likely come in here eventually. When I'm idle, I can't help but obsess over the rough patch. A few months ago, I was in what I thought were the beginnings of a relationship with Mr. X. Then he ghosted me. I was in what I thought was a family. Then I found out I was adopted. 
Why didn't the woman who I always called mom and was my best friend tell me the truth before now? I thought I was daddy's little girl. Turns out they don't know who my real father is. Now I don't know who I am or where I belong. The Vine's song, Wind in the Garden, my text tone sounds again with a message from the Fab Five group chat. As usual, they're discussing what to eat for breakfast, the perfect distraction from my confusing snarl of thoughts. Cora, next time we get together for brunch, I have to make a breakfast board for us. Think of it like a charcuterie board, but with French toast bites, berries and cream, bacon, me. Bacon? I'm in. But I need your suggestion for road trip snacks. What should I bring? Cora. Cheese crackers, cheese puffs, string cheese. You could also pack a cooler and bring some brie, pears, flatbread. Me. Sounds fancy. I don't want to drive with orange fingers, though. Also, what's with you and cheese? Paisley. Are you having a craving? Daisy. Are you prego? Before I can see the answer, my door whooshes open, letting in a beam of light. That's Tanya Strickland for you. She's bright, bold, and brings the sunshine wherever she goes. How she produced a daughter who prefers to wear black, is a night owl, and has a morose sense of humor is beyond me. The thought pinches something inside, because now that I know the truth about my origins, it's not so strange that we're polar opposites. Mom throws open the curtains, blasting me with a shock of daylight. Good morning, my darling sunbeam. It's a beautiful day. Is that because I'm leaving? I ask. No, don't be like that, Mila. However, I am looking forward to the going-away party later. She'll take up any excuse to host a gathering. Kindergarten graduation? You'd have thought I won the Nobel Prize. My 16th birthday? It was worthy of one of those over-the-top television specials and cost the same as a wedding. When I went off to college, we had a two-week-long getaway to the Bahamas. I told you, you don't need to have a going-away party for me every time I hit the road. She gazes out the window for a long moment. I just want to make sure you come back. To New York? No, to me, silly. She quickly masks her uncertainty. I may be the sassy one, but I'm not cold-blooded. I peel myself out of bed and cross the room wrapping her in a hug. I will always come back, Mom. Despite the shocking news about my adoption status, calling her Mom is the truest thing I know. Still, that doesn't help with my confusion. She squeezes tight. I know these last months haven't been easy, but telling you the truth felt like the right thing to do. In the morning light, the fine lines around her eyes look deeper. It would take me forever to count the streaks of silver in her long hair. She used to make me keep track of them. Time really has a way of sneaking up. Yeah, I get it. I mean, mostly, I guess. I just want to know more, you know? Not my most eloquent sentence, but nothing about the news mom and dad gave me a short time ago makes sense. Only it does. It actually explains a lot. I tried texting to see if you were awake, but you didn't answer. Tanya takes my hand, and we lower onto the edge of the bed. I have a tiny favor to ask you. If it's whether Miranda can come to the party, the answer is no. Sweetie, I didn't realize how awful she was to you girls in high school. I'm sorry I ever made the suggestion. Miranda is the Fab Five frenemy. Mom always encouraged me to befriend her when we were growing up. Believe me, I tried. Miranda is the original mean girl meme. Noted. I refrain from saying I told you so. 
I also withhold confessing that my phone accidentally texted Mr. X last night. And I don't dare tell her about the forever marriage match pact between the Fab Five and me. She's a couples counselor, so you'd think she'd understand the perils of relationships. But no. She and Dad have experienced over 30 years of wedded bliss. Naturally, she wants the same for me. Along with throwing parties, she pounces on every opportunity to play matchmaker. It's about Chaz's son. I picked him up from a rehabilitation facility. They had to sign him over to my care under threat of being deported. My brow furrows. Chaz, your old friend from high school? Mom has mentioned that his son was troubled and that she's always worried about Chaz, too. It might be that they both went down the wrong path. He's a nice young man. Her voice flutters. Famous last words. Famous, yes. Last words was the name of their recent album. He's in the band One Second. You must remember him from the reunion concert a few months ago. They opened for your father. My mother's lovely British accent is made for reading bedtime stories and assuring me I'll be right as rain any time I've ever felt blue. But right now, it's about as pleasant as feedback from a guitar amplifier. I sure do remember him, I say through gritted teeth, and don't want to think about him ever again. That was a time I'd love to forget, but I can't. Nor can I forgive him. He earned the name Mr. X with interest. However, Mom knows nothing about that night, where it led, and she never shall. Elliot got into a little bit of trouble, but has amended his ways. So the favor is that he needs a ride. Like an out-of-control car, I immediately see where this is going and can't do anything to stop the crash. No way. I'm embarking on a solo road trip in the old VW Beetle I recently inherited from my biological mom, Vivian Davis. It's just going to be me, the car, and the open road. No passengers. You're in one of your soggy moods and it's not even raining out. Let me explain, darling. I bite back a saucy reply. Chaz was always there for me when I was younger. We were like brother and sister. If Chaz needed a ride, I'd chauffeur him to Timbuktu. But other than him, I'm driving by myself. You may have offered to take on his wayward guitar-playing son, but I will not. He's not wayward. She clears her throat, as if not entirely sure about that. What will it take to change your mind? Can I bribe you with ice cream? A week at a spa? A phone number and address? She squeezes my hand, still locked in hers. I give her a look the Fab Five call nothing short of lethal. Blakely said it could launch a missile. Nothing will change my mind. Nothing at all. You have to understand that this trip is my life. I need to be alone. I need to think and understand. Her mouth twists as she contemplates my comment. I hear you telling me what you want, dear. Sometimes what you need is something entirely different. I double down on the look, but she's immune. To have been married to one of the world's most famous musicians for over 30 years, she had to acquire a thick skin. Hold on, what did you say about an address? I ask referring to her comment a few sentences back. I found info on some old paperwork last night. I think it matches one of the places on the map you found in the VW's glove box. While I was being an idiot on my phone, my mother was immersed in trying to help me. I want to cling to her, have her wrap me in a hug, but hold back. I don't want you to be upset. Sometimes when we do things for other people, we find great satisfaction and discover what really is best for us. Please, Mila, 
I'm asking you this very, very big favor, but it's for a good reason. Elliot, like your father, has been given a second chance, and I want to help him see it through. He's not getting a second chance from me, that's for sure. Then help him see it. Wait, what was that about Dad getting a second chance? This convo is during the pre-coffee hour, and I'm having a hard time keeping up. She motions for me to sit down. Her usually bright expression falls into shadow. Before you were born, I walked out on Bobby. He was doing what all 20-something men in notoriously famous rock bands do, and it was killing our relationship. So I left. But he said that was the biggest regret of his life and that he'd get himself sorted out if I gave him a second chance. He stopped partying. He backed off when women made advances. He started telling the truth and showing up on time. He transformed, and I took him back. If I hadn't given him a second chance, you wouldn't be here. The only hole in the story is that I would still be here, just not here, here. And right now, I want to be anywhere but here. I can't imagine mom and dad being anything but wildly in love. Still, to this day, when he's home, he brings her breakfast in bed. She writes him love notes and leaves them in his luggage. My friends think it's the sweetest thing. But I'm not you, and Elliot isn't dad, and... I know, but this boy, he's all but begging for a second chance. You see, he has no one to give it to him, she says, almost at a whisper, as if it's painful that Elliot presumably has no one other than his father halfway across the world. I was born here, but my mom, like Chaz, is from England, and that's where my parents met. Dad is from New England, northern New Hampshire specifically. My thoughts cling to the fact that there is no way Mom could know about Elliot, also known as Mr. X and me. That was months ago, and we kept it on the down low. So down low, at least for him, he forgot I existed. Are you thinking about it? Mom asks. I'm thinking. About how my life has gone sideways, upside down, inside out. This was not the plan. Then again, I've gone off the map for the last couple of months of my life. First staying with Cora while one second we're in Boston recording. Then going to Canada and following them around the Northeast. Now meandering. I think a week with you would do him wonders. I squint. Have you met me? Mom nudges me with her elbow. I know you're not the daisy in the dark you make yourself out to be. Dad calls you his bear cub, not only because he wanted to raise a strong young woman who's fierce on the outside, but also as a reminder that the best of us are soft gummy bears on the inside. There is nothing gummy bear-esque about the lead singer of the vines. Dad is all loud music, fast cars, and steak for breakfast. Although gummy bears would make the perfect road trip snack. Making you pancakes, singing you lullabies, and every spare second spent with you. You sure about that, Mila? She's got me there. Yes, my father is a tough rock star but has another side to him, the family man. We spent a decent amount of time here in Manhattan, but mom and dad raised me in northern New Hampshire, away from the rock and roll ruckus, as he calls it. However, given the story mom shared and his sparse presence when I was a kid, should be warning enough not to date rock stars. Too late for that. Elliot, a.k.a. Mr. X, is the only guy I've ever let make me cry. We had the time of my life, but it was too good to be true. Who was I fooling? Oh, I know, myself. Elliot temporarily went off his trolley, Mom says, using a British expression that American English speakers would replace with off his rocker. But he's back on his trolley? I almost laugh at the absurdity of this situation. How did we get here? Yes, 
completely on the trolley. We had a pleasant conversation this morning. Turns out that they postponed his tour for some reason. However, he needs to be at an awards ceremony in Los Angeles and he can't miss it. Then he can stay with you and then fly. I brush my hands together. Problem solved. I don't have to drive him. That's not possible. Why is that? I can't really say. Tanya Strickland uses her don't bother asking because my lips are sealed voice. Don't tell me he got blacklisted from all major airlines. He's a rock musician. Can't he hire a private jet? She waves a hand in the air. No, no, nothing like that. He's not a criminal. Except when it comes to hearts. Dad wasn't either, but he was forbidden entry into Canada. I can't let her know how deeply personal this is. My mother's persistence is legendary. She'll double down on insisting Elliot and I go together and won't stop until we drive off into the sunset with a just-married sign attached to the VW's rear window and tin cans trailing along the road. They're a peace-loving people, and the ban was only for a week. Your father had a penchant for mischief and driving over posted speed limits. I'm glad you'll think it over. Elliot is charming. I'll give him that much. Yeah, I'm aware. And just where is he? I ask. Sleeping in the guest room. My stomach drops. Keep reading. This has been Dare to Love My Fake Husband, Sweet Romantic Comedy, Forever Marriage Match Book 3, written by Ellie Hall, copyright 2021, narrated by Lorena Hoops, audio copyright 2022. husband i really hope you enjoyed it um it is book three in the forever marriage match series and of course they don't need to be read in order but they they're kind of you know are enjoyed sequentially a little bit more maybe um but all five books follow the fab five fab five friends that's a tongue twister um i hope you enjoyed it and if so i would love if you give it a like and a share comment below it helps me out heaps and if you haven't subscribed please do see you between the pages